You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. But I do, I do. Even after so long? What is time? The ebb and flow of a river as we drift along, bobbing and sinking, but floating to the surface again and again and again. My love. From this day forward, we shall never be apart. This, I promise you. Kruger, I've got an idea. Who is this? Jordy, who do you think? Listen, this one's a winner. You know what time it is. Wait. Sorry, boss, but I just watched a movie and... Movie? What movie? Remember that assignment? You wanted to send me to the coast? To cover the awards, but you passed on it. Right. The Career Achievement Awards at the Academy. Jordan, surely this can wait? That's just it. It can't. Come morning, I'll be on a plane, headed for L.A. No, you won't. I'm sending the new boy. Not so fast. You remember why I passed on it? Because Pamela Morris isn't attending. As usual, so what? Well, I ran one of her pictures tonight. Her greatest performance. And this, I promise you. I've forgotten the magic. There's never been anyone like her, not even close. So here's what you do. Have you been drinking? Buddy, I'm stone cold sober. Get me a ticket for the red eye out of O'Hare. Then soon as it's morning, Pacific time, call our agent and set up an interview. I'll be there with bells on. Interview about what? Are you kidding? It's Pamela Morris. Where's she been all these years? Is she still as beautiful as they say? I'll get you an exclusive. And while I'm out there, I just might cover the awards, if you ask me real nice. Because you're my favorite editor. Do us both a favor. Go back to bed. I haven't been to bed. I've been watching Pamela Morris all night long. And tomorrow, I'm going to meet her. No matter what. Thanks, Kruger. It'll be worth it. This I promise you. The world's most beautiful woman. Pamela Morris. In person. Introducing Jordan Herrick, syndicated columnist, whose work appears in more than a hundred newspapers. By nature, a cynic, a disbeliever, and a jaded commentator on the movie business, caught up for the moment in a lovely vision. He's not sure whether that vision is merely a dream, but he'll soon find out. Her name is Pamela Morris, renowned star and femme fatale, not seen in public for many years, whose legendary beauty is remembered by millions. Mr. Herrick is correct about one thing. Tomorrow he will make her acquaintance in person. But what he does not know is that the face he gazes upon may actually be a reflection beamed his way directly from the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story... Queen of the Nile, starring Kate Jackson, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Hello? Hello? Is anybody... Yes, sir. I'm here to see Miss Morris. Who? Pamela Morris. Do I have the right address? This is a private residence. No deliveries. Oh, for the love of... I'm not a delivery boy. Please turn your car around. My name is Jordan Herrick. Well, you still need an appointment. I have an appointment. Check the list. H-E-R-R-I. Oh, yeah. Mr. Herrick from Chicago. Thank you. I'll open the gate. Park in the circular driveway by the main house.
Yes? Hello there. I'm Jordan Herrick. I have an interview with Miss Morris. You're early. Am I? Well, if she's not ready, I can wait. This way. Well, well. This is impressive. Take your coat, sir. That portrait on the wall. Your coat? Hmm? Oh, here. Who painted it, may I ask? I'll tell Miss Morris you're here. Yes, yes. You do that. What's the signature on the canvas? No. Can't be. Where's my towel? A young man is here to see you. Where? In the living room. Really? Tell him I'll be right in. There's no hurry. Oh, there you are. Sorry I lost track of the time. Please, don't rush on my account. You've come all this way. It's the least I can do. But it's such a glorious day. I'll be right with you. Just let me dry off. Of course. Charlotte, see if the gentleman would like a drink. Perhaps a light lunch? Yes, miss. Oh, don't go to any trouble. I'll meet you in the living room as soon as I make myself presentable. Oh, you're more than that. A great deal more. If you follow me, sir. Mr. Harry? Miss Morris, I didn't mean to interrupt your swim. Nonsense. I've kept you waiting. It doesn't matter. It does matter, and I apologize. But I do love the pool. It's my one indulgence. Am I forgiven? Absolutely. Please sit down. Beautiful. Sorry? This room. The furniture, the artifacts. Lovely. You like my little collection? Very unusual. You must have gathered these things from around the world. Oh, you know how it is. Various locations over the years for this film or that. You specialize in the exotic. Do I? Yes, I suppose so. Even the front door, that metal uh, insect or whatever it is. Ah, you saw that. The door knocker. Cast in bronze after an Egyptian beetle or so, I'm told. Do you think it's too much? Mm, no, no, no. It's quite remarkable. I've never seen another like it. Nor have I. Must be very old. Yes, it must be. I confess I've forgotten exactly where it's from. Now then, I believe you have some questions for me. Well, if you don't mind. Not if you're the one who asked them. I'll do the best I can. I'm sure you always do. <sighs> to begin at the beginning. As two people always must. Huh. You were born in... I must say, Mr. Herrick, you are very direct. Hmm? Oh, don't get me wrong. I meant geographically. No, you didn't. You meant the year. That's what the public always wants to know. You're not offended? Should I be? I have my producers, my directors. You have your editors. They are all very demanding. Besides, a woman in my position must have no secrets. I'm relieved to hear you say that. I was afraid. Afraid? You have nothing to fear here. No? Why, Mr. Herrick, I'm only a woman, and a rather small one at that. Surely you've known many women. Never one like you. Ha. <laughs> then I'll try to make this as painless as possible. Suppose you tell me how old you think I am. Well, that's hardly fair. Oh, come now. Especially after you saw me in my, well, my bathing attire. Unfortunately, it conceals very little. I wouldn't say unfortunately. Mr. Herrick, you make me blush. I shouldn't have wandered out onto the terrace like that. I did say no secrets. And I overstepped the bounds with that question. No, no, not at all. Please, be honest. Really, I... Here, take a good look. I'm sorry about the shirtwaist and sandals, but I didn't want to keep you waiting a moment longer. Time is so precious. You're not wearing any makeup, are you? Can you tell? There simply wasn't time. Yeah. Very beautiful. That wasn't the question. We were talking about my age. I'd appreciate your candor. In that case, you look no older than when you're doing the painting. Oh, everyone asks about that. I was only a child when I posed for it. Is that so? Come and see for yourself, close up. All right. Well? Oh, surely I'm misreading the signature. Why do you say that? This can't be a Bertolt. 
bad hold. I was so frightened of him. The world was bright and new to me, and he was so wildly creative. Was he? I'd never met anyone like him. It was his genius that enabled him to project the flowering of a fragile blossom, as he put it. He must have been a genius to capture you so perfectly. What a lovely thing to say. Tea, miss. Ah. Huh. Shall we, Mr. Harry? Certainly. Tea or coffee? Coffee, please. Would you like something in it? Cognac? Whiskey? No, thank you. I'll take it black. I thought newspaper men were heavy drinkers. That's a myth. At least during working hours. And are you working now? I am. Though it doesn't feel like work. I want you to feel entirely at ease. It's to my advantage, you know. Lest you think badly of me. Very little chance of that. Is it time for tea, Charlotte? Yes, Mrs. Draper. Hello. My name's... This is Mr. Herrick. How do you do? Mrs. Draper. He's the newspaperman, Mother. I know. You're Pamela's mother? Surely not... Sit down, Mother. Have your tea. It's remarkable, the resemblance between you two. Some might think so. With my mother, it is tea at this precise hour every afternoon. Mrs. Draper... You must feel proud to have such a famous daughter. Must I? <laughs> Mother never did approve of my career. Believe me, Mr. Herrick, I had very little choice in the matter. She thinks I'm too headstrong. Dedicated is the word. You still are, Pamela. Tell me, was your daughter always as beautiful as she is now? Always. Now there's loyalty for you. As a matter of fact, Mr. Herrick, it is the truth. Then perhaps I should interview you as well. Why, whatever for? Well, I might learn a few important details from the mother. You... Such as the real age of the daughter? <sighs> Honestly, I wasn't thinking of that. Isn't age relative? Besides, didn't I promise to reveal absolutely everything to you, Mr. Harry? You did. All in good time. Then I'll just have to be patient. Not for much longer. This... I promise you. Pamela, I must have a word with you. Later, in your room. I am not going to stand by and watch it happen again. You will if I say you will. I can't bear it. Mother, would you mind seeing if Charlotte has things under control in the kitchen? Not this time. Sorry if I'm intruding. I... She was just leaving. Pamela. Weren't you? A pleasure to have met you, young man. My pleasure, Mrs. Draper. Perhaps we'll talk another time. I hope so. Until then, goodbye. Take care of yourself. Take very good care. I'll try. Forgive her. What for? She's getting old. Still, she might remember a few details I can use for my story. No, her mind wanders. Her memories become distorted. Shall we finish our coffee on the terrace? If you prefer. There should be a breeze outside. I'll bring the cups. Mr. Herrick. Mrs. Draper, I thought you'd gone. I must speak with you. Why, of course, I... Leave. What? You must leave at once. Quickly, before she hears. You are in danger. I am? Very grave danger. All is not as it appears. She is not as she appears. Mr. Harry, are you coming? Be right there. What's this about? If there's something I should know, you... She is running out of time. Save yourself, young man, before it's too late. I implore you, save yourself. Isn't it lovely out here? Quite stunning. And a perfect location. I'm trying to remember. Who owned this house before you? Oh, some ancient actor from the silent days, I think. And when did you purchase it? There you go, Mr. Herrick, still trying to trick me. I assure you it was built decades ago, long before I was born. No doubt. I love to sit here by the hour, 
watching the birds and the clouds, listening to the sound of the water. At night, I watch the stars. Do you? But that isn't what interests you, my nocturnal habits. It'll fit nicely into the story I'm doing. The question of age is still the big thing, isn't it? I wouldn't say that. I can hear it in your voice. Well, here goes. I am 38, Jordan. May I call you Jordan? Of course. Is that so terribly old? Not at all. Even in my case? Especially not in your case. The years have never been kinder to anyone. Oh, you're a dream. It's the truth. Ah, I should have realized you'd take all this down. Looks like you've already written several pages. Some advance notes. Dates mostly. Do they concern me? Eh, indirectly. According to one article... I know, you read something. A column by one of those stupid, jealous women. If you don't mind me asking... Fire away. If you're 38, how could you have starred in a movie made... Let me see. 29 years ago? <laughs> I can't believe it. Jordan Herrick taken in by the printed word. Tell me, do you always believe everything you read? Then set me straight. The movie was Trails West, is that correct? Darling, it couldn't have been me. I would have had to be nine years old, don't you see? It's an old mistake. I've run across it before. Once something like that gets into the books, it's hard to erase. Well, according to our files, your co-star was John Bradley. Was it? You were in love with him. <laughs> I never even met him. Your files are in error. That's possible. Almost 30 years ago. Why, I don't believe I'd even seen a movie yet. I wasn't allowed. My parents were very strict. Oh? We were poor. We lived in Iowa. My father's business was failing. It was a few years later that I set out for Hollywood, a star-struck girl in her teens, following the same trail blazed by so many hopefuls. I was extremely lucky. You must have been. You made Queen of the Nile with Charles Danforth. When you were 14? Juliet was 12. It's such an important production. Is that so much harder to believe than my true age today? You see, no one knew I was only 14. If they had, I would have been taken off the picture. I matured early. Indeed you did. I've seen the film. Have you? Shot on location, wasn't it? Oh, yes. No studio back lots then. A fabulous experience. I learned so much. And that was when you began collecting? What? The interior of your house. I take it the trip inspired the decor. I call it early Egyptian. I suppose it's silly of me, but how could I resist? It was my first big break, and I was far from home with more money than I'd ever seen before. I'm just glad it wasn't one of those horror pictures that I probably have the place filled with caskets. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I much prefer it this way. But really, you know, the fact is that I still feel 14 in some respects. No, let me be more precise. Sitting here with you, I feel new. I know it sounds foolish, but I want to live, Jordan. I want to savor all there is in this life. Is that so wrong? No. Come here and look at the view. You can see practically the entire city from here. The canyons, the pools. Ah, they look so blue from here. Don't they? Such a perfect color. Reminds me of something. Me too. Your eyes. You are too good to be true. But do you see what I mean? The world is such a magnificent place, full of so many wonders, too many to know in one lifetime. Maybe that's what makes life so precious, because it's so brief. Does it have to be? If we live fully, tasting everything that's placed before us like a magnificent offering, two people alive to the moment and each other. Yes. I'm being foolish again saying such things. Oh, on the contrary. We've only just met. Hardly seems possible. That's because you've seen my films, each a time capsule, preserved, unchanging. There's something more, something that's very much alive right now. It's just that I so seldom get the chance to speak my mind, to air my dreams. That's true for everyone. Is it? It is for me. 
If I could know there's another who feels the same way, who wants to know life to the fullest. I think it's time for you to start believing. I don't dare. What are you worried about? You were so understanding, so simpatico. Don't stand too close. No, you don't like it. Move to the edge of the hillside. You might fall. Oh, Jordan, I already have. No. What's wrong? What must you think of me? Don't turn away. Look at me. It's as much my fault as yours. I wanted to kiss you from the first moment I saw you. You're very sweet, very real. But you really must go. Why? Because I say so. But we can see each other again if you like. What about tonight? Dinner? Very well, shall we say. Eight o'clock? Eric, party of two. Mm, not for an hour, at the very least. I, I, I have a reservation. I'm sure you do. If you'd care to wait on the bar. Hello, Armand. Miss Morris. It's been a while, hasn't it? I should say so. We've missed you. Uh, how about that reservation? The old table, I presume? That would be divine. Lord. Yes, Armand. And prepare that corner booth. But it is uh, occupied. By another couple. Then move them. Too sweet. Yes, sir. And that's our show. Ladies and gentlemen, we now invite you to dance. Darling, I don't know when I've had such a wonderful time, but it is getting late. Is it? I should call home to see how Mother's doing. Oh, don't tell me there's a curfew. It isn't that, but I do worry. Excuse me? Yes? Miss Morris, can I have your autograph? Of course, dear. Thank you, Miss Morris. Will that do? Will it? You should charge for those things. That's the tenth one tonight. Darling, is something the matter? Mm. No. Nothing. We're to have no secrets between us, remember? I was just thinking about your mother. Something she said. When? Earlier today, she took me aside. I... I could have sworn she was trying to warn me. Only I'm not sure of what. Jordan, my mother is disturbed. You must believe me. I do. But her words stick in my mind. She feels responsible. For what? My father's death. They were returning from a party she was driving. And the car went off the road. Father was killed. Oh, I'm sorry. Since then, she's been suspicious, furtive, imagining all sorts of terrible things. I've tried to help her, but the doctors say it's hopeless. She's deeply depressed. She should be in an institution, but I can't bear the thought of... I shouldn't have brought it up. Uh, let's change the subject. Yes, let's. Now then, uh, I told you about me. What about you? What do you want to know? Where did you grow up? Chicago. I still live there. I've played Chicago, the Wells Theater. The Wells. Is it still always so cold in Chicago? Only in the wintertime. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I almost forgot. I was going to call Mother. Where's my purse? Oh, wait, you'll need coins for the phone. Oh, don't worry about me. Here, I'll get change. Waiter? Jordan, please. It's no trouble. Listen to me. You're a kind and considerate man, but I can take care of myself. Just don't disappear while I'm gone. Promise? You have my word on it. What's this in my pocket? A letter? Someone must have put it in my jacket. But who? Dear Mr. Herrick, you are a fine young man. I know I you want to, want see, to my daughter, see my daughter, but, but you, you must, must not. not. Under no circumstances are you to come to this house again. You will not believe what I am about to tell you. But I swear on all I hold sacred that she is not as she appears. The ravishing woman you know as Pamela Morris is far older than you think. She has told you her age, but she is much more than 38. I know 
For you see, I am not her mother. I am her daughter. Morning. Jordan? Oh, I was just about to phone you. Were you? I overslept after last night. I was afraid you wouldn't call. I wasn't sure you wanted me to. Oh, now you're teasing me. I had the most wonderful evening. So did I. It was heavenly, Jordan. Every minute of it. Will I see you today? Wild horses wouldn't keep me away. You don't have to fly back? Not just yet. I'll tell Kruger I'm onto something here. Something, something that could be very big. Kruger? My editor. Don't worry, he'll go for it. Oh, I hope so. If I were to lose you now, you don't know how long it's been since I've felt this way. Stay right where you are. I'll be right over. I won't move from this spot. I'll tell Charlotte to make lunch for us on the veranda. I have a better idea. I'll take you to Musso and Frank's for brunch. Perhaps your mother could join us. What for? I thought it might be nice for her to get her out of the house for a change. Mother's not feeling well this morning. Well, nothing serious, I hope. Only the usual complaints. Her mind seems worse, though. I wouldn't want to subject you to that. As you wish. You seem awfully interested in my mother. I do? Yeah. Just a reporter's curiosity. Enough about her. How soon will you be here? As soon as I shower and dress. Till then, darling. Till then. Front desk. This is Mr. Herrick. I'd like to place a collect call to Chicago. I'll connect you with the hotel operator. Kruger. Hey, old buddy. Jordy, glad you called. Where are you? Still in Hollywood. Listen. Good. I got another job for you. If you're through playing around with that little movie queen. Almost. Do something for me, will you? You'd have to file on one of our pictures. Which one? Queen of the Nile. Right. Which one? I just told you. Queen of the... Well, you're a little young, I guess, but they made two of them. First one, silent, I think, around 1920, maybe earlier. I didn't know that. Get them both. Take me a minute. I'll hang on. Here it is. You there? Yeah. I got it. What's the name of the girl who starred in the original? Let me see. Uh, Constance Taylor. Never heard of her. Anyway, she starred in most of it. What do you mean? It says there was some kind of accident during filming. A cave-in at a tomb in Egypt. Real tragic. They never found her. Got a photo of this Constance Taylor? There's a clipping from the old bit. Compare it. With what? A picture of Pamela Morris in the remake. If you say so. Well? They look alike, but they would. They played the same part with the same makeup, same type of costume. The old Wells Theater. When did they tear it down? The Wells? Here in Chicago? Oh, it must have been sometime in the 30s. Why? I want to be sure first. In the meantime, I need you to do a little more research. Find out about the men who were involved with Pamela Morris. Send me every press release, every clipping you have on her. Then fax them to me at the hotel. Can you do that? This better be worth it. Oh, it will be. Sounds like you're on to something. Kruger, you wouldn't believe it if I told you. But it's something, all right. Something fantastic. Well? It's all true, Mr. Herrick. Every bit of it. But don't show it to her. Leave here at once. This picture. Is it Pamela? Yes. Yes. Please, Mr. Herrick. You don't know how it is. January 12th, 1933. Gladys Gregory and Kester Roberts at the Wells Theater. On roadshow tour, fresh from their Broadway success in Honeymoon Deferred. She had many different names. But she herself hasn't changed in what? 50, 60 years? At least 80. The sum total of my life. You can't imagine what it was like 
to see her always so fresh and beautiful, while my mirror image grew seared and yellowed with age. How I longed to see a wrinkle, just one, in that baby skin face. But she stayed young, and it was I who grew bent and gnarled, withered by the weight of the years. Is it any wonder that I hate her so? Hard to imagine hating her. Take one last look, Mr. Herrick, and then go. How old is she, really? She is ageless. Perhaps eternal. That's true. What is a secret? What woman would not sell her soul to know? Surely you have some idea. It has to do with the motif of this room. The artifacts? The scarabs. The scarabide beetle, to be exact. The Egyptian symbol for everlasting life from the banks of the Nile. Mrs. Draper, if you hate her so... Why do I stay? What else could I do? After Pamela and my husband... Go on. Tell me the rest. Charlotte? I cannot. You must go. What about those other men? John Bradley, Charles Danforth, Wesley Harrington. Don't ask about them. Charlotte, was that Mr. Herrick's car in the driveway? I thought I heard... Oh, Jordan. I knew it was you. I could hardly wait. Hello, Pamela. What's she doing here? Pamela. How nice of you to drop in, Mr. Herrick. Has my mother been entertaining you? Yes, she has. Tea, Miss Morris. Thank you, Charlotte. What wild tales have you been spinning, Mother? I'm beginning to think they're not wild tales at all. Oh? For one thing, the Wells Theater where you played was torn down years ago. Many, many years. And the artist, Bertold, who painted that picture of you? Do you know when he died? You may leave us, Mother. Charlotte will serve your tea in your room. Pamela, please. I want to speak to Mr. Herrick alone. Yes, I'm sure you do. That will be all, Charlotte. I'll pour for Mr. Herrick. Yes, Miss Morris. Your coffee, black, as I recall? Yes, Pamela. Drink up. Uh, Pamela, I... Now then, you were saying? Please understand, I... Oh, I do. I'm a reporter. It's my job to gather facts. And last night, that was part of your research? Last night was special. Believe me. My, look at all these newspaper clippings. Let me explain. You've compiled quite a dossier on me. What is it you want, money? You think I'm a blackmailer? Well, if that's not it, what do you want? The truth. Ah, it comes down to this. I told you it isn't about money. I understand. Then why are you opening the wall safe? You want the truth, Mr. Herrick, and you shall have it. Come here. What have you done? Just a little white pill in your coffee. You drugged me. Don't worry. It's only a sedative. Well, why? I'm about to show you the secret. Don't you want to see what's in the box? Very well. I'll bring it to you. What is that? A rare Egyptian scarab, Mr. Herrick. The secret of eternity. Where do you... Get it? From the pharaohs who understood its power. Pharaohs? I told you, Mr. Herrick. I was once queen of the Nile. That was only a movie. Was it? Oh, yes, but I'm talking about the real thing. You? You were? Not were. Am. Whoa. Sit down. It's easier that way. Let me open your shirt. You'll feel a slight sting as it penetrates your flesh. Then when it's fed, when it's filled itself with your life force. We. Oui. There. Now I simply remove it and place it on my skin 
so that it can reverse the process. Let me see. This leg should do nicely. Do you think I have nice legs, Mr. Harry? Oh, but you can't speak. You can't do anything, can you? A pity the art of mummification no longer exists. Because in a few more seconds, there will simply be nothing left to hold your body together anymore. <laughs> Pamela, what have you done? I've told you, Viola. Never come in until I call you, if you want to live another day. No, I can't bear it. Get rid of the remains, quickly. This must stop. Clothing, shoes, everything, now. Yes? I have an appointment to see Miss Morris. This way, sir. I'm here, Charlotte. Yes, miss. Oh, do you mind? I seem to have knocked over a cup in the living room. Would you see that it's swept up? All of it? Right away, miss. If I've come at a bad time... Nonsense. You must be Mr. Jackson. Yes, I called the other day. And I told you to come out when you could. Did you think I'd forget? Well, I didn't want to intrude. I must say, you look spectacular. Do I? Radiant. If you don't mind me saying. It's the weather. I so love the sun and the pool. I'm constantly refreshed. It reminds me of the location for one of my films. We shot it on the banks of the Nile River, the ancient source of life, or so I'm told. Queen of the Nile. I've seen it. Have you? But you're so young. Come. We'll have coffee on the veranda. Everybody knows Pamela Morris, the beautiful and eternally young movie star. Or does she have another name even more famous, an Egyptian one from centuries past? A word to the wise. It's best not to be too curious, lest you end up like Jordan Herrick, a pile of dust and old clothing discarded in the endless eternity of the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Queen of the Nile, starring Kate Jackson with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Jerry Saul. Heard in the cast were Mike Starr, Doug James, Jeff Lupiton, Linda Ryder, David Darlow, Sarah Marks, Christian Stolte, Bob Dunsworth, Carl Amari, Vince Amari, and Roger Wolski. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, Exim Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking.
you're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the command center at NORAD. This is the nerve center of what was once the first line of defense for the United States. Of course, things have changed a bit. Uh, yes, ma'am, is there a question? Hi, yes. My name is Jocelyn Reitzman. I'm with the senator. Um, I thought there would be, like, big TV screens or, you know, plasma screens of the world. Everyone thinks that. Actually, they never existed. During the Cold War, you saw much of what you see today. Men at desks looking at monitors. Only today, well, they are plasma screens, but smaller. There was never a big board. So who would have seen the incoming missiles from Russia? Actually, multiple monitors would have shown that level of attack very clearly. Uh -huh. And what do they do now? They watch the Weather Channel? Actually, Senator, the role of NORAD continues to be of significant strategic importance. To date, our space surveillance network has tracked more than 24,000 objects in orbit around the planet Earth. That's space junk, Major Anderson. It's nuts, bolts, debris, extraterrestrial garbage. You call that significant? It can be significant. We have thousands of satellites in orbit, many of them critical to national security. We need to know if they're in danger of colliding with the debris. And if a tool bag lost in space is going to collide with one of these satellites, what exactly can we do about it? Nothing, actually, except, of course, understand the nature of the event. And if some extreme group takes power in a country and launches missiles at us, is that what you'll do, Major? Try to understand the nature of the event. Senator, rest assured, we have the necessary defenses in place to identify and track anything in the air, in orbit, in space. Throughout the country, we have air defense services monitoring the skies. But if you think about it, the only way we can be sure of what it is and where it's coming from is to be able to differentiate it from the space junk. We are one minute to the OIS 679 event. Ah, that's great. Well, you're all in for a treat. We're actually going to be able to see an object in space re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Dr. Johnson, I think that's why you're here. That's the idea. If you'll allow me, Dr. Johnson has been working with us through her think tank in Seattle and is studying the potential for some objects to actually strike the Earth. What's an OS-69? Uh, good question. Doctor, would you do the honors? OIS, actually. Object in space. We don't call them UFOs. We know what they are. 678 is the number of objects of significant size that have re-entered the atmosphere. This next one will be 679. Uh, how big is this thing? Believe it or not, 100 pounds. Mostly lost tools from various shuttle missions. In fact, it may be that tool bag you mentioned earlier, Senator. <laughs> You've got to be kidding. 10 seconds to OIS 679 event. If you look at the monitors, well, actually, any of them. We, um, we switch most of them to the event feed at times like this. Event commence. Wow. That was a big one. At least a .75 duration. That's it. That, that flash of light for a second. Cheyenne Mountain, billions of dollars, and all we use this facility for is watching man-made meteorites flash on screens like static on an old TV. There have been more significant events recorded. Like that one? Oh my god. Well, that doesn't sound good. Do you mean to say you've never seen an event like that second one? Look, there's another one! All stations to alert status and cross-check on multiple arms. What, what is going on, Major? It's like the 4th of July. They just keep coming. All stations transmit all incoming data to ADS centers and confirm ballistic coefficients. Major, it's a simple question. What is going on? I, I don't know. This has never happened before. I mean, it's Sunday. The commanding officer isn't here. I, I just do the tours. Can someone please tell me what's going on? No one can. He meant what he said. What we're seeing 
are thousands of objects in space entering the Earth's atmosphere simultaneously. If this had happened before, we'd all know it. Are they asteroids? No. No, they're not behaving like asteroids. They're coming from perfect Kepler orbits and seem to have very specific trajectories. Like missiles? Yes, Senator, yes. Like missiles. Oh, I predicted this! Jocelyn, if I were president, this would not have happened. This is the end of all of us! This is the end of the world! Meet Senator Jack Reitzman. Charlatan, fraud, politician. A man with few principles who sees monsters in the closet and enemies in every backyard. He's on a mission to save the world with his own brand of truth. It's a truth he's about to uncover in a place where good and evil have taken a rest to bring something new to a familiar planet known as the Twilight Zone. <laughs> so they have their tanks in these long trenches, and we just put bulldozer blades on two of our tanks and ran along the trench and buried them. <laughs> we didn't fire a shot, and for all I know, those tanks are still buried out there. <laughs> it was almost too easy. <laughs> General, priority call for you, line one. Yeah, easy was the word. Makes you wonder if we'll ever be able to fight a real war again. General Whitaker. General, we have incoming first strike with counterforce and countervalue targeting. 894 incoming assumed RB missiles due to strike US-48 in 15 minutes. Confirmed? Confirmed. Source? Still unknown. Proceed to DEFCON 1 and prepare preemptive countermeasures. Yes, General Whitaker. Connect me with the President. How fast does this elevator descend? Very fast, Mr. President. We'll be 1,000 feet below the White House in another 10 seconds. What do we know so far? The first U.S. impact is estimated to occur in 10 minutes. Who did this? Russia? China? Who could put up so many missiles at once and with such accuracy? The answer is we still don't know, and they are far from accurate. Meaning? Every country seems to be under attack, but then some aren't. Which countries haven't been invaded? Ireland, Madagascar, Denmark, and Monaco. And everyone else? All targeted somehow. Every part of the world. Even Greenland, Samoa, and Antarctica. And is someone going to explain why this is happening? We have the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the CIA, and an expert on this subject on the phone who should be able to help. Dr. Anna Johnson. She's at Cheyenne Mountain right now. She's the top authority on objects in space and atmospheric re-entry. She's our best bet to sorting this out. In the next few minutes, I hope. Anna, you there? I'm here. Anna, this is the President. What can you tell us? There are now about 4,000 objects entering Earth's atmosphere with an angle of attack indicating non-ballistic re-entry with trajectories delivering impacts in the next 1 to 20 minutes across the globe. I was told 10 minutes. Anna, this is the Secretary of Defense. My information was 10 minutes to impact. That's correct. Or at least it was about five minutes ago. But now, some of them have sped up, some have slowed down, and some... Well, some of them have stopped. Have any cities been hit? No. I mean, some of the objects just stopped. Stopped at various altitudes, some 20 miles above the surface of the Earth, and others just a couple of thousand feet from the surface. Mr. President, this is General Whitaker. What's your recommendation, General? Give me the order to shoot them down. Have any of them exploded? No, but some of them have landed. What was the size of the impact? No impact. They actually landed very gently. Where? Where exactly did they land? New York, Chicago, L.A.? Mr. President, I'm not requesting permission to retaliate. But please, let us try to shoot them down while we have time. Anna, how many have stopped or landed so far? 
And how exactly do they stop in mid-air? About 600 of them have landed, and we don't know how they are doing any of this. Any major cities? Mr. President! General, stand down. I'm not going to blow up our cities shooting at things that aren't attacking us. Mr. President, the odd thing is they're not landing in cities. They're landing in places that are desolate and unoccupied. Mr. President, we have defensive and offensive capabilities hidden in places desolate and unoccupied across the country. And are any of these objects in those areas? No. Anna, what are these things? I'm not really sure. We have live video of some of them. I'm transmitting it to you now. They appear to be large cylinders about 300 feet in diameter and about 400 feet high. Most are flat on the top and bottom, but a few appear to have a blunt, conical top. Anna, what are they? The surface of the objects are pitted and streaked. No markings or other features are apparent. Wait. Wait a minute. It appears all of the remaining objects we're viewing are now moving in unison toward the surface. Mr. President, this is our last chance. Where are they heading, Anna? What cities are in danger? Only a small farm town. No major cities. One of them is landing in a farmer's field outside of a small town in Iowa. All the rest are landing in remote, deserted areas or in water. How many have landed now? Almost all of them. Whoa! Wait. Anna! You have to tell us what you see. Over areas of China, we're seeing significant explosions. The Chinese are trying to shoot them down. We have to join this fight, Mr. President. General, in case it hasn't occurred to you, this doesn't seem to be an attack launched by any nation on Earth. Speaking of which, Dr. Johnson, other than China, are any other nations taking defensive or offensive measures against the objects? It's hard to tell. No apparent use of nuclear weapons. Everything is in the form of conventional weapons. I don't think anyone else wants to blow themselves up. No surprise. Neither do we. General Whitaker, let's be safe. As chairman of the Joint Chiefs, get a team together fast and get some military supervision and security to every one of these objects. Do not attack without my orders. Alert FEMA. Evacuate the local civilian population as you see fit. We'll contact the diplomatic corps in case someone thinks this was our idea. And have they all landed? Most. The rest are either hovering or underwater at points throughout the world. What do they want? They? John, do we have some idea where these came from? You said it yourself, sir. Anna, you're the expert. What do we have here? Without any additional evidence, I would guess this is a full-scale invasion of the planet Earth by an alien race with vastly superior intelligence and technology. Well then, let's get some more evidence and be sure. Until then, we take no chances and we take no offensive action. Look, if this is a visit from some life form from another planet, we need to know the answer to two fundamental questions. Are they good, or are they bad? I'm afraid it's one or the other, but let's be sure before we make what could be a bad situation worse. And if they attack us? General, if they attack, the order is to defend us. But only if they attack. Understood. Uh, Mr. President, if they are here for the good of mankind, I would like to be the first to welcome them. Who is that? This is a secure line. I'm sorry, it's Senator Reitzman. He's here at Cheyenne Mountain. What the- Mr. President, I'm here and I witnessed this event as it happened. I can lead the diplomatic team that welcomes our guests. Senator, I would appreciate it if you and everyone else stayed in Cheyenne Mountain until we better understand this situation. Oh, no, no, you are not getting all the glory on this one. We get equal time. This is bigger than you and your party. Senator, the President is the Commander-in-Chief and you will do what you are told. Fine. But someday, I am getting out of this mountain prison. And if this thing blows up on you guys, I am telling the world that I 
could have been the hand that extended peace to our new neighbors. You may get your chance, Senator, but until we understand the situation better, you will remain at Cheyenne Mountain. Anna, do you see any objects headed for Washington, D.C.? No. The closest is about 100 miles away, landing in a swamp in Virginia. We're monitoring the object via satellite. Wait a minute. The swamp is drying up. The object appears to be consuming all the water. Mr. President, it's obvious what they're here to do. They want to take all our natural resources. They'll leave us a desert planet, and we'll all be dead in days. We have to act. Anna, are any of the other objects consuming water or any other resources? No, just this one. Maybe they were thirsty. And who is that? Sorry, it's the senator's wife. The room is secure now. I don't know how they got in. Dr. Johnson, I need you to go to one of these landing sites. Take whatever and whoever you need and see if you can get some answers. Understood. General Whittaker. Yes, sir. I need to hear from you immediately if these things make any offensive maneuvers. Don't fire until I give the order. I don't want to escalate this situation because a swamp or two has lost some water. And if they attack my troops, return fire. Now, let's get to work. Have you got all the gear in the boat? Yep. You think today will be a good day for fishing? It's always a good day for fishing. It's just up to the fishermen. Do we got the bait? We got it all. All gassed up and ready to... What in tarnation? You okay, Jimmy? Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. Where did that come from? It just fell out of the sky. What is it? L looks like a giant tin can. Tin cans don't fall out of the sky, Bobby. It's on your property, Jimmy. You own it now. I own it? Well, what the hell am I supposed to do with it? Kind of looks like an oversized oil drum. Maybe we should call the sheriff. Oh, what's he gonna do, Bobby? But the same thing we're doing, just sit here and stare at it. I don't like this, Jimmy. We ought to get out of here. Yeah, maybe right. Hey, let, let's, let's give it a minute. I want to see if something happens. I don't think anyone could move that thing. You're gonna have it sticking out of your lake from now on. Man gonna ruin the fishing. Just be quiet, I'm thinking. You know... A lot of people would pay good money to see something like this. Yeah? Yeah, I suppose they would. You know, we could charge admission. That big field on the old road, heck, you could park a few hundred cars. At ten bucks a head, that's a couple of grand a day. Let them take all the pictures they want, and then, hey, you know what? We could even have a concession stand. Heck, with the money we're gonna make, we'll open a restaurant. And a big deck where you can eat and look at the... thing. Let's go. I want to block the road. People are going to start showing up soon, and the money starts today. Fell right into our lap, didn't it? Yep, money from the sky. Damn, I knew it. Is that a news chopper? That'll get lots of people here. It ain't no news chopper, it's military. They're going to make us another Rosewell. Damn. It's Roswell, dummy. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special report. Good evening. What you are about to see may be the most incredible occurrence in the history of humanity. Across the globe, thousands of large cylindrical objects have landed on the surface of the Earth. Others are reported to be hovering over the planet's surface and an undetermined number below the surface of the Earth's oceans, lakes, and rivers. The reaction across the globe can best be described as a mixture of shock, fear, and for some people, hope. Here with a live report is John Porterson. Thank you, Bill. I'm standing in a remote desert area of southern Utah where one of these large objects has landed in a shallow canyon. 
The appearance of all the objects is identical at a height of about 40 stories, cylindrical in shape, and a diameter the size of a football field. There are no markings, windows, or doors, and so far, no sound or movement from the object. There have been reports that some of the objects are siphoning water from lakes and rivers, but that has not been confirmed. Soon after we arrived on the scene, a battalion of National Guard troops arrived, and they have moved us back some distance from the object. We were able to briefly approach it before troops arrived. There's a strong smell of sulfur surrounding the object, and the sides were extremely hot. The entire surface is a streak combination of black, gray, and dirty rust. Troops continue to arrive and set up gunnery positions, which has all of us a bit nervous. John, has the military given you any information? Is this a dangerous situation, and are they expecting the use of force? Uh, the military... The military has simply moved us back from the object. They have given us no information, as far as we can... General Whitaker here. General, this is the President. Can you explain to me the situation in the Utah desert? Two Air Force F-16s launched eight missiles against the object. They were supported by artillery and small arms fire. Were they attacked? I'm still waiting for a report. Has the object returned fire or been destroyed? No. The object appears to have suffered no damage and they have not responded in any way. General, what exactly motivated this attack? Who gave the order? No one. It appears the pilots acted on their own. We have to get control of the situation, and that starts with us controlling ourselves. What if these visitors are peaceful? What are they thinking and planning as a result of this attack? Mr. President, with all due respect, if we were to travel to another country for peaceful purposes, we wouldn't show up in 4,000 jet planes. There is nothing about this arrival that can be seen as anything less than an invasion. General, if there is one more incident like this, I am relieving you of command. Now get your forces under control! The whole world's in a panic, Mr. President. I'll... I'll do everything I can. Position 43? Bob, is that you? Yes, Mr. Secretary. Has Dr. Johnson made any progress? I I'll patch you through. Johnson? Anna, this is the Secretary of Defense. I'm here with the President and the National Security Council. Where are you right now, and have you had any success? We're in a deep forest in northern Michigan, and we are about to make another effort to make contact. So far, radio transmissions, loudspeakers, music, and colored lights have received no response. What are you planning to do? The only thing left to do. Knock. Try it again. Can you hear anything? Nothing. We've connected sensors. Parametric acoustic arrays, range sounding, even stethoscopes, x-rays and radar, you name it. We've seen nothing and heard nothing. If there's anything in there, they're not responding. Is it possible these are not occupied? I mean, we send unmanned instruments into space all the time. Why wouldn't another intelligent race do the same thing? Anything's possible. What we can't understand is their purpose. We don't know why they're here or what they're doing. There are no transmissions of any kind that we can detect. No communication between the objects on the ground or the various sections suspended over the Earth and in space. 
Our only assumption is that the sections eventually rejoin in space and form a large cigar-shaped transport. The few sections with the conical tops are probably on either end of a long tube of sections. Are they after the water? Not just water. We have reports of minerals, water, and air being slowly collected by various objects. If I had to guess, I'd say it's an intergalactic freight train that's come to harvest various materials. So they are, in fact, after our natural resources. Is there any danger that they'll consume the atmosphere? Is that why some of the objects are hovering? That's our assumption. What's curious is there seems to be no danger. They're not collecting that much of anything. Considering their size, the most they've taken is a sample. Could it be a scouting expedition? Preparation for an invasion? Mr. Secretary, 4,000 objects? If this is preparation for an invasion, I'd hate to see the real thing. No, I think this is a peaceful, if not passive, mission. Although they may be sampling resources for future collecting. There's no way of knowing at this point. Keep trying, Doctor. We need some answers. Things are getting out of hand. What do you mean? The military. All over the world. Some countries have taken the offensive, including, I'm sorry to say, our own. An isolated incident, but an attack nonetheless. Have they retaliated? No, not once. Not even after a nuclear detonation in South Africa. Every report is the same. No damage to the objects, no retaliation or response of any kind. Then I guess we can stop knocking. If a nuclear detonation doesn't get their attention, they're not going to pay much attention to our sledgehammer. Mr. Secretary, I have an urgent call from Senator Reitzman. Anna, don't tell me he's with you. No, sir. We left him back at Cheyenne Mountain. Put him through. Uh, uh, Mr. President? Mr. President, are you, th are you there? Can you hear me? Jack? Are you okay? Is everything all right at NORAD? I am not in Cheyenne Mountain. I'm in, uh, I'm in Montana, I think. Uh, we found one of the objects. Senator, the President's orders were crystal clear. You were to stay at Cheyenne Mountain. <laughs> yeah, well, I, uh, I didn't, and the world will thank me for it someday. Jack, are you alone? Uh, no, no, my wife is here, and uh, a lieutenant who I ordered to fly us here in his chopper. We need, we need cameras, Mr. President. The news media, the world has to see this. Senator... The world has been staring at pictures of these objects for almost two days now. Believe me, yours is no different. Well, that is where you're wrong. This one is different. This one is different because I am here. And I did it. I'm the one who did it. And what exactly did you do, Senator? Exactly what I said I would do. I made contact. This is Tom Hillridge reporting from Southern Montana. In an amazing turn of events, Senator Jack Reitzman claims to have successfully made contact with what are believed to be a highly advanced form of life from another planet. This is the first time anyone on Earth has succeeded. Accompanied by his wife, Jocelyn, the senator will read a statement he has prepared to reassure the visitors that we can coexist in peace and mutual trade. I'm here with James Parker, the owner of the property where the object has landed, who witnessed the landing. Can you tell us what you saw? Well, first of all, I just want to make it clear that this is private property. Now, I know that a lot of people are watching this, and we don't need y'all showing up just yet. Now, the military has it secured, but if the general public wants to come around here, I'm going to have to charge a fee for, you know, insurance purposes and the such. Uh, thank you. Mr. Parker, Senator Reitzman has stated that he has made contact. Have you managed to make contact with an alien life form as well? Actually... No, I, um, I haven't seen any aliens. Uh, you know, the thing is, uh, it's sitting out there in my lake. Have you spoken to the senator? I, uh, I don't even know who he is. Thank you, sir. That was James Parker, a local farmer who was fishing when this particular object set down on the shore of his lake. I see there's some commotion over to our right. 
it, uh, it appears the senator is prepared to make his statement. After failing to win his party's nomination for president in the last election, the four-term senator has been a harsh critic of the president and has promised to reveal a government cover-up of the contact that has already been established with the aliens. Good God, has he lost his mind? John, this whole situation gets worse every day. No wonder they've ignored us so far. They have to believe we're absolute idiots. What does he think he's going to accomplish with this? I'm afraid we're about to find out. Are we on? Oh, okay. Um, to the people of planet Earth, my name is Senator Jack Reitzman. I am addressing you today from a mountain pass in North America. Right now, more than four billion people are listening to this broadcast. And that's good, because I have good news. We have made contact, and I have a message for our new neighbors. I want to personally welcome you to our planet, welcome you as friends and partners. We are a peace-loving species, and like you, we are explorers. Together we can explore new worlds, new opportunities, and new frontiers. Now, I would like to introduce my wife, Jocelyn Reitzman, who made the initial contact. Jocelyn. His wife made the contact? What did she do? Call them on her cell phone? I just hope she tells us what they said. Hello. Today... I feel truly blessed when I receive the telepathic message from the alien. Oh, no. She is such a nutcase. I knew they would be kind. So we should be kind, too. Are you getting that? Are you getting that? The ship is leaving. The entire thing is rising into the air. Hillridge reporting. The object that has occupied this spot in the Rocky Mountains for the last three days has taken off and is rising high into the atmosphere. All that's left is a deep impression in the ground. It was pandemonium here for a moment, but people are settling down and and most are watching the object rise into the sky and... And wait a minute. On the horizon, I can see another object rising up as well. Wow, what's that? Yeah, yes, yes, I see it. To the east of us, there's another object rising at a greater distance. Senator, Senator, do you think they heard you? Did they get the message? Well, not only did they get the message, but I'm convinced that it's what they came to hear. That's why they're leaving. That is what they wanted, and I, Delivered. It's been a month since the visitors, as we have come to call them, departed from the Earth. To date, there has been no evidence to explain the purpose of this strange and still mysterious visit. I'm here with Dr. Anna Johnson at one of the former landing sites. Dr. Johnson, what have you discovered? So far, nothing. Nothing? What about materials they left behind? Their technology or their ability to hover silently? We don't have a clue. It didn't seem to matter what kind of instruments we used when they were here or what we do now. They left no evidence. We don't know how or why they traveled here or anything about their technology. Many people are claiming that there is a pattern in their landing sites and that we simply haven't decoded the hidden message yet. We have many specialists trying to determine why they landed where they did, and all we can conclude is that it's a totally random pattern. Although they seem to avoid areas where their landing would cause any harm to people. So no one was injured? Not as a result of any of the objects. 
Unfortunately, we do have reports of more than 800,000 fatalities worldwide due to various and assorted actions taken by governments and the military. Senator Reitzman has announced his candidacy for president and continues to claim he was responsible for the departure of the visitors. What did he say that resonated with them? I'm sorry, but objects across the world were departing up to 20 minutes before the senator said a word. And the claims his wife has made about a telepathic message? That's her claim. No one else anywhere had a similar experience. Although some people are beginning to come out of the woodwork to claim they did. Do you think they'll be back? It's quite possible. I mean, they obviously know where we are. And which will it be? Invasion or new alliance? Quite frankly, I'd settle for either one. Unfortunately, I think if they do return, we're in for more of the same. Which is? Nothing. They didn't even seem to care that we existed. To put it bluntly, they came, they saw, they left. Our first encounter has occurred. An uninvited visit that the whole world was witness to. A desperate world looking for answers and a message. This time the message was clear, and we delivered it to ourselves somewhere between cold indifference, foolish pride, and the raw rage of animal instinct. Will they return? Will they give us the answers we need? Probably not. Unless you're willing to take a moment and understand that beyond a special place in deep space and a very important and faraway destination is that favorite alien rest stop known as the Twilight Zone. Rest Stop, starring Brandon Eels with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was written for The Twilight Zone by Steve Newby. Heard in the cast were Christian Stolte, Danny Goldring, Linda Reiter, Frenette Lebo, Torio Davis, Jeff Lupiton, Jim McCants, Lisa Wolf, Jamie Barron, Sean Cooper, Doug James, and Joby Cerny. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design, custom Foley effects, recording, and editing are produced in the Cerny American Sound to Picture Theater by sound designers Craig Lee, Bob Benson, and Tim Cerny. Music for the Twilight Zone is provided by CBS and American Music Incorporated New York. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to download episodes, including six free episodes on our homepage, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. Ring-a-ding girl, starring Sarah Wayne Callies with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Earl Hamner, Jr., Heard in the cast were Meg Falcon, David Darlow, Christian Stolte, Doug James, Frenette Lebo, Kurt Nabig, and Carl Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. 
This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Cece? Yes? Get that, will you? Right away. Just a minute. Yes, Patrick? Well? She'll be down in five minutes. She's not going to make it. Yes, she will. She always does. Here. What's that? A package. The mail truck just brought it. I'll take it up to her. You get the bags at the foot of the stairs. It's 30 minutes to the airport. Then you'll just have to drive faster. I can't work miracles. Yes, you can. That's why you're her favorite driver. Just tell her. She knows. Bring it in, girl. Hello, Ivor. Yes, I know the limousine is waiting. And I know what time the plane takes off. I promise you I'll make it. No, I am not procrastinating, even though I don't want to make this picture. Because I don't want to go to Rome. I don't like to fly. Yes, Ivor, I know, and you are making me even later. Mm-hmm, love you too. Bye. How's it coming? My agent's nervous. So am I. You've got 25 minutes to get to the airport. Won't they hold the plane? Not forever. You'd better go into fast forward. Um, everything's packed. I'll wear the mink. Carry my ring case down to Patrick, will you please? You're taking all of them? It was your idea, wasn't it? It was my idea that it might be good publicity if the ring-a-ding girl collected rings. Not that she take them everywhere she goes. But I haven't decided which one to wear. What's in the package? It just came. Special delivery. You can open it on the way. I adore presents. The plane can wait. Bunny, please. Please accept the enclosed as a token of our affection from your fan club in Howardville. Isn't that sweet? Do you know where Howardville is? Doesn't everyone? You'll catch a glimpse of it if you look down. We fly over it. Hooray for us. Howardville is my hometown. They're my most loyal fans. You know, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for them. They actually took up a collection to pay my way to the screen test. I wonder what they've sent me now. You find out. I'll get your precious jewelry down to the car. Oh, look, such a big ring. I hope it didn't cost them a fortune. What's in the stone, a picture? How did they do that? Bunny, this is your sister. Come home, Bunny. Please, I need you. Come home right now. Introduction to Bunny Blake. Occupation, film actress. Residence, Hollywood, California. Or anywhere in the world the cameras happen to be rolling. Miss Blake is a beautiful and extremely public figure. What she wears, eats, says, even thinks is news. But underneath the glamour, the makeup, the publicity, is a flesh and blood person, one who has just been handed the role of a lifetime. Because on the way to her next shoot, she will take an unscheduled side trip to a location in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Ring-a-Ding Girl, starring Sarah Wayne Callies, with Stacy Keach as your narrator.
And I'll have the sports scores plus the top stories from Howardville and the surrounding area. But first, the weather. Ah, uh, hurry up. Looks like we might be in for some showers. There's a low Bad. pressure trough moving in from the northeast. Yeah. Let's take a look at the Doppler. There we go. That high pressure Bad. moving in, bringing yes, I said. I need the picnic basket from the yet, cellar. Stay tuned throughout the day for updates every twenty. Soon minutes. as he gives the scores. For all you folks in the southern part of the county, the annual picnic and fundraiser is happening this afternoon, but better carry an umbrella just to Now, be Buster, I'm packing the sandwiches just as soon as I finish vacuuming. The news guy said it's going to rain. I know he did. So does the radio. But just in the northern part of the county. Now, get me that picnic basket. Did you clean your room? Not yet. Then get a move on. I'm going. Did you mow the lawn yet? Oh, Mom. We had an agreement. You want your allowance, don't you? Yes, ma'am. Then let me hear that lawnmower. Okay. Thank you. Would you plug in the vacuum cleaner cord for me, please? Isn't there a law against child labor in this state? Now, young man. Bud? What happened to the electricity? Bud? Who pulled the cord out of the... Boo. Oh! Bunny! <laughs> she remembers. Oh, come here. Let me get a look at you. It's been so long. I can't believe I've it. I've been looking forward to this. I think about you all the time. So good to be home. Why didn't you let us know? Uh, how did you get in without my hearing you? Same old way. I think I know this house. Oh, I could just shake you. That's no way to greet a celebrity. Five years, and here you are without one speck of warning. Look at that coat. Mm, you know me. Glamorous, unpredictable, and full of surprises. Same old nut. What brought you home just out of the blue like this? Well, I thought you might like to see me. Uh, I'm tickled pink, but why now? Just like that. Maybe the ring had something to do with it. Oh, it came! This morning, you see? Mm, you don't think it's too big? Not at all. No, it reminds me of that mood ring I had when I was little, remember? I, this is much nicer, of course. Much, much nicer. Oh, what a project it was. Everybody in town chipped in and they let me pick it out. <laughs> Do you like it? I love it. Sis, is everything all right? Mm, what do you mean? Are you all right? Never better. Why? I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just tired. Oh, come and sit down. Can I get you anything? No, no. Take your coat off. Oh, is that real mink? Mm-hmm. They call it Ember Autumn. Mm. I suppose it's a bit much. One of the perks of being a star. Oh, you. Oh, don't let it touch the floor. I haven't finished vacuuming yet. This is the way we do it in Hollywood, darling. They teach you to do it in acting class. Off one shoulder, then the other, then drop it like so. Oh. It's supposed to show that you really don't care because you've got ten more at home in the closet. Then you move your hips like this. Ooh, that walk didn't come from acting class. <laughs> <laughs> My one natural talent. Oh, Bunny, we are so proud of you. The whole town is. Are we going to get to keep you for a while? Just for the day, I'm afraid. Oh, but that's not nearly long enough. I know. I'm stealing time as it is. They want me in Rome. Rome? But I got to the airport, and right at the last minute, I said, no, I'm going home instead. I got the basket. Now can I... Whoa. And who is this divine man? You remember Bud? Ain't Bunny? Surely this isn't Bud. So handsome. I thought he was my next leading man. Aw, oh, I get it. Mom says you're always cracking jokes. Mm, and she was right, but I don't joke about everything. You want a, a, a soda pop or something? I can get you one Weren't if... Weren't you going to clean your room? He can do that later. I haven't seen him in ages. It's so good to be home. I'm anxious to see everybody, all my old friends. Well, you came at the right time. Remember the Founder's Day picnic? Oh, how could I forget? Do they still have the beauty pageant? They sure do. The year I won was what got me started. My picture in the paper? Someone on the coast saw it? Uh, the picnic's this afternoon. Everyone in town will be there. Why don't you come with us? The picnic? Bud and I have to go. I'm on the food committee and Bud's a lifeguard. Picnic. Picnic. We promised we'd be there. Bunny, what's the matter? Are you all right? Come over to the couch. I'm fine. Just let me sit down. I don't know what's wrong with me. I didn't get much sleep. Oh, take my arm. Bud, get on the other side. I'm fine, I'm telling you. Bunny? Bunny? Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. What 
is that? Do you hear it? Hear what? Is the television on? No. Bunny? Bunny? And a special hello to you, Bunny Blake, wherever you are. Bunny, for the love of God, come home. We need you. We need you. You're pale. You look like you're going to faint. I, uh... If I could just lie down... Put your feet up. Bud, call Dr. Floyd. Sure, if you think. Just do it, now. Bunny. Hello? Um, I, I want to talk to... Bunny. Yeah, tell him it's an emergency. Open? There. Well, what's the verdict? Will I live or will I die? Well, temperature's normal. Pulse is strong enough. You do seem a little tired. I played a nurse once in a movie. Doctor reminded me of you. The gruff but kindly old family physician. I saw it. The medical profession should have sued. Stay off your feet a while longer. Oh, please, don't you get it? I was faking. About being sick, I mean. I just wanted to see you. I'm flattered. Do you have to smoke? It calms my nerves. Quite the contrary, actually. Still the same old Dr. Floyd. You haven't changed. That I don't believe. I delivered you, after all. Sorry, I don't remember. What's your diagnosis? In a nutshell, one exhausted young lady. What do you do out in Hollywood, anyway? I glow. Wind me up and I give off incandescent sparkles. Isn't that what stars do? I'd say you've been sparkling a little too much lately. What you need is sleep, rest, fresh air, and some of Hildy's good cooking. I want you to take it easy for a while. I'd love to oblige you, kind sir, but that's impossible. There's a producer waiting in Rome this very minute, pulling out what little hair he has left, just wondering where I am. Tell me his name. I'll send a cable and tell him you're sick. But I'm not. Just the same. I didn't like what Hildy told me. She said you had some kind of seizure. Oh, that's silly. She thought you were in shock. You seemed not to hear or see her. It was a performance... Evidently a very convincing one. I told you it was all an excuse to get you over here. Well, it worked. There's something I want to ask you. Yes? About Founders Day. What about it? You used to be a big man on the committee. Still am. I'm the chairman now. Then could you do something for me? Hmm? As one kindly gruff old family friend to another, would you do me one very large favor? I'll be happy to try. I want the picnic put off. Postponed until another day. Really? Is that all? It's important. You can't be serious, Bunny. Why? I've got one little day to spend at home. I want it to be a plain, ordinary apple pie day, just the way I remember. I want to drop in on my old friends, surprise them at home. You could see them at the picnic. No, it wouldn't be the same. There'll be crowds, people I don't know, crowds tugging at me for my autograph. I'd be miserable. Bunny, listen to me. You can't seriously expect the entire town to rearrange its plans just to suit your whims. Doc, I love this town, and I love the people. Would I ask them to do this for me if it weren't more than a whim? I don't know what your life is like away from here. Perhaps in Hollywood you can make an unreasonable request and have it granted, but this isn't Hollywood. I'm going to give you a little something to help you rest. Oh, Doctor, if I could only make you understand. Any pharmacy in town should be able to fill this. No, not the ring again. Ring-a-ding, girl. Oh, there's a laugh I ever heard one. You don't fool Cyrus and Jen. Who do you think you are, Miss Snippet? All high and mighty, coming back here like you was somebody special. Go back to where you belong, Bunny Blake. Go back. Go back. Go back. Oh. Don't you want your prescription, Bunny? Excuse me, Doctor, I don't belong here. Bunny? Bunny? Hildy, can you come here? Yes, Doctor. How is the patient? Mm, where is the patient? She went upstairs. She did? Very agitated all of a sudden. The look on her face. Hildy, what's upsetting your sister? I wish I knew. 
She seems to be under a severe strain and acting quite irrationally. I know. I'm delighted to see her, of course, but to fly here like this without so much as a call? There's something downright odd about it. I want you to get this filled. Some pills to relax her. Keep her as quiet as possible. And by no means let her go to Rome. At least not right away. I'll try, but she's always had her own mind. It may be just fatigue, but then again... Should I be worried? It's too soon to say. For now, let's keep an eye on her. Thank you, Doctor. I'll do my best. Call me if you need me. I will. Thank you so much for stopping by. Bud? Yeah? Is your car running? Sure is. Why? This is a prescription for Aunt Bunny's medicine. Get it filled as quickly as you can. Okay. What's the matter with her, Mom? I'm not sure. Not one single solitary thing is the matter, Hildy. I could have told you that. I'm really shocked at how old Dr. Floyd's getting. I think that sweet old man ought to put himself out to pasture, don't you? He thinks you ought to get some rest. Does he? Well, I'm not the least bit tired. He's the one that needs rest, poor dear. Did you see the way his hands tremble? Nevertheless, he left a prescription for you. Something to help you relax. Bud's going to go get it. Meanwhile, why don't you just lie down and take it easy? I can make us something while we wait. You mean stay here? I can just hear what people will say. Bunny didn't bother to see any of her old friends. She's so stuck up now that she's a movie star. No one will say that. I'll explain that you didn't feel well. Bobby Woodson used to be my best friend. I've just got to see her. There'll be time. And Ben Braden? You remember that excruciating crush he had on me? What happened to Ben? Still here. He runs the television station. Oh. Does the news and all the local shows. And the sports, too. I could have married that old boy. Did you know that? I've got a good mind to walk in and surprise him. I really don't think you should leave the house today, honey. Oh, you don't? Well, I can't stand being cooped up. Sometimes I get that closed-in feeling at my house in California. I get that, too. You know what I do? I take off every stitch of clothes and I jump into the pool and swim like a fish. You do? Bud, why don't you go get that prescription now? Remember when we used to skinny dip at the old swimming hole? Uh, it must be very interesting for your neighbors. Nobody's complained yet. I'll bet. But I have an idea. You want to go for a walk and say hello to some people? The doctor said you need to rest. He also said I need fresh air. Oh, at least wait till Bud gets back from the drugstore with your medicine. Got a better idea. I'll ride to the drugstore with him. What do you say, Bud? Well, sure, I, I guess. I don't think... What could be more restful than a little ride? Unless you're one of those drag racers, are you? Not me. I am. You want to see me on the Hollywood freeway. Once, I got up to 105, and this divine cop flagged me down and said, Where's the fire, lady? I mean, he actually said that. Well, I said, Sugar, I'm late for work, and the studio's going to suspend me if I'm late one more time. Bunny. It ended up with Dollface giving me a police escort right to the studio gate. I even had dinner with him a couple of times. Till I found out he was married. You did? Well, you going with me, or are we going to stand here talking all day? Heck no. I mean... Yes, I, I mean... But the picnic! You worry too much, Hildy. We'll be back in plenty of time, I promise. Want your coat? Why, thank you, kind sir. L let me get the door. Well, what do you know? That's a real ring-a-ding sky. Drive carefully, bud. Don't be long, you two. Well, what do you think, Aunt Bunny? Pretty cool wheels, huh? Very cool, but please don't call me Aunt Bunny. I sound like a house mother at the Playboy Club. Okay, Bunny. There, that's better. Isn't that better? Must be pretty boring for you. I wouldn't say that. Compared to Hollywood and everything, you know a lot of movie stars. <laughs> a few. What are they like? Which ones? Oh, I don't know. You go to parties and all that stuff? Not very often. Mostly I stay home, study my lines, and go to bed. You do? I have to get up early when I'm on a picture. Do you have one of those... Aw, oh, never mind. Go ahead, say it. Well, I hear everybody has a water bed out there. 
I used to, but I got rid of it. How come? Too noisy. Sloshing around every time you turn over. Sometimes I'd wake up in the night and I think I was on a raft in the middle of the ocean. Gosh. They're cold, too. Especially because I don't wear anything when I sleep. You don't? Better not mention that part to your mother. Do you understand? We're just talking, aren't we? A couple old friends tooling around on the best set of wheels in town. Isn't that right? Sure, buddy. So, where do you want to go? Is Mr. Gentry still the caretaker at the high school? Old Methuselah? Oh yeah. They'll have to blow up the place to get rid of him. Be an angel. Stop by just long enough for me to run in and say hi. School's closed today. I know, but Mr. Gentry's always around, isn't he? I used to think he lived there. Well, the gate's open. I could show you how to get in the building. Would you? I'd appreciate that. Maybe we should get your medicine first. Bud, this is important or I wouldn't ask you. Okay, if do you think it's all right? Oh, it'll be fine. Trust me. I just have to deliver a message. Mr. Gentry? Are you in here, Mr. Who's there? Dang kids. Mr. Gentry, remember me? Barbara Blake. That you? It's me. How are you? <laughs> I'm kicking pretty high for an old man. So you finally came back. Get your fill of Hollywood, did you? No, I like it there. It's not what you think. Isn't it? We read all about the hijinks you get into. Can't say I'd be proud of it. <laughs> I don't know what you mean, Mr. Gentry. It's just a town like any other. <laughs> What brings you back here, Barbara? I'm not sure. It was an impulse. Well, you picked a time. The Founders' Day celebration. Not that you'd be interested. But I am interested. That's why I need your help. My help? I want you to do something for me. Unlock the doors to the school auditorium. What for? Some people might show up. And if they do, I want you to let them in. Oh, <laughs> not me. Nope, I'm going to the picnic. Please, Mr. Gentry, I know you don't like me, but this is important. It's, it's terribly important. <laughs> Barbara Blake. Always asking for favors. Wanting to be treated like somebody special. Maybe you forgot those doors are open all day long. You want to come here? You can walk in just like anybody else. Thank you, Mr. Gentry. It was wonderful to see you. Anything else I can do you for? Just one. Mr. Gentry, I, I can't explain it yet, and if I did, you wouldn't believe me. But please don't go to the picnic. Take my word for it, you mustn't. Not this year. Well? How does the old town look? So good, I wonder why I ever left. Why did you leave, I mean? <sighs> oh, I guess I could have stayed and done Blythe Spirit in the little theater and played an angel in the church pageant at Christmas time, but I was too ambitious. Too talented, you mean? Oh, I don't know if it was that. I just... I knew I had some talent and I had to find a place for it to grow. Otherwise, it would have died and I'd have ended up... Frustrated, pushing a broom around a house I couldn't stand and screaming at a brood of children. I... Can you understand that, bud? I sure can. Well, you've got your prescription. Want to go home now? Wait. What's the matter? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the captain. We're running into a little rough weather. Fasten your seatbelts, please. It might get a little bumpy up here. Bunny, something wrong with your ring? What? Oh. Uh, oh, no, nothing at all. It's just the way it catches the light. Sometimes I think I see a, a, a picture in it. Uh, yeah. Do you want to go home? Is the television station still on the street? Uh-huh. Right over there. Wait for me, will you, bud? I'll be right back. Thank you, Jeffrey. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and the weather for the Tri-County area. No, no. 
For the Tri-County area, boy, have we got some weather for you now. The weather in the Tri-County. What's this, Harold? Corn, Mr. Braden, for the farm report. Nice, huh? Very nice. Would you move it aside so I can see my script? Sure thing. 90 seconds. Thank you. How's my hair look? Great, Mr. Braden. Hey, hey, you can't come in here. Thanks. It's all right. I'm a friend of Mr. Braden's. Barbara? I mean, Bunny? Forgive me for bursting in this way. Not at all. Well, I'll be darned. They said you were going on the air, but I did so want to say hello. Honey, you could have busted in here even if I was on camera. Don't I get a kiss? One minute. Well, you haven't changed. You have. You used to be skinny as a rail. I was not. I was svelte. Nope. Now you're svelte. Or mink? Hollywood coveralls. Still a smart aleck, too. Want to be on my show? I thought you'd never ask. 45 seconds. Will you? You can be my co-host. Say something cute. Say anything you like. The viewers will love it. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what I had in mind. I wanted to make an announcement. Oh, yeah? Got a new movie to plug? No, not at all. More along the lines of a public service announcement. Sounds worthwhile. I hope so. Because I have a feeling this one might be a, a matter of life and death. Hello? No, I haven't got it turned on. She is? Oh, of course I knew she was in town. No, no warning, but she's supposed to be at the drugstore with Bud. Yes, Clara, I'll call you back. Yes, Ben, you can't imagine how happy I am to be back in Howardville. It hasn't changed a bit, and I mean that in a good way. What in the world? Will you be with us for a nice long visit this time, buddy? Unfortunately, I have to leave tonight. Work calls. Oh, a new picture? I'm starting one in Rome. That sounds exciting. Yes, it's a wonderful script. I'm looking forward to it. Everyone in town has been following your career. I'm sure a lot of your old friends would like to see you. Well, but they can if they really want to. Are you kidding? You know that one-woman show I did in Las Vegas last winter? We read all about it. Well, I'm giving a special performance this afternoon in the high school auditorium. And I hope everyone in town will come, as my guest, of course. Wow, did you hear that, ladies and gentlemen? It's my way of giving back to the community. You know, everyone here has always been so supportive of me. This is just a, a little token of my appreciation. Oops, I think we've got a conflict here. The Founders Day picnic starts at 3 o'clock. You remember what a big event that always is. I know, but I'm afraid it just has to be today. All I can say is that you'll have a choice of coming to see me at 3 o'clock, or going over to Riverside Park and getting hit by... By... A bunch of ants. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here, folks. Well, Bunny, thank you so much for stopping by... Clara? I just heard. I swear I don't know a thing about it. I thought she was on her way back from the drugstore and now here she is on TV. Why, I don't know which one I'll go to. They'll expect me at the picnic. The way I feel now, I'd be too embarrassed to show my face anywhere. Oh, here they are now. I'll call you back. Hi, Mom. Sorry we took so long. Go to your room. Bunny, I'm trying not to be angry with you because you must have lost your mind. I told you there was going to be an explosion, buddy boy. I can explain. I said you're excused. Yes, ma'am. It wasn't his fault. This is nothing to joke about. People are calling here. And what do they say? They're confused. They don't know whether to go to the picnic or this whatever it is you're putting on at the school. I can understand that, but... What are you trying to do? I owe this town, Hildy. It's just my way of paying back a debt. It doesn't look that way. It looks like you're a show-off. A big celebrity who's trying to impress a lot of small-town hicks. That's not it at all. Then what is it? Sis, let's not fight. I can't condone what you're doing, Bunny. And I won't be a part of it. Bud and I will be at the picnic. Oh, Hildy, you don't understand. No. 
Not the ring. Is that Howardville down there? That's it. That fly speck next to the river. That's what you wanted to go home to? Forget it, Bunny. We don't have time. Have time. Oh no, there has to be time. What else can I do? Barb? What's the matter? Nobody understands what I'm trying to do. It's not for me, not this time. Please don't cry. Oh, honey, there are some things about you I'll never understand. But if this performance means so much to you... It does. Then don't you worry. We'll be there, I promise. Time to go. We're late. Don't worry. One thing's for sure. They can't start the show till I get there. Ooh, better take an umbrella. Thanks. Bud, we're waiting. I can't find my blue tie. Then wear another one. We're late as it is. You'd better fire your weatherman. Now, bud. Coming. The streets will be a fright. Remember how we used to lie in our beds on rainy nights and talk to each other when we were kids? Oh, it was fun, wasn't it? Being kids. It was special. I'll never forget it. It's raining really heavy. Well, we'll just have to brave it. I have an audience waiting. Oh, we need raincoats. They're in the hall closet. You wear one. I'm going in style. That fur will get all ruined. Don't worry about me. Help me on with it, will you? Your ring looks really pretty. Thank you, bud. We've had some unexpected turbulence, so please remain seated. We'll get through it all right, folks. Getting kind of rough. Don't worry, Cece. It was meant to be. You aren't scared at all, are you? Why should I be? Can't live forever, you know. It's like... When I'm in my dressing room and there's a call to come to the set, I know what's waiting for me. I know there's nothing I can do to put it off any longer. Sometimes I'm not even sure if I know my lines, but the show must go on. Hildy. Yes? I'm going now. I'm coming. Not this time. What do you mean? And Hildy, thank you. For what? For being my sister. I always loved you, you know. Bunny? That one's a fire engine. Sounds like an awful lot of them. Turn on the news. Goodbye, Hildy. And buddy, take good care. Bunny? Major disaster. We'll bring you updates as they come in. For now, the highway patrol has issued a bulletin for everyone Turn that to remain down. inside. Hello? Mrs. Blake? Yes. This is Jim Haddock with the State Troopers. Oh, what is it, Jim? I'm out at the park. I thought you ought to know. Know what? That Bud, where's Bunny? I don't know. It's terrible. I've never seen anything like it. Like what? Jim, will you please tell me what it is you're talking about? The crash. It happened minutes ago. What crash? Passenger jet. L.A. to New York got torn up in that storm. Crashed right in the middle of the picnic grounds. Hildy, your sister is dead. Bunny is dead. Dead? <laughs> That's crazy. She was a passenger on that plane. She and another woman sitting right next to each other. Jim, my sister is here, now. I saw the body myself. Hildy, there's no mistake. It was Bunny Blake. I'm sorry to be the one to tell you. Bunny? Bunny, where are you? She's not here, Mom. Want to hear the news? Fortunately, only a Bunny? handful of people attended this year's Founders Day picnic, so a disaster of even greater proportions was averted. Bunny! Most of the population is safe at the high school auditorium, where they gathered for a special performance by our own local celebrity, Miss Bunny Blake. 
Conflicting reports claim that she was a passenger on the ill-fated plane, but witnesses swear, I would swear, that she was here in Howardville this afternoon. Until the mystery is solved, only one thing is certain. There's been a terrible crash, the worst in the state's history. Bunny! Mom! That ring you gave her. I got it. She dropped it on the porch. Mom? We are all travelers. The trip starts in a place called birth and ends at a distant location known as death. And that's the end of the journey. Unless, like Bunny Blake, you happen to make one last curtain call on a misty stage somewhere in the twilight zone. We'll return to the Twilight Zone in just a moment. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop twilightzoneradio.com. Visit twilightzoneradio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. That will conclude the closing argument. Unless either side has a rebuttal, defense counsel. I wish I had something more, some new evidence. Don't worry about it, Mr. Christopher. You did all you could. Counsel for the defense. Uh, no, Your Honor. The defense rests. How about the prosecution? Nothing more, Your Honor. Very well, then. The jury will now retire for deliberations. Bailiff? This way, please. Court will reconvene for the verdict. Until then, we'll stand in recess. On your feet, Grant. Do you really have to put the cuffs on me? Hands behind your back. I'll stay with you to the verdict, Sin. It doesn't make any difference. This way. It may take a while. It never does. <laughs> Mr. Grant? No statements to the press. If I could have one more word. I told you, Mr. Carson. Oh, why not? Give the reader something. I wouldn't recommend it in case we file an appeal. We won't. I guarantee it. End of the hall. I know that. A room with a table and three chairs, bars on the window, two policemen outside. It never changes. You can wait in here with your client, counselor. All right. I told you there's no need, really. Go get a cup of coffee, just drink it fast. What about that interview? It's okay, guard. Right, we'll be right outside. Knock when you're through. How do you do it, Mr. Grant? Do what? You don't seem worried about the jury. Still believe this isn't happening? 
Oh, what's happening, all right? That's the problem. I can't stop it from happening. Then you do fear capital punishment. As much as anyone else. But you, all of you, are the ones who should worry. Because if I go, you go too. That's the part I don't understand. I'll go on with my life. We all will. But if the judgment is against you... Where do I know you from? Pardon? Help me out here. Was it grade school, my first job? We met when the trial started. No, before that. Your face... Oh, well. There's much time left. You never can tell. The longer the jury stays out, the better your chances. That's usually the way it works. Not today. If I could ask you something else. Sorry. Time's up. Let's go. Yeah, jury's ready. I know. So long, Mr. Carson. See you in my dreams. How did he know? Sit up straight. Here, here they come. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. And what is that verdict? We find the defendant, Adam Grant, guilty of murder in the first degree. Order in the court. The defendant will rise. The defendant will rise. Adam. What? Oh, all right. Let's get it over with. Adam Grant, you have been tried by a jury of your peers and found guilty. Do you have anything you wish to say before sentence is passed? Very well. It is the sentence of this court that for the, for the brutal, brutal and despicable, despicable crime, crime of murder, of murder in, the in the first degree, you, you shall, shall be put, put to death, to death by means, by of, means electrocution. of electrocution. No! Not again! You can't make me die again! Restrain the prisoner. Put the leg irons on him. I'll put him down. You can't make me die again! Oh, God, please! 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 Take him away. Tell them, Mr. District Attorney, that this isn't real. Make them understand that they're only a dream I'm having. You fools! If you kill me, you'll die too. Mr. Carson, you believe me? Make him believe. Tell the district attorney he prosecuted himself and everybody in this building and everybody in the world. Tell him, Mr. Carson, before it's too late. Tell him. Tell him. Adam Grant, a nondescript kind of man, found guilty of murder and sentenced to the electric chair. Like every other criminal caught in the wheels of justice, he's scared right down to the marrow of his bones. But it isn't prison that scares him. The long, silent nights of waiting, the slow walk to the little room, or even death itself. It's something else that holds Adam Grant in the hot, sweaty grip of fear. Something worse than any punishment this world has to offer. Something found only in the Twilight Zone. And now... The Twilight Zone and our story, Shadow Play, starring Ernie Hudson with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Ready for another one, Mr. Carson? Maybe just a pinch, my good man. Rocks, was it? Yeah. No, wait. Something different. Let's try gin this time. What's a gin drink? Mm, Tom Collins? Right. I like the sound of that. I wonder who Mr. Tom Collins was to have a drink named after him. <laughs> Beats me. What's in a name? Like Adam Grant. Who is he, really? That guy they arrested? Tried and convicted post-haste. Quite a mysterious fella. Yeah. Well, not from around here. His identity is not the problem. He had virtually no defense, but he has some very peculiar ideas. You talked to him? A few times, for the paper. 
He's seriously disturbed, mentally speaking. <laughs> no kidding. Has some crazy notion that this is all a dream, that it's happened before. Huh? And that it'll happen again. I'd say he's certifiably insane. Well, that won't save him from the chair. No, but maybe it should. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'll just go knock over the bank and tell him I'm some kind of a nut. Well, that ought to do it. <laughs> but what if he is? If he was incompetent to stand trial? His lawyer should have thought of that. Some kid from the public defender's office. His first case. Well, you pull something like that, you pay the price. You know what I mean? Hey, how's the Tom Collins? Hmm. Out of this world, if I do say so. You should meet his friend, Johnny Walker. <laughs> An excellent idea. Top draw. <laughs> he really got to you, didn't he? To whom do you refer? The creep. Ah, oh, well. I am but a lowly newspaper man. It's all quite beyond my control, I suppose. Hey, take my advice. Forget it. Hey, ever meet my other friend? What's his name? Well, they call him Jack Daniels. <laughs> <laughs> Holy, lay off that thing, will you? Yeah, people are trying to sleep. Sorry, fellas. I didn't know I was bothering anybody. That's better. It's... It's all right, Coley. It's my fault. I got you out of a bad movie I saw once about death row. Just like everything else in this corny dream. Grant, let me give you some advice. What's that, Jiggs? Stop thinking about it. You think about it, you crack up, like Phillips there. Listen to him. Mother, they're, they're gonna fry me. I, I never did anything. Phillips! <laughs> Shut your face! <laughs> See there? A month ago he was a human being. Now what is he? An animal. Why? Because he couldn't stop thinking about it. I know. It's, it's just different with me. Different how? I can't stop. That's all I can do, think. You mean you're looking forward to it? You want to die? No. Well, then it ain't different with you. <laughs> Don't kid yourself. Sometimes I wonder, too, what it's going to be like. But that's a bad way of thinking. Don't lead nowhere. I'll tell you what it's like. Yeah? Yeah. They come for you a few minutes early. That's so they can cut your trouser legs. They even shave your head at least part way. Then they open your cell. You walk out and down the cell block to a hall. Past two great doors at the end. 78 steps exactly to the final door painted green. It's got a little glass pane with chicken wire, but you can't see anything on the other side. There's a guard who opens the door for you. And you go into a room. It's tan. It's all tan. There's nothing in it except the chair. It's made out of wood, and it's big, so it feels like a chair you used to sit in when you were a kid. Hard and solid and not very comfortable. Uh, cut it out. They strap your arm and legs with thick buckles, and then they attach the electrodes. It's funny. They always feel cold to the touch at first. Man, talk like you've been through it already. Then they drop the mask over your head. It's musty. It smells like an old sofa. And then you wait. Every muscle tense, straining. Any second, any second, then you can almost hear it through the wall. They pull the switch. 
fair. Two beautiful, beautiful steaks. Almost done. Who's that, Hank? Why, I don't know. You expecting anybody? No. You sit right there. I'll get it. Paul! Madam, I am a poor lost traveler seeking food and lodging for the night. I don't believe it. You're loaded. Mr. District Attorney. Hello, Paul. I've just been insulted by your wife. She says I'm intoxicated. Well, aren't you? That has nothing to do with it. Your attitude toward the press needs some adjusting. So does mine, as a matter of fact. Hey, hey, take it easy there. That's my best gin. Dear friends, when I die, I don't want to see any full bottles around. That's not funny. It wasn't meant to be. It was meant to be a comment on the short, unhappy life of Paul Carson. Won't you join me? Come, drink and be merry for tomorrow. Oh, shut up, Paul. I knew it. I knew it the minute you walked in. We're not nervous enough? Oh, no. We have to listen to the great city editor with his news behind the news. If I'm not welcome here, then I shall go elsewhere and breathe my last. Oh, never mind. I've had enough of this anyway. I'm going to lie down. Good night, dear. But what about dinner? The steaks are almost ready. Take them out of the broiler in five minutes. There are a couple baked potatoes, too. Aren't you having any? I've lost my appetite. Hank, I wanted to talk to you. Now don't start again. I've got to. We're running out of time. I'm not upset or disturbed or nervous anymore. I'm scared. That's ridiculous. I know it is, but that doesn't help. You mean to say you believe that crazy story? God help me, Hank. But I do. At least I believe it's possible. Oh, come on. Well, why not? Can we prove he's wrong? Maybe not, but that's a poor reason for believing in anything. I can't prove the world isn't going to end, but it isn't. Or do you believe that, too? I'm not sure what I believe. This guy killed a man in cold blood just like that, and he's going to pay. Those are the facts. Anything else is speculation, fantasy. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. I put my entire staff on it. An open and shut case. Then why are you so steamed up about it? I'm not. I'll tell you why. Because a little part of you believes, too. Just a little tiny part of Henry Ritchie says, maybe Grant is right. Maybe this is all a dream. The thought has occurred to you, hasn't it? Hank, we've known each other a long time. Haven't you ever stopped and said to yourself, this couldn't be real, it's too easy, too pat. I couldn't have a lovely wife like Carol, and a lovely home and money in the bank. Not in any real world. Haven't you, Hank? Well, of course. Everyone has. If you're a success, you're bound to think it's a dream at some point or other. If not, you think it's a nightmare. This only proves that Grant is human. He can't believe what's happening to him. So he tries to convince himself that it isn't, not really. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. Hank, I've been talking to this guy a lot lately, and he makes sense. Go down there and see for yourself. Don't take my word for it. It wouldn't do any good. You've only listened to him once, when he had that outburst in the courtroom. That was enough. Hank, for my sake, please, go and see him. Let him tell you. He's only got three hours and 15 minutes left. He'll say anything. You're an intelligent man. You'll be able to see through it if he's lying. If not for my sake, do it for yourself, for your own peace of mind. My mind was at peace until you walked in. Was it? Please, Hank. It's pointless, but... Thanks. It may turn out to be important. More important than we know.
No. No, Mother, don't, don't let them strap me in. Enough already, Phillips. Yes. Yes, sir, I'm... I'm a, I'm a, I'm a good boy. Grant. Yeah? What's the matter? You don't like your food? It's fine. Then how come you didn't touch it? Because my stomach's tied up in knots. <laughs> how would you feel about your last meal? I told you we would have got you anything you wanted. All you had to do was name it. Except maybe a cake with a hacksaw in it. That wouldn't do me any good. It wouldn't change a thing. Well, we did the best we could. Steak, ice cream. You shouldn't have bothered. I don't even like ice cream. All melted now anyway. I thought you liked steak. I do. But a condemned man isn't supposed to enjoy his last meal. How could he? Look here. I'm not supposed to, but... You want something else? I'll try to get it for you. No, thanks. Give it to Jiggs. Maybe he's hungry. You don't have to ask me twice. Pass the tray through. That's mighty nice of you, Grant. Don't mention it. Guard? What's the time? 9.02. Plenty left. Get some rest if you want. Mmm. That's pretty good steak. You ought to have some. Knock yourself out. Hey, Grant, don't you know this is a tradition? The one time where the screws will give you anything you want. Yeah, I know. That's why I dreamed it this way. Bad stomach and all. Coley, want some? Oh, what's you got? Baked potato. Catch. Hey, thanks. What time you got, Jiggs? Don't you have a watch? It might have stopped. 9.03. You got a date? Nah. Just expecting someone. Let me guess. The governor, right? With a nice fat pardon in his fist. No, it's the district attorney. He usually comes around nine. The DA himself, huh? You must be a real important person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The most important man in the world. Ow! You gotta have some sense of humor, pal. You could have broke your hand that way. Now it has stopped. Wait a minute. There's something else that isn't right. I'll have to remember next time. How's that? Prisoners about to be executed aren't allowed to wear watches because of the glass and metal. You don't say. You ought to tell that to the warden. She'll be real interested in your opinion. I don't know who the warden is this time. It might have changed. This way, Mr. Ritchie. Thank you, guard. See? What did I tell you? Right on time. Say, how'd you know? Ten minutes. That should be plenty. You can leave me with him. Be back when you're ready. Hello, Grant. Hello, Mr. Ritchie. You don't seem surprised to see me. I'm not. You won't drop the act, will you? I don't have to act. You always come. <laughs> I mean, the district attorney always comes. It's not you every time. Grant. Yes? Why bother to stick to this dream story of yours? What does it matter now? If I could change it, I would, believe me. Only I don't know how. It can't possibly do you any good at this point. You realize that. I should. After all this time, every night I explain, and every night it's the same. Explain it again. Well, it's very simple. When I die, you die. And everybody in this world dies. Because this world does not exist. It's a dream of mine, a nightmare. Can't you understand that? No, Grant, I can't understand that, and not because it's a new idea. I can't understand it or accept it because it doesn't make any kind of logical sense. But it does! It's the only thing that does make logical sense. Not what I understand logic to mean. Think it through. I tell you, it's not logical. That's only one kind of thinking. Reason it out. Think, man. Take you, for instance. Here we go. The butterfly dreaming it's a butterfly hypothesis. 
Just stick with the basic facts. That's all you need. Do you think that you, a district attorney, would ever visit a man who was about to be executed in real life? Have you ever done that? Not that I recall. Of course not. They wouldn't let you in here. I'll bet they didn't even search you. And now they're leaving us alone in a locked cell together? You're the man who sent me here. I might beat your brains out. I'm a murderer, aren't I? I'm sure we're being monitored. We must be. Or take me. Have you ever heard of a case where a man was condemned and put to death this quickly? There would be years of appeals, wouldn't there? Your lawyer didn't file any. There are automatic appeals required by law. And don't you think it's a little too pat that I was represented by a public defender who had never even tried a capital case before? Oh, come on. Look around you. This isn't a real prison. It's a cliche drawn from every old movie ever made. The guy with the harmonica, the nutcase, the guards, everyone's a type. They could be from central casting. Well, you're certainly not typical. How do you know? You don't know what I am. You don't know any more about me than you did when it started. It's like I didn't have a past before this. I'm some sort of mysterious stranger, like a character in a story. There are hundreds of vagrants in, in every, every town, town without, without names, without, without histories. History. Stop that. How did I just know what you were going to say? Isn't that a little weird? Or do you believe in mind reading? That's not too weird for you? We know you're mentally sound. You were found competent to stand trial. I don't think you're deliberately lying to me. So what do you live with? Some other explanation? I'm going to destroy this story of yours, Grant, once and for all. Now you say that all this is a dream and that when you're electrocuted, you wake up, and when you wake up, we all disappear, right? That's right. And then it starts all over again. What about our parents? And our parents' parents, and everybody who never even heard of you. What about the billions of people? Well, what about them, Mr. Ritchie? Every dream builds its own world. Have you ever had a dream with blank spaces in it? It's filled out in every detail, complete with a past, and as long as you stay asleep, a future. What about us, then? The people in this world, when we sleep and dream? Or don't we? Is that when you're supposed to be up and around and wherever you really are? You only sleep and dream because I dream you that way. All right, now answer me this. You're scared. Why? Why are you scared? You've got to wake up sometime, even if you're electrocuted, so why don't you just sit back and enjoy it till then? <laughs> enjoy it? Let me tell you something, Mr. Ritchie. Huh? How, how soundly do you sleep? What's that got to do with it? Well, I mean... You dream, don't you? Certainly, sometimes. Haven't you ever been hurt in one of those dreams? Haven't you ever fallen out of a window or been drowned or tortured physically and mentally? We all have nightmares. You have. Well, don't you remember how real it seemed? How you woke up screaming? Let me ask you something, Mr. Ritchie. How do you like to wake up screaming every night? That's what I do. Because I dream the same dream night after night after night. It's this one. It changes a little bit. The people get shuffled around, but it's the same dream. You got to believe me. I can't go on dying. I can't. Not every night. I can't. I can't. Get your hands off me. Let him go. Out this way. I'm telling you the truth, Mr. Ritchie. Please let me live and I'll keep you alive. I'll dream you every night, just as you are now. Your life, your house. Wait a minute. I'll prove it. Your wife. She has a steak waiting for you. Isn't that right? Go home. Look in the oven. It'll be something else when you get there. I swear. I can change the small details. You'll see. Please. Please.
Carol, are you up? In here, darling. The steaks. Oh, that's right. You did say you wanted steaks tonight. Carol, don't be offended, but may I see them? I'm sorry. I thought I'd save the steaks for tomorrow night. I hope you don't mind. Just let me have a look. What's wrong, Hank? That's a roast. What about it? I thought you liked roast. Hank? Hank, what about it? Grant. Grant! Yes? Did I wake you up? No. You didn't wake me. <laughs> What's so funny? Nothing. Nothing's funny at all. Well, thanks for giving your meal away. It was nothing, really. I thought I heard you laughing in your sleep. No chance of that. Hey, Grant, listen. I've been thinking about what you said, about all this being a dream, you know? So? Well, no. Maybe it won't work, but maybe it'd be worth a try. What would? If you told that story to the governor, he might let you out on a psycho. He wouldn't believe me. Well, you never can be sure. You don't believe me, do you, Jiggs? Oh, that don't matter. If you think it's true, see, why, then you got a loose cog somewhere. And they don't burn guys with loose cogs. I wonder. I could try proving it to you. Proof what? Jiggs, don't you think that all this is just... just a little too much the way it should be? I don't get you. Well, I mean, it's so perfect. For one thing, I got tried and sentenced the same day. It doesn't work like that. Huh? But you see, that's the way I saw it in my mind, and that's the way it is. All the movies and TV shows when I was a kid, the comic books, take this place. You, for instance. Hey, no. And Coley. And Phillips and his mother. <laughs> it is a movie. For all intents and purposes, real death houses aren't like this. But you see, I've never been to a real death house. So what do I know? That's my impression of it. And in my mind, people do get last minute reprieves. Stays of execution, new trials. It's not out of the question. But I played my last card. There's nobody left for me to tell my story to. Except you. No, Jiggs. It won't work. I can't change the basic scenario. I wish to heaven I could. Man, you're really flipped. Now I don't know what you're talking about. That clock over the fireplace, is it accurate? It is. Then, it is 11.45. It'll be over soon. Well, the brothers Grimm, as I live in... What are you doing up? It's almost midnight. I'm not up. I'm down, like you and your funny friend here. Sorry if we woke you, Carol. I'll be leaving soon. Have they... Not yet. Fifteen more minutes. That's another thing. What is? Think about it, Hank. I'm tired of thinking. Why does it always happen at midnight? Did you ever wonder about that? Because that's when they schedule executions. Yeah, but why? You tell me. Excuse me, boys. I don't suppose anyone would like some coffee? Not now, dear. Hank, according to Grant, he doesn't know anything about these matters except what he sees in the movies. So he told me. And in the movies, it always happens at midnight. That's because movies are technically accurate. Are they? About things like that, at least. Yeah, I always thought so. But that's a strange belief, too, when you come to think of it. Then don't come to think of it. But I've got to think about something, or I'll sit here for the next few minutes with my insides all twisted up. Don't let me interrupt this scintillating conversation. 
let me know how it all comes out. See you in the morning. I hope so, Hank. I sincerely hope so. Cut the legs open a little higher. Okay. You just relax, Grant. We'll take care of it. I'm only trying to make it easier for you. When it's time to connect the electrodes or the straps, I don't remember. Got it. Pants, legs, head shaved. I think that's everything. The watch. Take my watch. You don't want it anymore? It's the electricity. It'll melt or fuse or something. He's right. Take it off. Want a uh, cigarette, Grant? I don't smoke. It's bad for my health. <laughs> hey, Screws! You're wasting your time. Shut him up! Shut that guy up! You can't kill Grant. You want to know why? I'll tell you why. Because you're nothing but dreams. Dreams! You hear that, Screws? Bet you didn't know that! Must be a full moon. The animals are restless. Oh, hello, Father. Uh, may I have a moment? Sure thing. Come on, Miller. How are you, my son? Oh, I can't complain. This haircut they gave me, though. Gonna take a while to grow up. Is there anything you wish to talk about in the remaining minutes? No. Then let us pray. There's no need. There is always a need for prayer, my son. What will it do for me? Open your heart. God won't forsake you. Only in the real world, Father. Not in a nightmare. You no longer feel a part of this world? I not only feel it, I know it. You're ready for salvation any time up to your last breath. Well, you can save your breath. I've heard it all before. You know, I am wondering something, though. Of course you are. I wonder where I've seen you before. Where did I get your face? It's familiar every time. It's about to come to me. Well, we've never met. Oh, yes. Yes, we have. Father Beeman, of course, Father Beeman from over at Spring Hill. No wonder I didn't recognize you. That's because you died when I was 10 years old. You were very popular. Everybody came to your funeral. Well, my name is Beeman, but... Um, I'm, yes, uh, yes. And then a young priest came and took your place. That was Carson. You know, I'm using him for the editor this time. Calm your mind, my son. And what about the district attorney, Richie? Richie, he must have been a, a school teacher of mine. Or maybe he was a friend of Dad's. Time, Father. Thank you, Warden. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Ready, Mr. Grant. Are you? Are all of you? Let's go. Hey, Grant! They can't do this to you. You're home in bed asleep, remember? Grant! Grant! Time to wake up, boy! Wake up! Wake up! Four more minutes. Well, you can at least get a stay of execution. I know you can do that much. What good would it do? We'd simply have to go through the same thing all over again. Cruel and unusual punishment. Maybe not. Now look, Hank. Forget all the dream stuff. Whether that's true or not, it doesn't matter. What matters is the guy believes it. That means he's got a case. The psychiatrist said... The psychiatrist made a mistake. 
It won't be the first time. Get a week's stay. Have him checked out again. I can't. Why not? Because we might be wrong. Well, maybe we are. But maybe we're not. And in my book, that's reasonable doubt. Hank, he's sick in the head. Are you going to send a mental incompetent to the chair? I'll regret this, Paul. I'll regret it as long as I live. Hello. This is Henry Ritchie. I want to speak to the governor right away. Seventy-six. Seventy-seven. Seventy-eight. Here we are again. Step on in. Don't fight it. Get the leg straps. I'll do the arms. Please, just get it over with. I don't care. This is an emergency. Wake him up. Hurry. It's 11.58. They're having trouble putting the call through. Yes, this is District Attorney Ritchie. Governor, I don't have time to explain, but I want you to issue a stay of execution in the case of Adam Grant. Here comes the hood. Close your eyes. Not again. Please. Not again. Thank you, Governor. Well? He's calling now. Throw the switch. Yes, ma'am. This is the ward. What did you say? What? I'm sorry, Governor. You're too late. Did he get through? It's out of our hands now. I couldn't sleep. Don't tell me you're still up. See you tomorrow. Yes, you did your best. What in the... What is going on here? How do you mean? Well, I thought we had a fireplace. What did you boys do with it? Do... I'm serious. She's right, Hank. The fireplace... It's gone. That's just a blank wall. Uh, Carol, I don't understand. I... Carol. Carol, where are you? She was standing here a second ago. She just... Paul. Paul! For the love of God, I can't see either of you. In the living room, it's... It's getting dark. It's starting... Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. And what is that verdict? We, we find, find defendant, defendant Adam, Adam Grant guilty of murder, murder in the, in the first, first degree. degree. Order in the court. The defendant will rise. The defendant will rise. Adam. 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 What? Oh, all right. Let's get it over with. Adam Grant, you have been tried by a jury of your peers and found guilty. Do you have anything you wish to say before sentence is passed? Very well. It is the sentence of this court that for, for the, the brutal, brutal and, and despicable, despicable crime of, of murder, murder in the first, first degree, degree, you shall be put to death by means of electrocution. No, not again. You can't make me die again. Restrain the prisoner. Put the leg irons on. No. 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 Can't make me die again. Oh, God, please. 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 Take him away. Yeah, you can't make me die again! Oh, God, please! Please! 
We all know that a dream can seem real, but it's also possible that reality might be a dream. We exist, of course, but how? In what way? As flesh and blood human beings, as we believe, or simply as part of someone else's feverish nightmare? Think about it. And then ask yourself, do you really live here in this country, in this world, or do you exist only in the Twilight Zone? We'll return to the Twilight Zone in just a moment. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop twilightzoneradio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD. Or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. Shadow Play, starring Ernie Hudson with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were Christian Stolte, Nick Sandys, Elizabeth Lido, Roderick Peoples, Doug James, Ken E. Head, Martin Astrop, T.J. Jagodowski, Carl Amari, Tom McElroy, Meg Falcon, Damian Arnold, and Craig Harris. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slabach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website, at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. He ain't here yet. He will be. Almost noon. <laughs> Knows what's waiting for him. Yep. He knows he's gonna get shot. Let's go inside and have a drink. Oh, uh, hi there, fellas. No talk. Just pour. Sure, sure. What'll it be? Right gut whiskey. You're coming right on. You seen McGrew? Marshal McGrew? That's the one. You friends of his? We got a meeting with him. You do? When? Well, let's see. Right about now. Unless he ain't gonna show. Oh, Marshal McGrew will show, all right. Always keeps his word. If Ranch McGrew says he'll be here, then he'll be here. You can bet your bottom dollar on it. That right? In fact, here he is now. Where? Right outside, at the end of the street. Hear him coming? I don't see nothing. 
Oh, he's a-coming, for sure. Take a look. See that uh, cloud of dust? That's him. Right on schedule. Cut! I'm here. I'm here. What's everybody looking at? You're now in 15 minutes late, Rance. So shoot me. I'd like to. On film. We should have had everything in the can by now. Don't bug me, Cy. You know what these big emotional scenes do to me. Now, don't get upset, Rance. We'll try to knock this one out before lunch. What do you say we get started, okay, baby? This is scene 71. Do you have your script with you? Positions, everybody. Quiet, people. Camera ready. This will be a take. Welcome to the American West, Hollywood style. Some 100-odd years ago, a motley collection of tough hombres gunned and galloped their way across the frontier, leaving behind them a raft of legends and ledger domains. But heroes or hambones, they were a rough and woolly breed of nail-eaters, who in matters of the gun were as efficient as they were dedicated. So it seems a reasonable conjecture that if there are any television sets up in cowboy heaven, and if these worthies could see with what careless abandon their names and exploits are bandied about today, they are very likely turning over in their graves. Or worse, busy getting out of them. Which gives you a clue as to the proceedings that will begin in just a moment. Enter one Rance McGrew, an overpaid sports car driving phony baloney who can't distinguish between a holster and a hoof and mouth disease. His claim to fame is that he dispatches these baddies or actors bearing their names, in gunfights, where the fast draw is simply a matter of cutting and the outcome is a setup, complete with blank cartridges and stage blood. But Mr. Rance McGrew is about to discover that this week's edition of Make Believe is being shot not on the usual back lot, but on a peculiarly authentic location, one found only in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Showdown with Rance McGrew, starring Chris McDonald, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Get me a key light on the end of the bar. Coming up. Props, where are the breakaway bottles? Right here. You know the scene, Rance? Read it to me. Interior saloon, cover shot of two bad men at bar. Rance McGrew enters through the swinging doors. He walks slowly to the bar, glancing sideways, left and right. But glancing left and right? That's what the script says. Well, how am I supposed to do that? Is my head on a swivel? I don't know, Rance. I didn't write it. I'm going to tell you something, Cy. When a cowboy enters a bar, he walks to the far end of the room, he gets his drink, he looks at it, then he looks straight ahead and drinks it. He doesn't look left and right. Take it from me. A man lets his eyes roll around his head, he can get himself in a whole lot of trouble. Capiche? All right, Rance. Anything you say, we'll shoot it your way. Now, can we begin? In a minute, in a minute. My stomach's killing me. A scene like this, it gets to me, you know? These miserable emotional scenes, they're, they're draining. Where are my pills? Right here, Rance. Well, don't just stand there. Give me one. Make it two. Water. Yes, sir. All right, boys, if you're set up, this is scene 71. A tracking shot of Rance as he enters the saloon. Let's get with it, everybody. We're way behind. This one's for real, people. Stand in, out. The star's here. Cowboys one and two, positions. Outside the door, Rance. I got it. I got it. Where's wardrobe? Yes? Do something about my shoulder pads. More, more on the left side. Let me just open your vest. Holster. Right here? An inch lower. No problem. Now, my gun. Here you go. It should be right where my fingers hang. A real gunfighter had to get his gun out fast. Did you know I took lessons from the national fast draw champion? Did you? Oh, you don't believe me? Ready when you are, Rance. Watch this. You hook it with your fingertips, like so. You bring it up in an arc. Careful, sir. Give it a little twirl. <laughs> Whoops. Rance, what are you doing? What's wrong with this holster? It's got oil on it. Replace the mirror behind the bar. I'll have to wait for the new glass. I told you, Cy, never, ever rush me. Okay? I'm a perfectionist. Wasn't like this in the Old West. What wasn't? In the old days, they made sure. They had to. Men's lives depended on it. 
You can't hurry justice, Cy. All right, everybody. Lunch! Ready? Ready. Rolling. Rolling. Roll sound. Roll sound. And... Action. Cue Rance. Hello there, Marshal. Barkeep. What'll it be? Rotgut whiskey. Yes, sir. Give me the bottle. Sure, Marshal. Whatever you say. Cut! Oh. No, no, don't look at me. It wasn't my fault. Look at here. Hey, buddy boy. Yeah? You try to gag it up one more time, you'll wind up plucking chickens at the farmer's market. It was an accident, Rance. Was it? He put English on it. He deliberately made it curve before it got to me. English on a bottle? The guy needs a catches me. What'd you say? Nothing, Rance. He didn't say a thing. How much longer? These boots are killing me. Here's a new bottle. Let's try it again. From the bottle. Positions, please. Positions! Scene 71, again. And... rolling. Sure, Marshal. Whatever you say. Now hold on. That there's a new bottle. You want I should open it for you? I can do it. The old day. Here's a glass for you. Don't need one. You see that? He don't even use a glass. He's some tough hombre. I guess you boys know that... <clears throat> I guess you boys know I'm the marshal here. We heard tell. Sure did. Then I guess you know that I know that Jesse James is due here any minute now, aiming to call on me. I know that too. Likewise. Well, what do you know? I figured he was too yellow. But it sounds like Jesse's here. A marshal, marshal, please. No killing inside. Easy, barkeep. I ain't gonna kill him none. I'm just gonna maim him a little bit. Pick off his pinky, maybe, with a clean shot. <laughs> Jesse won't take kindly to that. <laughs> he sure won't. Well, well. Marshal McGrew, ain't it? Yep. We'll take a nice, deep breath, Marshal. Why's that, Jesse? Cause it'll be your last. Oh! You shot a clean out of my hand! <sighs> I didn't. That was a sound effect. I can't get my blasted gun out of the miserable holster! Cut! Take it easy, Rance. I thought somebody oiled this holster. I wiped it down. It's too dry. We'll do an insert later. See? I can't even get it. Oh, look out. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Bring another mirror. This, this is absurd, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, really. I mean, first the gun, then the bottle, <laughs> then the gun a second time. I'm <laughs> you, you just can't appreciate the delicious absurdity of it. I drive all the way in from the beach just to shoot a few lousy scenes in my new car, my own car, mind you, and look what happens. I mean, I studied with Sandy Meisner, okay? I played Pinter, Albie, Beckett, and now... Can, can you people do anything right? I ask you, is that too much? Would you like to sit down, Rance? Why do I bother? Week after week, why? I give, and I give, and I give. For what? Let's go to the fight scene. Jesse and Rance. First, Jesse knocks him through a table. Cue the player piano tape. Stunt double. Somebody get the tables. How do you feel now? What do you mean, how do I feel? I'm sorry, Andy. It's not your fault. But these oaths out there, they they wouldn't know a real line from a from a cereal commercial. Hand me my uh, throat spray. The antibiotic one or the one for the allergies? I don't care, just give it to me. Cut! Print it! I think they're ready for your close-up, Rance. All right, Angie. Don't you think I know that? I'm the only professional around here. Did you double for me in that scene? Yes, sir. Looking good. Thanks. I tried to do it just like you would. I like the bruises. Nice makeup. It's not makeup. Okay, boys. This is the death scene. Rance in the bar, Jesse lying over there. Rance thinks he's unconscious. Jesse picks up a gun off the floor and fires at Rance's back. What? 
At his back? That's correct. Hey, I, I don't want to give you a hard time, Cy, but... Well, you got a problem with that? But that's not the way Jesse James used to operate. Well, he does in this script, okay? What I mean is, everything I've read about the guy, I mean, he fought pretty fair and square. Why can't I just yell something, you know, before I pull the trigger? Whoa, that's thinking. Warn the fastest gun in the West that he's about to get shot at. Look, buddy boy, you happen to be up against Rance McGrew. And when you're up against the best, you're going to play it dirty or you're going to play it dead. Now quit arguing and let's get to it. Ready at the bar, Rance. Your marks by the brass rail. Here's the bottle. Ho hold it. I told you ginger ale. This is cola. It's supposed to look like whiskey, though, Mr. McGrew. Sigh. Would you either fire this clown or straighten him out? One or the other? Mr. McGrew wants ginger ale. Yes, sir, Mr. McGrew. Jesse, lie down on the X. I don't care what he says. Jesse James wouldn't shoot anybody in the back. Yeah, but Rance McGrew would. Rance McGrew would also fire his own grandmother. So do me a favor. Play it his way, or we'll never get this episode finished. You're the boss. But I can just see the real Jesse James turning over in his grave right now. I don't mean just once. I mean about 400 revolutions per minute. All right, let's get with it. Scene 93, take one. Quiet, everyone. Camera. Roll sound. And action. Here's your bottle, Marshal. <coughs> oh, you stupid clod. <coughs> That's whiskey. That's real whiskey. It sure is. The best we got. Something wrong, Marshal? Well, this sure is. Wait a minute. Where's the camera? And the lights? Where are the lights? You! The, you there! Answer me! You talking to me? I think he's talking to you. Well, now, speak up, Marshal. I didn't hear you. You say something or not. You know exactly what I said. Don't play dumb. Will somebody please tell me what happened to the microphone and the wall? Where, where did this other wall come from? Where's the back of the set? Marshal, Jess is gunning for you. It's coming right now. Hey, Cementhead, he was already here in scene 73, okay? Boy, wait, my agent hears about this one. Let me out of here. This is degenerated into some third-rate low-budget B picture. Can't say I didn't warn you. Wait, wait, wait. Who's this supposed to be? They call me Jesse. Jesse James. No, you're not. You're a different actor. What are you, a last-minute replacement? And where'd you get those clothes? Good lordy property. Oh, this man stinks to I'm the real Jesse James. Not that side of pork that's been play-acting me. What do you think you're doing? Take your hands off. Sit down and put a cork in it. I'll ask the questions around here. Bartender. Yeah, yeah, yes, Mr. James. Bring me a bottle of rye. And wind up that player piano in the corner. I like a little music with my drinking. Yes, sir. Right away, sir. Turn the volume down. Cut. Shouldn't we cut? Cut already! Will somebody please tell me what is going on? Don't you hear good, mister? No habla inglés. Sure you don't. Well, habla this. See? Si. I'd be looking for the marshal. No, no es aquí. No? No, señor. Fellow named McGrew. Rance McGrew. So? You know him? See? Si. He here? Come see, si, come sa. Come what? Sai! Sai? See. Si. Who's Sai? The director. Get me out of here! Where are you going? That away. You wouldn't be McGrew now, would you? Not a chance. Hmm. Then what's this badge doing pinned to your chest? Well, well where's the fellow who loaned me this vest? I think you and me. We better have a little talk, Marshal. Talk? Maybe a long talk, maybe a short talk, but a talk just the same. Okay. You're supposed to be a tough hombre, but he don't look very tough. No? Know what you look like? I couldn't venture a guess. You look like 
A marshmallow. A marsh... I do. Don't that rile you none? No, not, not much. Why not? I, uh, haven't been myself lately. It's these allergies. Come on. First we'll have a drink, and then we'll talk. Then we'll have a showdown. A, uh, a showdown? Where's that bottle? Right here, Mr. James. I gotta see this. Yeah, see what? H how you break the neck off without wrecking the whole bottle? Oh, that's just in the movies. Might get broken glass in it. Don't want to ruin good whiskey. Ah. Here. Your turn. Uh, no, thank you. No? Just a ginger ale, please. Uh, marshmallow. Well, see, I'm on the wagon. It's to my contract. Have a smoke. I gave that up, too. I'll roll one for you. Uh, can't. Union rules. Rules, huh? Yeah, it's the law now. Show you what I think of the law. Of course, you know how to do this, don't you? Roll your own, I mean. Actually, I, I never could get it right. You know, that string on the little pouch? It always gets caught in my teeth. <sighs> <coughs> Would you mind not blowing smoke in my face? That rile you, does it? Not, not really. It's just that it's, it's not good for my voice. Nothing riles you. You're just about the most even-tempered dude I ever did meet. However, I ain't got no more time to be sociable, Marshal. I'd say it's past time we came to a meeting of the minds. Oh, cousin, boys. What's everybody hiding for? Think about it, Marshal. Why do you suppose? Because the place is closing? That must be it. Yeah, Curfew time, huh? Well, I'll just mosey on home. Nice meeting you, Jesse. Uh, <laughs> Mr. James. Whoa, just stop right there. You wasn't leaving, was you, Marshal? I mean, you wasn't just gonna up and walk out on me, was you? Me? No, not, no, I was just wondering whether it was gonna rain. You know, just looks like it's not, though. Oh, nope. not today. Have a seat. Okay. As long as this doesn't take too long, I gotta meet with my agent after we wrap. <laughs> you know what I thought, Marshal? I thought you was gonna play some kind of trick on me. Me? Why would I do a thing like that? Remember the time that bad guy had you covered from behind? And you started out the swinging doors, and you swung one door back and knocked the gun out of his hand? Uh, that, that was the opening show last season. Or how about when that rustling gang was waiting in here to bushwhack you? Ten or eleven of them. Thirteen. I was I was up for an Emmy for that one. That was where you shot from the hip and brung down the chandelier. I gotta hand it to you. Some shooting, Marshal. I did better next week. Horse thief named McNasty shot a glass out of his hand, bullet ricocheted, and hit his partner out there on the porch. Got thirteen hundred pieces of mail on that one. I bet you did. I just bet you did. Why folks couldn't help admiring a man of your talents. <laughs> Think of it is, Marshal. Think of it is. I don't reckon you ever fired a real gun in your life, did you? Well, uh, not as such. I hit a man in anger. Or maybe even got hit in anger yourself. Tell me the truth, Marshal. You ever ride a horse? Oh, yeah, on occasion. A real horse? Well, see, I happen to be allergic. Hives. Hives? Yeah, you know, a, a, a rash. Cats give it to me, too. So you don't ride, you don't shoot, you don't bite. You just strut around wearing a phony badge and going through the motions of killing off fellas like me. There was an episode when we let one of the Dalton boys off. It kind of, uh, kind of a complicated plot. It, it seems he had a kid sister going to school in the east and she came out to visit him on the day he was supposed to be hanged she made an appeal to me and I saw to it that he got a suspended sentence mm -hmm. he told me about it he he did he also told me how you captured him jumped 800 feet off a cliff and landed on the back of his horse when he wasn't looking stuntman heights uh <clears throat> they, they bother me that figures so you see, Marshal, we had this meeting up there. Uh, up up there? And all of us decided, my brother, me, 
the Dalton boys, Sam Starr, Billy the Kid, quite a few of us. And the consensus was, Marshall, was that you wasn't doing a thing for our good names. Well, see, you have to understand, I don't write these scripts. I mean, I do have input at the development stage, but... We had a little election up there, and they chose me to come down and maybe take a little shine off your pants. <laughs> How's that? Don't you get it? We see you week after week shooting down this fella, shooting down that fella, capturing a bushwhacker, bringing in a rustler, but all the time winning. Man, you just don't never lose. You're the winningest fella ever come down the pike, and that's for sure. So me and my friends, well, we figured how's about time that maybe you should lose once. Well, that That's not such a bad idea. I, I could take it up with the producer at our next meeting. I don't think there's time for that. I think that maybe if you're going to lose, you're going to have to lose right now. Now? But I'll tell you what I'm going to do, Marshal. I'm going to play it square with you. A whole lot square than you ever played it with us. Face to face and no, what do you call them? Stunt man. Could, could you be a little more um, precise about the terms? Right out there, on the main street, you and me. Oh, I think there's been a misunderstanding. See, I'm not really Marshall McGrew. That's my name, yes, but it's a part I play. Right outside, me coming down one side of the street, you coming down the other. Just the two of us. But but I've done that before. Uh, did you happen to see gunfight at Red Rock? Yeah. Then then you know. It was lousy. Two thumbs down. Way down. After you, Marshal. You can come out now, boys. Looks like they ain't gonna shoot up the place after all. Drinks on the house. We take 20 paces each. You come around that corner. Uh, which one? By the general store. I'll come around that one over there. Then what? I'll let you make the first move. Nothing could be fairer than that, could it, Marshal? Fair? Uh, oh my. No, no, uh, no indeed. Nothing at all. Um, that, that I can think of unless... What? Could we make it tomorrow afternoon? Your girl can call my girl and... This afternoon. Now. You mean now? As in right now? Or in the general sense, as opposed to the past, let's say, or the future, or... Too much, John. Let's go. Stuntman? Oh, stuntman. Fourteen, fifteen, sixteen... Better check all my bullets. But the blanks. All blanks. What am I supposed to do? Ready, Marshal? I'm coming for you. All right, here goes nothing. Talk about method acting. Go ahead, Marshal. Make your move. This is ridiculous. I'm gonna count to three. Wait, why not five? Or, or, or ten? One. It never happens this way. Make up! I got sweat in my eyes. Two. I didn't even want to be in this series. I wouldn't have signed up for it at all if it hadn't been for the residuals. God, that and the fact that they let me use my own name in the title. Brands McGrew, Frontier Marshal. Had a nice ring to it, I thought. Three. Slap leather. Props, would you fix this holster? Reach for the sky. Okay, okay. There's my gun, see? <laughs> you win. Just like I figured. This guy couldn't outdraw a crayon. Jesse, give me a break. Will you give me a break, Jesse? I'm too young to die. Think of all the guest spots I could do after the series. Not to mention the syndicated reruns. You say you got nominated for an Emmy? Twice! Man, you can't act any better than you can draw. What about it? I'll do anything. I, I mean it. I'll, you name it. I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'll... I'll just give me a break this one time. Anything? Anything. Say it. Marshal, you know something? 
You and me, maybe we ain't such a long ways off from a bargain after all. What, what is it you want? Well, sir, I ain't exactly sure what it is I want. But I'll think about it, son. You will? You mean you're not gonna shoot me down like a dog? Like a cur? Like an empty beer bottle? Like an old tin can set on the fence post of life? On a lonesome road somewhere? A road less traveled, you might say? Nope. But I'll tell you what I will do. If you stop talking like a school mom. What's that? I'll see to it that you play it mighty careful from now on. Done? You gotta play it straight. No more of this Hollywood junk. You got it. We may be stiffs up there, but we're awful sensitive. We'll be watching you, Marshal. Jesse? Jesse? Where'd you go? Where do I send the deal memo? Here you go. What? It isn't whiskey this time, Mr. McGrew. It's ginger ale like you ordered. Okay, people. This is a take. Quiet, please. Where do all these people come from? And the lights. The camera. You all right, Rance? Yeah. Yeah, I'm all right, but... Where'd you all go? Where do we go? <laughs> Rance is such a kidder. We didn't go anywhere. Are you sure you're all right? You look a little pale. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm fine. Make up. Touch up Mr. McGrew, please, so we can get the shot. The shot? Jesse's on the floor. What's he doing there? You knocked him down, remember? Or rather, your stunt double did. Chair and the table. How much longer? This floor is really uncomfortable. Just a few more seconds. But that's not Jesse. Not the real Jesse. Rance, please. After this one, we'll call it a day. Now, you think he's unconscious, but he tries to get you in the back. Before he can shoot, you fall to the floor, roll, turn over with your gun in your hand, fire, and let him have it while you're still on your belly. Got it? That's what was in the script. Of course it is. Now, do you think you can do that? Somebody wants to talk to you, Mr. McGrew. Can it wait? Tell him Rance is about to shoot a scene. He says he's Rance's new agent. My agent? My agent hasn't come to see me in years. Driving a big convertible with cowhide seats, steer horns on the hood. Like he's some kind of Texas rancher or something. A new agent, Rance? Look, I don't know what your chain of command is nowadays, but go out there and talk to him if you have to. Find out what it is he wants and what it is you want and what it is so we can shoot. Uh, sure thing, Cy. Si. I'll do that. Howdy, Marshal. Jesse. Deal's a deal. You said anything. I like the red blazer. Houndstooth, isn't it? That what they call it? You don't know about the yellow slacks, though, and the beret. <laughs> I think you've been watching too many old movies. Be that as it may. Have a cigar. I don't smoke. That's right, I remember. No offense. Well, now, to get to the point, anything is the following. Let's keep it simple. I'm just going to stick around from show to show and make sure you don't hurt no more feelings. Such as? Take this here scene. Change it so as the other Jesse don't fire at your back. That would be real cowardly. Say he's lost a lot of blood and he's weak as a T. But somewhere or the other he gets up on his feet. Then he knocks you through the window and makes his getaway. Got it? Knocks me through the window? Rance McGrew? Understood. Yes, sir. Understood. No stunt double? Jesse does what? Scene 93, take two. Places. Lights. Roll sound. And action. <laughs> Cut! <laughs> that was a good one. Yeah. <laughs> Glad you liked it. Now, I was reading next week's episode, Marshal. The one where you knock a gun out of Billy the Kid's hand from a fourth-story window a block away, using the base of a lamp. Well, the network wants to keep the gunplay down. Too much violence. No good? Piece of crap. The way I see it, Billy hears you. Whirls around, shoots from the hip, and knocks the lamp out of your hand. How's that sound? Fine. 
fine. Now, looking ahead two weeks, I think we ought to give Sam Starr a break. He's a nice fellow. Awful good to his mother. The evolution of the so-called adult western and the metamorphosis of one Rance McGrew, former phony baloney, now upright citizen and defender of truth, dedicated to all things involving tradition and the history of cowboy lore. It's the way the cookie crumbles and the six-gun shoots in the Twilight Zone. <laughs> Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Showdown with Rance McGrew, starring Chris McDonald with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Mike Starr, Frenette Lebo, Doug James, Kurt Navig, Rich Komenik, Sean Cross, Steve Key, Jeff Lupiton, Carl Amari, Roger Walski, and Vince Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. So, it's goodbye again. Yes. We should be used to goodbyes by now. You'd think, wouldn't you? You know, I used to think when I was a little boy back in America... You used to think what, Tony? Well, it doesn't matter. Of course it does. I love to hear you talk about when you were a little boy. But you know something funny? I'm... well, I'm jealous. Jealous? Jealous of what? I'm jealous of those years. I'm jealous that you grew up and I didn't get to know you because we hadn't met so many years. And I think now, what a waste that we didn't know one another then. We had time once, didn't we? All the time we needed, but not now. Now there is no time, Tony. Now there is only time for goodbyes, 
Now people fly by so fast, you want to call out to them. And then it's too late. They've gone. They've disappeared. It's time to take off, Lieutenant. The Luftwaffe is coming. I'm on my way. But, sir, the troops are moving out. Thank you, Private. Oh, my darling. Tony, Tony sweetheart. sweetheart. Now, now you, must go. you must go. I know. Don't cry. Shh. No time for tears. I, I am have a memory of you, of you for, for my, my eyes. eyes. And a thought, thought of, of you, you to hold in my mind. for my mind. As do I. And I a touch of you. For all of me. Oh, my darling. I won't forget you. Not, Not forever, forever and a day. And a day. Oh, Jerry. Jerry, where are you now? Where? Picture of a woman looking at a picture. Her features alive to everything that appears on the screen. Her lips move and her eyes flash, mirroring every expression, every emotion. The features are exquisite, beautifully chiseled and proportioned. And even in the flickering light, she is easy to recognize. Like the face on the screen, this is Barbara Jean Trenton, movie grade of another era. Once brilliant star in a firmament no longer a part of the sky, eclipsed by the movement of the earth and time. Barbara Jean Trenton, whose world has become a projection room in her home, whose dreams are made of celluloid, struck down by hit-and-run years and lying on the pavement, trying desperately to get the license number of fleeting fame, somewhere on a side street in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The 16mm Shrine, starring Kathy Garver with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Miss Trenton? Miss Trenton? Miss... What is it, Sally? Oh, I didn't see you standing there. It's so dark in this room. Would you like me to open the drape? No, thank you. What is it that you want? I brought you your... I brought you a snack, Miss Trenton. You always used to have a snack this time of day. Just put it down on the table. Yes, miss. If you don't mind my saying so, you really should have something to eat. I do mind. That will be all, Sally. Yes, Miss Trenton. I'll be going now. You do that. Will you be wanting lunch this afternoon? I'll be glad to make you a I'll nice... I'll let you know. Very well, miss. Mr. Weiss. How are you, Sally? Perfectly fine. In the den, is she? Yes, sir. Mr. Weiss. Yes? I'm worried about her. I'm worried that... Well, you see... I'll see how she's doing. But you don't understand, Mr. Weiss. It's getting worse, much worse. I go in there and... And? There have been times when I've gone in and I could almost swear that... What could you swear to, Sally? That sometimes she... Well, she's not in the room at all. She's up on the screen. But she is, isn't she? I, you know, those old films she's watching are her films, right? I do, yes. But I take your point. She's been in there too much, and it's disturbing you. That's, that's perfectly understandable. I tell you what, let me talk to her. Would you? Yeah, just give me a minute. Of course, sir. Barb! Fix yourself a drink, Danny. <laughs> it's 11 o'clock in the morning. So, it's 11 o'clock in the morning. What about it? It's 11 in the morning and the sun is out, see? Oh, why did you have to do that? 
It's a beautiful day in Beverly Hills. There's no smog, it's 84 degrees, and it's lovely out there. What would I do without your daily meteorological reports? And the question is, what do you do with them? You sit here in this, this air-conditioned cave, showing one picture after another. <laughs> Why? Haven't you seen them enough times? Let's skip that. Barbie. No good, honey. What isn't? None of this is any good. If you won't fix yourself a drink, then sit down and be quiet. You have a habit of looking poised, ready to spring. What was the picture? Two of them. Farewell without tears. Now, let's see. 26 years ago, co-starring Jerry Herndon. Of course, co-starring Jerry. He was my favorite leading man. And then... A night in Paris. 25 years ago. I know it was 25 years. Are you father time now? Barbie. Danny, should I have failed to make mention of this before? I hate clinical tiptoeing. If you don't like what I do, don't knock it. I have to knock what you do. And I have to get clinical when I see you enclose yourself in this room and stop the clock. You said things back 15, 20, 25 years. You turn your back on today, and you do this every day. Let me tell you something, honey. That's sick. It's... That's real sick. Is that all? No. It isn't all. I got some news to deliver. What now? I set up an appointment for you over at International. You did? At International? Mm-hmm. When? Today. A heart... Sounds like a good one. Is uh, Marty Saul still running the studio? Sure is. Mm, too bad. I never got along with Marty. Yeah, I remember. Uh, but he's older now. I, I think you'll find he's mellowed. He said I was the most temperamental star he'd ever worked with. Now, why would he say a thing like that? Danny, you know something. You're a nice guy. A very nice guy. A loyal friend and a good agent after all. I guess in my own devious, selfish way, I happen to be very much in love with you. Wait, wait, wait. Calm down now, Barbie. Oh, I hope it's a musical. I'd love to dance again. Or a juicy, romantic role, like the scenes I watched this morning with Jerry Herndon. See his photograph here? Yes, yes, I see it. I did three pictures with him. I know. Oh, mon capitaine. Tell me about your country of America. A night in Paris, remember? Jerry was a young American lieutenant. I was Claudette, the little French girl. Age 19. Go to the devil, Danny. Barbara Jean, it's a beautiful day today. The sun is shining, and it's a brand new world. A new world, get it? It's 25 years away from a night in Paris and 26 years away from a farewell without tears. This room is dark and cold and full of cobwebs. Now get up and go outside, honey. You'll be surprised at what you see. Huh? Pleasantly surprised, I promise. And don't you dare let me catch you looking no photographs on the wall anymore or in the mirror either. Now, I'll meet you in Saul's office at 3 o'clock. Do we understand each other? We do. Good. In fact, it's more than good. <laughs> it's absolutely, positively great. Danny? Yeah? Thank you. Yeah, well, don't thank me yet. Just be there. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Am I still the fairest of them all? Yeah. Mr. Weiss, sir, and Miss Trenton? Sign them in. Marty, there you are. Mm. Good to see you, Barbara. You're looking... Uh... What, Marty? Spectacular? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Don't be afraid to say it. Any woman appreciates a compliment, as long as it's sincere. New dress, huh? 
New hat, flowers even, veil, the whole schmear. You going somewhere? Why no, Marty. It's all for you. I believe you know my agent, Mr. Weiss. Yeah, yeah. How you doing, Danny? Fine. And yourself? Sit down, please. My, you've redone your office. Did he tell you about the part? Uh, not exactly. I think it fits you. It's not big, but it'll be a nice showcase. How big and how much of a showcase? I meant to tell you, Barbara, it's, uh, it's not the lead, more like a, a special cameo appearance. Oh, very special. Surely Danny's told you what my requirements are. Mm-hmm. Why is it, Barbara, you and I always get off on the wrong foot? And what foot is that? The one in your mouth? Oh, excuse me, that's a cigar. Still smoking those nasty things, I see. We always seem to fight. Doesn't that always seem to be the case? We begin by fighting. I'm still waiting to hear about the part, Marty. Raise the veil. What? On your hat. Go ahead. That's it. Uh-huh. Perfect. What do you mean? You play a mother. How old a mother? No, that's not the point, Barbara. Forty-ish, but very vibrant, very alive. As opposed to what? A corpse? I don't play mothers, Mr. Saul. I never have, and I'm not about to start now. I also don't take bit roles, even if you call them cameos. You should know that. You'll forgive me, my dear, but I didn't realize you were still so particular. Well, now you do. At least I would think you'd look at the part. That would be a waste of my time. Look, I think we could at least take the script home with us, Barbie. You take the script home with you, and you play it. I didn't like this crude, tasteless man when I was under contract to him, and I don't like him anymore now. And especially when he offers me a fast walk-on. And you, Miss... Miss Prima Donna. You... I got news for you. You may think you're still the number one lady on top of the heap, but you got it wrong. You're just an aging broad with a scrapbook. And any part you get at this studio won't have to go through an agent. You can set it up with a community chest, because it'll be charity. Barbara, wait. <sighs> Remind me someday, Saul. Remind me when you've gone over the hill and you're down on your hands and knees. Remind me to give you a swift kick just so you'll know how it feels oh miss trenton and mr weiss i didn't expect you back so soon that will be all sally yes miss you'll excuse me danny i'm going upstairs to rest don't you think we have a couple of things to talk about? Not now. I'm feeling tired. Barbie! What? You're right about him, Barbie. He's a tasteless man. He's got a mean temper and a dirty little mouth. You shouldn't pay any attention to him. Are you talking about Saul? Saul doesn't exist. That studio doesn't exist. Not anymore. Not the way it is now. Exactly. There are other studios. I'm talking about all of them. This is the world, Dan, right here. From now on, I keep the doors locked with drapes over the windows. I don't want any of the outside coming in. Not the Marty Sauls or the movies without sentiment or, or those teenaged actors on television or rap music or any of it. Barbie, whether you like it or not, that's the way it is. That's the way things are. What can you do, Barb? Shut your eyes? Say it doesn't exist because you can't see it? It doesn't have to exist. If I shut my eyes, it disappears. Yes, it does. I can wish it away. But that doesn't make sense. It makes sense to me. Perfect sense. And you know what else makes sense? As of right now, as of this minute, this is the old Hollywood, with all the charm and romance, with all the glamour. It's a carefree world again, Danny, just like before, in this house. Barbie, none of that's true. It's nostalgic and nice, but it's not true. Are you listening to me? It's phony. Well, if I wish hard enough, it won't be phony. If I wish hard enough, Danny. Barbara, please. I'll give a party. Yes, 
Tell all of my friends, Danny. Tell them. Tell Paul Nader and Jerry Herndon and Steve Black. Oh, now there's a man for you. Tell them I'm still at the same address and tell... Barbie! Paul Nader's been dead for five years. Jerry Herndon lives in Chicago. Steve Black hasn't been around for, for 15 years. And if I could get to them, if I could, what kind of party can I invite them to here? Barbie, Barbie, this is a graveyard you're creating, a mausoleum. Understand? You're wishing for things that are dead. We'll see about that. about that. Mr. Mozart, please. Uh, tell him it's Danny Weiss. Hey, Walt. Long time, huh? No, no, no. I, uh, I didn't go to the awards. Uh, congratulations, by the way. Heck of a picture. Yeah. Say, listen, Walt. Uh, I got an idea, and I wanted to run it by you first, but before I shop it around... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, nobody. Nobody yet. Well, you know the actor who just won for Best Supporting? Uh-huh. Well, about time is right. Yeah, he's all over the talk shows, giving interviews left and right. <laughs> no, no, I don't represent him. But he's been in this business a long time, you know, started as a teenager. I know, at your studio. That's, that's why I'm calling. See, here's what I think's gonna happen. A brand new interest in the greats of our industry who made it what it is today. You know, I can I can see it coming. Not not nostalgia exactly, but a a wave of appreciation, reevaluation. So so I was I was thinking, why not put together a special project just for them? Hmm? The ones who've been out of the limelight a few years. Stars who, who never got an Oscar but deserve to. Yeah, I tell you, the media, the media will lap it up. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I don't have a, a script yet. Uh-huh. Yeah, I suppose so. I'm, oh, I'm a sci-fi fan, too. Mm, sure, sure I am. Yeah, so it makes... Mm-hmm. So make it like Star Wars meets, um... Oh, I don't know, on Golden Pond or something. I'm, I'm just riffing now, but... Really? You never saw it? Oh, great flick. Eben Fonda. No, Henry. Yeah. Yeah, a whole generation that... Well, they, they would if you set it up right. The what? Oh, oh. A series of pictures, huh? Uh-huh, based on... On video games, yeah, I see. Well, of, of course they have to be young. Still, when you when you think what a great name could bring to the package, well, well, Barbara Jean Trenton for one. No, she's not dead. No, I assure you. A highlights reel. Ah, uh, yeah, I don't think she'd mind. Sure, sure, I understand. Well, give me a call when you get back in town, huh? Yeah, yeah, while well, looking for it. <laughs> All right, take care now. Yeah, you too. Hello, Mr. Weiss. Hello, Billy. Once again, huh? Park it nearby, would you? It won't be long. Yes, sir. Ah, 
Good afternoon, Mr. Weiss. Table for two? Not today, Jimmy. I, uh, I don't need it, after all. Very good. I'll get your waiter. I don't have much of an appetite. Just, uh, just the bar. Of course. Hey, hi there, Mr. Weiss. Where's, uh... No, where's who, Rich? Well, <laughs> you'll excuse me saying so, but uh, the place has been buzzing. I heard you're bringing Barbara Jean Trenton for lunch. Some kind of a uh, celebration. Ah, oh, well, there's, uh, there's been a change of plans. Oh, well, <clears throat> the reason I mention it is <laughs> I was going to ask her for an autograph. You think she'd have minded? I'll bring you an autographed 8x10. How's that? Would ya? Oh, that'd be great. Just a scotch and water for now, Rich. Coming up. Make it a double, will you? Sure, no problem. Mr. Herndon, telephone call for Mr. Herndon. Mr. Herndon? Telephone call for Mr. Herndon. Oh, hold on. Did, did you say Herndon? Why, yes, sir. Well, <laughs> that wouldn't be... No, forget it. Pardon? Why, it's... It's, it's not for a, a Jerry Herndon, by any chance. I wouldn't know, sir. Well, I was just wondering. Jerry Herndon. Hmm, sounds familiar. Didn't he used to be in the movies, too? Sure did. A long time ago. Telephone for Mr. Herndon. Right here, son. Jerry? Then you can take it at the bar, sir. Thanks. Oh, and uh, this is for your trouble. Thank you. <laughs> I'd know that voice anyway. I, uh, I don't believe I've... Danny? Danny Weiss? What in the world are you... I just stopped in for a drink. Oh, same here. Couldn't forget this place like old times. Old times is right. What are you up to these days? Oh, still in the business. What else do I know how to do? <laughs> Listen, can I buy you a drink? Uh-uh. I'll buy you one. <laughs> Come on, sit down. Talk about a coincidence. I was just mentioning you to someone. Pull up a chair. Uh, you'd better take that call. Forget it. They'll call back. We've got a lot of catching up to do. Listen, Jerry, there's something I want to talk to you about. Oh, who's there? Only me, miss. What have you done? Very sorry, miss. I didn't see you sitting there. I must have tripped on the electrical cord. Shall I plug it back in? Thank you, no. I'll take care of it, Sally. And Sally. Yes, miss? I'm locking the door to this room. I don't want to see anyone. I understand, miss. Sorry. Yes? It's Mr. Weiss. Oh, Mr. Weiss. Can I come in? Yes, sir. Miss Trandon? In there. How is she? I wish I could tell you, Mr. Weiss, but I hardly see her anymore. Sometimes her bed's not even slept in. What are you talking about? She's in that room all the time, day and night. And a couple of times when I've gone in, I tell you, Mr. Weiss... Don't think I'm going out of my mind or anything. But I swear to you, I can't see her. Only her picture up on the screen. Well, none of that matters now. There'll be a gentleman over here in a little while. A Mr. Herndon. Jerry Herndon? The one who played opposite Miss Trenton? That's the one. He's in town on a business trip. I, I thought it might do her good. Take him into the den, will you, Sally, when he gets here? I will, but it won't do any good. She won't see him. I wouldn't be too sure. She won't. She doesn't talk to anyone, not even the phone. Just stays in that room looking at her old movies, running them over and over. I'm worried about her, Mr. Weiss. You don't know how worried. I'll go in and talk to her. Now, Mr. Herndon should be here any minute. Go away, Sally. I said, go away. 
I don't want anything, and I don't want to see anyone. Barbie, it's me, Danny. Now, please let me in. Why should I? Please, Barbie, I, I got something to tell you. There. Are you satisfied? Barbie? What's the matter, Danny? Don't care for the merchandise? Looking a little worn? The merchandise is beautiful, as always. But it looks tired. Looks as if it hasn't slept in days. It needs some air and sun. Outdoors, on the tennis courts, or I'll buy that pool you never use. I have everything I need in here. I'm quite satisfied, thank you. Hail and farewell, Daniel. The door's the one you used when you came in? I have some good news. Oh, do you? What is it? Has my house been declared an historic monument? A friend's coming to see you. A friend? All my friends are dead, retired, or forgotten. You told me that yourself, in no uncertain terms. Oh, this one's very much alive, and he'd love to see you. Tell him I'm not receiving. It's Jerry Herndon. Jerry? Dan, you don't mean it. I do. <gasps> Where is he? What's happened to him? Nothing's happened to him, I promise you. You'll see for yourself. When? Any time now. I happened to run into him. I swear, by pure chance, he asked about you, wanted to know if he could see you. I took the liberty. Oh, you're such a dear. You've done well, Danny, very well. Oh, by the way I look, I no makeup and these clothes. When's he coming? I have to dress. I think he'll like you just fine if you're wearing sackcloth. But if it makes you feel better, go ahead. Stall for me. I need at least a few minutes. Oh, show him to the living room. Oh, Jerry. Jerry, after all this time. How is she? Really? I, I'm so sorry I haven't kept in touch. Ah, she's still Barbara. Same zest for life, same charm. Why, we just had a meeting at the old studio. Yeah, the day I ran into you, matter of fact. Well, not that same terrible head of production, I hope. Yep, Marty Saul, in the flesh. He's running the whole place now. And he hasn't changed one bit. Same chip on his shoulder. No kidding. Jerry, truth is, she's not well. Nothing serious, I hope. Now, she'll pull out of it, I'm sure, but make a fuss over her, if you would. Tell her, tell her how wonderful she looks. It would mean a great deal to her, Jerry, and you can help, and, and that's something she needs right now. Well, sure, Dan. I'll, I'll do my best. Danny? Yeah, in here, Barbie. I heard you'd invited someone for a visit. Let me guess. Could it be... Hello, Barbara Jean. Who's... Jerry? Oh, no, but this can't be Jerry. Are you playing a trick on me again, Danny? Is that it? <sighs> Been a long time, huh? <laughs> a lot of water over the dam. Oh. Oh, well. Yes. Jerry's just in town for a few days uh, on business. I see. You're looking downright lovely, if I do say so. Isn't it odd the way we picture people as they were, never as they are? You haven't changed, Barbara Jean. Hardly at all. <laughs> I, I thought you'd be here on a white horse, or... In an officer's uniform. Why isn't that silly of me? I thought you'd be as I remembered you, Jerry. A young man. I was. Twenty, thirty years ago. And do you know I had a crazy idea? That we might even do a picture together again. <laughs> not much chance of that. He's not an actor anymore. No, I gave that up a long time ago. Went down the drain, along with my youth. You don't act anymore? What do you do? <laughs> it's not so bad. I run a chain of supermarkets outside of Chicago. A chain of supermarkets? In Chicago? I'm doing really well, in fact. More than I ever made in the picture business. You're joking. No, you're not. You're not joking at all. Barbie. See this photograph? This is the one I expected. This is the one I wanted to come see me. With that darling little mustache. <laughs> well, uh, I've still got one, only it's gone white like the rest of my hair. <laughs> so you have. 
But you're not the one in the photograph, are you? He's dead. He's dead, like all the others. Barbie, honey. Go away, please. Both of you. Will you just go away? It, it was very nice to see you. Goodbye, Barbara. Goodbye, my dear. Take good care. Jerry. There you are, Jerry. How well you look. How young. How wonderfully young. There was an old man here a while ago. A tired, worn-out old man. And he said he was you. Can you believe it? Oh, Jerry. Jerry, I wish I could... I wish I could be where you are. I so wish I could, Jerry. Oh, how I wish. Miss Trenton? I brought you a little snack, Miss Trenton. Coffee and sandwiches. Wouldn't you like some? Miss Trenton, where are you? Jerry? Jerry, wait for me! I'm afraid this is goodbye, Sally. <gasps> no! Goodbye! Mr. Weiss, sir, I think you'd better come over here right away. What is it, Sally? You'd best see for yourself. Sally, I don't see anything. What's, uh, what's the big mystery? That's just it, Mr. Weiss. I don't see anything either. She's not here anymore. Was the projector running? It was. When was that? About an hour ago. Who shut it off? I did. Then I called you. Well, if you looked in her room, maybe she's taken a nap. That's the first place I looked. Then I went to every room in the house, even the pool in the yard. She's not here. At least... At least not in the way you'd mean. You know how to work this thing? It's just that little switch there. Are you going to run it, Mr. Weiss? Yes, Sally. I'm going to run it. <sighs> Mr. Weiss, I can't stand to watch. I don't know what I'm going to see. Shh, quiet. All right, darlings, that's enough for now. Let's go outdoors. We'll finish our cocktails by the pool. Everyone go ahead. I'll be right with you as soon as I change out of these heels. What is this film, Mr. Weiss? Not one that I've ever seen. It's funny. It doesn't look like a set. Wait, hey, hey, those, those French doors, I... I'd swear it's this room. This one right here. It, oh, it can't be. But it is, Mr. Weiss. It is. Look at that scarf. She bought it only last year. And those shoes? They're the ones she wore when Mr. Herndon came by. Barbie! Barbie, please! What? It's Danny. Please, don't do this. Danny? Oh, there you are. Care to join us? The old gang's here. We're going to have such a time, just like we used to. You know I can't do that. I, I can't just step into a movie screen. It isn't real. None of this is real. Well, then, goodbye, Danny. Be a dear and hold on to my high heels for me, will you? I can't very well swim in them. Barbie, don't... Keep them to remember me by. Jerry! Where are you? Barbie, please. Over here by the bar. I just stopped to freshen my drink. Care for another one, Barbara? Oh, don't tempt me. Now we simply must go outside. Everyone's waiting. In that case, 
Race you to the pool? You're on! <laughs> <laughs> Barbie, come back! Come back! Sally? These shoes by the French doors, you... You didn't drop them here, did you? No, Mr. Weiss. And this scarf on the patio? No. Oh, they must be... Barbie's then. I, I guess I'll just have to... Have to hold on to them. In case she comes back. Oh, Mr. Weiss. What are we going to do now? Well, the only thing we can do... Wait. Meanwhile... Here's a toast to you, Barbie. And to wishes to the ones that come true. To the wishes that come true, to the strange mystic strength of the human animal who walks that thin line between reality and the shadows and can sometimes make one merge with the other. To Miss Barbara Jean Trenton, movie queen of another era, and no longer of this one. May her star shine brightly in the twilight zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. The 16mm Shrine, starring Kathy Garver, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Christian Stolte, David Darlow, Fernette Lebo, Doug James, Roger Walski, and Carl Amari. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group and Westwood One. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Matt Sorrow, Tim Cerny, and Todd Beyer. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Why? The snow is really coming down. No more flights will be going out tonight. We can't control the weather. Where will you stay? We got a room at the airport hotel. Well, that is no way to spend Christmas Eve. 
Well, we're we're better off than the people sleeping on the floor of the terminal. I guess so. Merry Christmas, Mom. I love you. Wait, tell Katie that Santa will leave her presents here and I'll keep them safe. Mom? Luke? Luke? Merry Christmas to me. Snowpath, South Dakota. Population 1. One very unhappy grandmother named Martha Waltham, who finds herself alone on Christmas Eve. Even though her house looks like a Christmas card, beckoning everyone home for the holidays, now no one is expected this year. Her only solace will be her Christmas tree, decorated with mementos of Christmas's past. The weather has spoiled her plans and cooked her proverbial Christmas goose. But Christmas is a time filled with miracles, and Martha Waltham is about to find out she won't be spending Christmas Eve alone after all, because she is about to meet some very special visitors from the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, Snow Angel. Starring Sean Astin with Stacy Keach as your narrator. And more snow. Get oh, out the snowshoes and the shovels. It's beautiful to look at if you're inside and don't have to go anywhere. And you might not want to go anywhere if you don't have to. And oh, entertainment today. Might as well so go to bed. So young and so. What? What is that? A car. Who'd be coming out here in this kind of weather? Who's there? Help! We need help! Who are you? What's wrong? It's my girlfriend. We need to find a doctor. Please open the door. You stand back from the door. I want to get a look at you. We need help. Please. You're just kids. We got lost in the snowstorm. We were going to the hospital and missed the turn for Sioux Falls. We're almost out of gas. Can we please come in? Uh, Sure, come in. Thank you. Uh, th- th- this is Lisa. I... I need to sit down. Please, I'm a little shaky. Well, go sit by the fire. Pretty cold out there tonight, isn't it? It was coming down so hard, I couldn't see the turn off. Lisa, you're breathing awfully hard. Are you all right? I'm fine. I'm just practicing my Lamaze breathing. Lamaze? She's getting ready to have a baby. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Well, what do you want for Christmas, little girl? I would settle for a pizza right now. Katie, didn't I say not to wander off? I was just listening to the man play carols. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Uh, here's some money. No, that's not necessary. No, it's Christmas. I'm sure whatever group you're with could use it. Come on, Katie. Merry Christmas. Katie. I doubt that man celebrates Christmas. What do you mean? He's probably a Hare Krishna or something. Didn't I tell you to keep an eye on Katie? I am. I I mean, I did. She was just listening to the hippie guy in the white robe play carols on the guitar. What's a hippie? Uh, There are no hippies anymore. Are there Hare Krishnas? No. Is he one of Santa's helpers? Uh, no. Why? Mom gave him money. 
Why did you give him money? To make him go away. He's still there. <laughs> Look, he's waving at me. Can I wave back? No. Yes. Which is it? Katie, you don't know him. Didn't I tell you never to speak to strangers? Does that mean I can't talk to anybody? That would be safest. That stinks. Katie, don't say that. We're together, and that's what Christmas is all about. Family. So, I can only talk to family on Christmas? Well, just this Christmas. But you said, be nice to everyone at Christmas. Well, yeah. That's the spirit of Christmas. It's a special time to celebrate peace and love. You know, joy to the world and everyone in it. Even the hippie? Well, yeah. Okay, I got a great idea. Why don't we invite him to our hotel room and have a pizza with him? Uh, I don't think so. Katie, you can't. He's a complete stranger. I thought Christmas was for everyone. Well, it is. Mom, where's your Christmas spirit? <sighs> Are you okay, Lisa? I think I need a doctor. Yes, you do. You really can't have the baby here. W what do you mean? Well, I didn't mean it the way it sounded. She's gonna, she's gonna need some help. We have to get her to the hospital. I'm gonna call the sheriff's office. The sheriff's office? The sheriff can get her to the hospital. Oh, it hurts. It really hurts. And besides, the sheriff's got an EMT on call for emergencies just like this. Quite frankly, I think the baby could come any time now, and it makes no sense to take chances. Oh, perfect. The phone just went dead. God, I don't believe it. The storm must have torn down the lines. Ah! What's happening? What's happening? Ah! Don't be scared. The lights just went out. Oh, great. Now we've lost the electricity, too. Well, I'll get some candles. Look, lady, we need help. What are you going to do? Don't use that tone of voice with me. Sorry. Look, she needs help. We've got to do something. Okay. I've got a four-wheel drive SUV in the garage. Here are my keys. You go warm it up, and I'll stay with her and get her ready to travel. Now you bring it around, and I'll drive you to the hospital. Thank you. Th thank you okay. so much. Can I get you anything? My mommy. I want my mommy. Well, I'm sorry I can't help you there. The phone's out and the internet is down. Look, before the night is over, you're going to be somebody's mommy. And you're going to find out how your mommy feels tonight, not knowing where you are. I'm so scared. How old are you? Fourteen. Fourteen. And him? He's older. Oh! oh, keep breathing. How much older? Uh, uh, pretty sure he's got a driver's license, if that's what you mean. And he obviously knows how to drive, so you're probably right. Wait a minute, what's he doing? What? Wait, he's driving off. Where's he going? I don't know. Well, you must. He's your husband or boyfriend or whatever, isn't he? Well, actually, he's not. What? I didn't think you were married, but... Who is he? Where did he go with my SUV? I have no idea. What do you mean? I met him at a truck stop in Minnesota. I have no idea who he is. His name is Matt something. I just... I just wanted a ride. Where? I don't know. I just wanted to get away from everything and everybody. Oh! Ah! This hurts so bad. 
I'm calling the sheriff. He'll come and get you. I am not dealing with this. No, you have to. The phone isn't working, and your SUV is gone. And I'm going to have a baby whether you like it or not. <laughs> oh, I guess you are. Look, don't cry. I'm sorry. L let's start over, huh? I'll help you through this. Can I ask you a question now? Sure. Why do you live out here all by yourself? Do you hate people or something? Well, no. Oh! Oh! oh that one really hurts. Why would you think I hate people? Why isn't your son here tonight? How do you know about my son? Relax. I saw a picture on the end table. I figured it was your son. Am I right? Yes. How come he doesn't live here with you? He went away to college, met a girl, and got married. He started a new life somewhere else. Do you miss him? Yes. So, why didn't you go see him for Christmas instead of making his family come out here to the middle of nowhere? My family comes home for Christmas. But your son's family can't be home for Christmas because they had to come here for Christmas. Oh. I never thought of it that way. He and his wife and daughter were supposed to be here tonight, but they got snowed in. So they're spending Christmas in an airport hotel. That double stinks. Now everybody loses. Apparently. I'll get it. Uh, uh don't answer it. This is a hotel. You don't know who's there. That's why I want to answer it. Christmas. Merry Christmas. I've got a pizza for you. Mom, it's the hippie. He got the pizza for us. What? There must be some misunderstanding. Look, I don't know who you are or what's going on here, but... Uh... I work for the airline. Here, here's my ID. Look, he has a name tag with wings, just like a pilot. <laughs> I'm not a pilot, but I've got a lot of airtime. I don't mean to be rude, but... Uh... What's with the robe? My angel costume? Not many people want to work on Christmas Eve. They want to be at home with their family, so, you know, I volunteered to work tonight. I told you he was nice. But it's not within my angelic powers to make the snow stop, so people are pretty crabby about their flights being canceled. I'm just doing my best to keep everyone happy. That is so nice of you. Come on in. Is there an angel that can stop snow? <laughs> the Archangel Michael, but he's pretty busy tonight. <laughs> <laughs> the Archangel Michael. That is Michael, so yeah. cute. <laughs> How are you feeling? The contraction stopped. Maybe it isn't time. Hey, the lights came back on. They must have fixed the power lines. How did they do it that fast? They didn't. I have a generator for when the power goes out. You can freeze to death up here without one. We might not get to the hospital, but at least we won't freeze to death. Maybe we can get you to the hospital. How? Matt stole your car, and his was on empty. Do you think he left his keys in the car? Probably. I mean, he stole the car, so I don't think he cared much about it. Good. The generator runs on gasoline. I can siphon the gas out of that tank and put it in the car and drive you to the Sioux Falls Hospital. Now, will you be all right by yourself till I get back? Yeah, sure. Merry Christmas, little lady. Is, uh, Martha around? She's out back getting more firewood. 
<laughs> that sounds like Martha to me. I wouldn't be surprised if she was chopping wood right now just for the exercise. I got her a chainsaw for Christmas. <laughs> wow, that's a thoughtful present. You visiting for the holidays? Yes. We barely made it through. Our car was running on empty. Martha's son got snowed in. She's really bummed out about that. She was really looking forward to the family getting together tonight. She doesn't admit it, but I think she gets pretty lonely out here all alone. Well, tell me about it. Well, at least she's got you to keep her company. So is everything okay? Yep, everything's good. It's Christmas. I'm wrapped up in a warm blanket. I've got a good book. And Martha chopping wood for the fireplace. What more could I want? I'll call her son and let him know you're both okay. Hey, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Lisa. All right, Lisa. You keep yourself all bundled up in that blanket. It's gonna be a cold one tonight. Sure thing. Good night. Good night. I'm uh, just leaving the Walton place over. Everything okay out there? Oh, yeah. Martha's phone lines were down and her son's flight got grounded in Chicago. He asked me to check on her. I can't imagine Martha ever needing help, though. <laughs> What's up? Keep your eyes open. The police are looking for a kid who stole a car. On Christmas Eve? Huh. <sighs> what is this world coming to? Oh, no. I'm grateful. What do you mean? If it weren't for guys like that, we'd be unemployed. with gas and we're in luck <laughs> Matt left the keys in it <sighs> Lisa 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 where are you oh god oh no her coat and her things are gone Lisa oh god there's snow by the front door god tell me she didn't go out into the storm see your license and registration? Of course, officer. Uh, this isn't my car, by the way. I know. Get out of the car, please. Sure. Uh, it's... It's my Aunt Martha's. You got some ID? Uh, 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 of course. Uh, here. My, my sister and I are visiting her for the holidays. What's your sister's name? Lisa. Can you describe her? Cute little blonde... She, she's with Aunt Martha right now. Oh, okay. Hey, here's your license. Yeah, I just met her. <laughs> she told me how she got Martha a chainsaw for Christmas. <laughs> they have old Martha's back from chopping wood, although I always thought that fit her personality more. <laughs> uh, I, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. So, uh, what are you doing driving around on a night like this? Well, uh, Martha was saying how good her four-wheel drive is in this kind of weather, so I just wanted to try it out. <laughs> Well, I don't blame you. Hey, have fun. We drive safe now. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Well, 
My dinner break is over. Time for me to get back to work. What do you do when the flights are all grounded? Well, not all the flights are grounded. They're not? No. Some flights have to go out no matter what. Passenger flights? Cargo. What's cargo? Packages. Wait a minute. Where's my package for Grandma? Honey, wait. Maybe he can get it on the flight. Honey, no. Well, where's it going? Snow Pass, South Dakota. I bet you don't have a flight scheduled there tonight. Well, you're right about that. I was thinking if it was you know, a big city or someplace warm. Could you try? <laughs> I find it very hard to say no to you. Give me the package. I'll see what I can do. the sky. Uh, I, I hit somebody. Oh, oh no. Ah! Oh man, I am so sorry. Dude, just, just, just lie still, lie still. a snow angel under your SUV. You, you're not hurt? <laughs> ah, ah, the snow is thick and soft. Whew, my angel wings are nice and fluffy. Go ahead, feel them if you want. <laughs> what? I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm kind of drunk, but you're an angel. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a big night for Christmas pageants, you know. I'm pretty busy flying around from place to place. How come you didn't get hurt? <sighs> well, your SUV is pretty high off the ground, and I grabbed the bumper and just hung on until you stopped. <laughs> I would have to say that this would be a miracle. It's Christmas. <laughs> hey, give, give me a hand and get me out from under here. Uh, uh, hey, careful. Don't get oil on the wings. <laughs> That's some snow angel you made. It, it's perfect. <laughs> yeah, well, I loved making them when I was a kid. When the truck stopped, it was the first thing I thought of. <laughs> so I made one. People love snow angels. Whew. Just to double check, you're not hurt, right? <laughs> Absolutely not. Nothing can hurt a snow angel. I mean, think about it. When I fell from out of the sky, blam, did I get hurt? No. <laughs> Think a little thing like getting run over by an SUV is gonna bother me? Uh, you did fall from the sky. <laughs> well, of course. But yeah, you know, my, my glasses flew off when you hit me. I uh, oh, I can't see very well without them. I, I think they flew off back there. Can you find them for me while I uh, whew, catch my breath? Uh, sure. Uh, anything you want. Around here, you think? Uh, nope. Farther down the road by that tree. Like here? Further. Hey! Hey, what are you doing? Where are you going with my truck? Don't leave me out here, I'll freeze to death! Mom, do you think he's going to get that package to Grandma's house tonight? No, not a chance. What's that sound? A jet just took off. Look out the window. You can see it. Mom, maybe there is a chance. Mm, sorry to disappoint you, but no. Hundreds of flights were grounded. We're going to have a long wait. Maybe Grandma's line is fixed. The phone company barely gets lines fixed on weekdays, and they're going to fix a line on Christmas Eve? Hello? I don't think so. Yes, this is Luke Waltham. You're mom in negativity. No, I'm not. See what I mean? 
Okay, you got really? me. Really? Okay. Thanks. Was that grandma? No. Told you so. It was the airline. They said to pack our bags and come to the terminal immediately. We're the first plane out of here. to death out here. Get in. Okay? Yes, I'm fine. You don't look fine. Well, that's because you're driving my SUV. Are you sure? Yes. A young man stole it. How did you get it? Well, I guess I stole it from him. Why? Well, I guess you could say I'm a man on a mission, and I needed it to pick you up. Where to? Well, if it's not out of your way, could you take me home? Sure. I was headed that way anyway. Martha's SUV? Huh? What? Uh, oh, I... Well, I thought I hit somebody back there a ways. And... You did what? Well, I thought I did, but I couldn't have because he came from out of nowhere. I mean, it was like he fell from the sky. He fell from the sky. Yeah, I think you better get in my squad car and then we can go back and look for Martha's SUV. Well, we ain't gonna find it. I can tell you that. How come? Well, the angel that fell from the sky tricked me into finding his glasses. He made me walk away from the SUV to look for the glasses. And when I got far enough away, uh, he drove off in the SUV. You know what I think? You got mugged, somebody hit you in the head real hard, and then stole Martha's SUV. You know, I did see a flash of light just before it happened. And then stars. Yeah, we got another car theft. Somebody stole Martha's car. What? Yeah, Martha's nephew's in the car. I found him on the side of the road. Somebody must have mugged him and stole Martha's SUV. Criminy! This car thief must really be busy tonight. The car reported stolen wasn't an SUV. It was an Eagle Talon with Minnesota plates. Oh, you got any ID on the guy? Minnesota State Police sent a picture of the guy who stole the Talon off a security camera at a truck stop. Oh, let's see that. Huh. This is a uh, picture of the guy who's sitting out in my cruiser. Don't look now, Chief, but I think he just stole his third vehicle of the night. Thanks for the ride home. Do I get to keep my SUV? Or are you going to keep stealing it? <laughs> Could I borrow it? For what? I'm looking for a girl named Lisa. Her parents are worried sick about her. You know her? When I get around. She was here earlier. But I scared her, and she ran off into the snow. I was out looking for her. I know. She's inside. What? Get her in the car into the hospital. 
Just keep breathing. Who are you? Your parents were worried about you. They're not mad at me? No. Your parents will always love you no matter what. So they sent an angel to get me? Well, they thought it would be pretty hard for you to turn an angel down. Anyway, I go where my beeper tells me and I do what I can. And you know something? You're in luck. I've got an ambulance coming to get you. You do? Let's go meet them. Is this ambulance the only non-stolen vehicle left in the whole county? Could be. I didn't even make my car payment this month, so I'm not sure if I even have a car anymore. And how could I have been so dumb to leave that guy in my cruiser with the keys in it? Your Christmas spirit let you put your guard down. Hey, isn't that Martha's car heading towards us? Looks like it. Flash your lights. Will do. Oop, wrong button. Got their attention, they're stopping. Sheriff, I'm so glad you got word to bring the ambulance. Say what? Lisa's getting ready to have her baby. She's what? I'll go check her, Chief. Well, my phone was out, so I couldn't reach you. And then my car got stolen. I know. You knew? Yeah, well, the guy who stole your car, he stole my cruiser. Hey, Chief, quick cabin and get over here. We've got to get this little girl to a hospital now. She's getting ready to have a baby. What is going on? <laughs> Come on, let's get her in the ambulance. It's so good that nice man was able to get through to you to bring the ambulance. What nice young man? Nobody called us. We're only driving this because my cruiser got stolen. Get up front and drive. Close the doors and let's get moving. Ah. I'll get back to you later, Martha. That problem is solved. Hey, want a lift back to the house? Yes. Quite an evening, huh? Oh, yeah. Unbelievable, actually. Do you mind if I ask you a question? Sure. Who are you? Well, I thought you'd never ask. Hmm. You're gonna be really, really surprised. At this point, nothing would shock me. Okay, you ready? I'm a friend of your son. I don't believe you. See? I told you. Okay, then what's his name? Luke. Are you some scam artist? You could have looked that up. What's his wife's name? Jesse. What's their son's name? Well, that sounds like a trick question. They don't have a son. You have one granddaughter, and her name is Katie. All right, I believe you. You did a lot of nice things tonight, so you must be who you say you are. But all of this happened so fast. I'm not quite sure what happened. Understandably. This is really bothering me. Do you mind if I ask you a little harder, more personal question now? I always love a challenge. Shoot. What are you doing out here in the middle of nowhere on Christmas Eve in an angel outfit? Delivering packages. So, are you one of Santa's helpers? Now, technically speaking, Santa's helpers are elves. I hate to break it to you, Martha, but there is no such thing as an elf. I know that. And we agree on that point, then. But now I need to know you're not some crazy guy running around in an angel outfit. <laughs> Martha, relax. Breathe easy. I'm not some crazy guy. Rest assured that I'm taking you home and everything is going to be okay. Okay. But why are you here, really? Do you want me to level with you? Yes. Please. Okay. Here goes. I made a promise to deliver a package tonight, and I never break a promise. Who are you delivering it to? 
Well, the package is in the trunk. Should I stop the car and show it to you so you can see? No. Just take me home. No problem. You know what would be really something? What? If when we got there, your family was waiting for you. Now that would really surprise me. Does Grandma live down there? Yep. You just put a gift got to her? Yep. Somehow, I got a feeling it did. No more mommy negativity? No more mommy negativity. How come? It's Christmas. For a child, Christmas is never the same once they question the plausibility of Santa Claus. Giving one person the responsibility of delivering a gift to everyone in the world just doesn't seem possible. So Christmas is a time of wonder. It is a special time set aside for wishing, hoping, giving, and receiving. When everyone believes the impossible is possible. That's why it never makes sense to question a miracle or where an unexpected gift comes from. It might have come to you on the wings of a snow angel, special delivery from somewhere deep within the twilight zone. Snow Angel, starring Sean Astin with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was written for The Twilight Zone by Joe B. Cerny. Heard in the cast were Anne Whitney, Natalie Berg, Courtney Boxwell, Anne Sonneville, Kiff Vanden Heuvel, Brandon Eels, Patrick Francis, and Natalie Urkel. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced by Carl Amari and directed by Joe B. Cerny for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design, custom Foley effects, recording, and editing are produced in the Cerny American Sound to Picture Theater by sound designers Bob Benson and Tim Cerny. Music for The Twilight Zone is provided by CBS and American Music Company Incorporated, New York. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to download episodes, including three free episodes on our homepage, Visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Roswell G. Flemington Model Ship Company. I'll check, please hold. Did we fill the Benson order yet? Benson? I just packed it. Uh, it's scale model steamship complete with working boiler and drive propellers. It's going out today. COD. Mr. Benson, your ship's been shipped. I mean, mailed. You should get it by the end of the week. That's right. You're welcome. Lloyd, where's the ledger from last quarter? Oh, on the top bookshelf. <sighs> Why'd you put it all the way up there by the ceiling? I didn't. Flemington did. Oh, then let's move the ladder so I can get up the <clears throat> flying jib or whatever he calls the wall beam. The mast. The captain insists it's the mast. Now don't you go nautical on me, Lloyd. Oh, I'm not. I wouldn't, believe me. Strictly his terminology. Well, I say it's a bookshelf and I say it's a pain in the neck. 
The Roswell G. Flem- Oh, hello, Mrs. Flemington. Yes, Mr. Flemington is in, but he's taking his mid-morning nap. Mm-hmm. In his quarters. I, I mean, his office. Yeah, that's right, with his phone unplugged. Would you care to leave a message? Uh-huh. Okay. I see. I'll tell him. Here it comes! Oh, cover your ears, boys! Let's get with it, Conklin! A tight office is a happy office. Idle hands make for an unproductive poop deck. Yes, sir. What are you doing, Miss Abernathy? Um, just putting on my lipstick, sir. That is, I mean, Captain. Belay that! Extraneous activity is nothing more nor less than sloppy seamanship, in a manner of speaking. You there! Fence mucker! Aye, aye. Keep an even keel, in a manner of speaking. Let's keep an even keel here, man. To all of you, bear in mind that we must, all of us, go aft. Climb up the old mast, in a manner of speaking, and set our sights on a distant horizon. Got it, sir. A tight ship, a happy ship. Damn the torpedoes of competition. And full speed ahead. Aye, aye, aye Captain. Captain. This is Roswell G. Flemington. 220 pounds of gristle, lung tissue, and sound decibels. He is, as you may have perceived, a noisy man, one of a breed who substitute volume for substance, sound for significance, and shouting to cover up the readily apparent phenomenon that he is nothing more than an overweight and aging perennial sea scout whose noise-making is in inverse ratio to his competence and character. But soon, our would-be admiral of the fleet will embark on another voyage, this one in an unchartered and twisting course, headed for a distant port called the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, Sounds and Silences, starring Richard Kind with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Ah, clear skies, visibility unlimited. And now, for something a bit more bracing. You may enter. I forgot to tell you, sir. Yes? What? Speak up. I forgot to tell you that your wife called. Oh, she did, did she? Yes, a little while ago. She's on the phone again now. Would you like to take the call? Oh, I suppose so. See how the home fires are burning. What's that? I said I'll plug in the extension. Yes, sir. Here, madam. Yes? Yes? What noise? Oh, well, it's a most excellent recording, actually. Flight sounds of aircraft leaving the carrier Hornet. No, I can't turn it down. It has to be heard at realistic levels. Speak up! What is your request? Talk? About what, pray tell? Well, then talk away. Very well, later. Of course I shall be home for dinner. Yes, of course, I'm quite sure. Goodbye. Naval aircraft, I presume. Someone should fire a volley at his starboard side. Ugh, no shooting, please. My ears are ringing already. If you ask me, I'd say Captain Bly is a few hours away from a mutiny. He'll have to walk the plank. Old fat boy, where would you find a plank big enough to hold him? (sighs) All those kamikazes they threw at us during the war. Wouldn't you think just one of them would have hit him? One of these days, all that noise is going to come back and bite him. I just hope I'm around to see it happen. All ashore! I'm home! Ah, Navy rum. To be followed later by a full measure of grog. But first... 
some easy listening on the stereo. Which album shall it be tonight? Sounds of Submarine Warfare, Great Squalls of the North Atlantic, Cruising on a Windjammer, Engine Rooms of the Great Destroyer... No, no. Wait. Here it is. Perfect! Dear? Could you turn that down just a little bit? I beg pardon? I say, I can't hear a thing on the telephone. You know what that is, my dear? It's a collector's item. This is an actual recording of the battleship Missouri bombing Okinawa. That may be, Roswell, but I can't hear who's on the phone. Ha ha! Lay on, gentlemen! Let them know what's what. Fire at will! And by the good Lord Harry... We'll show them how a man's Navy treats aggression. Who did you say is calling? Who? Just a minute. I'm afraid you'll have to call back. Woman! What have you done? Called a truce in the Pacific. You've ruined the record. That, madam, constitutes an act of utter abomination and the most callous vandalism. I would remind you... I would remind you that I live in this house, too. That there were only 100 such recordings pressed for the collector's market, as rare as rare can be. Well, now there are only 99. Absolutely irreplaceable. What you have just done is an act of wanton desecration, not unlike the defacing of John Paul Jones's statue. What are you, madam? Some kind of crazed peace fanatic? Roswell, we've had this out before. I'm not the fanatic around here. I must say, your meaning eludes me. Perhaps I should use semaphore signals. This, this insistence on blaring noises and running a household like it was a destroyer escort on convoy duty. This combination has now become quite impossible. Nonsense! That's why we have to talk. We are talking! And if I read you correctly, you have grown intolerant of my ways. In point of fact, you hold my very business in contempt. Not your business. You. The way you run your business and this... this ship-shape home. Ah, so you disapprove of the nautical decor. I'll have you know that every item is of enormous value. Enormous. From the ship's wheel at the helm. It's not a helm, Roswell. It's a living room. To the sails and riggings. They're curtains made out of canvas according to your orders. Old canvas. To the life preservers on the walls. All obtained at great expense. With profits from the self-same company that has kept you in good stead for so many years. Well... I can't live with it anymore. How's that? Oh, knock it off, Roswell. Stand down, madam. You're a noisy, insufferable clown, but you're not stupid. I have had it up to here, and my ears have had it, and my stomach lining has had it, and whatever part of the brain that keeps a person balanced, that's had it too. In short, I have had it. I'm leaving. By the good Lord Harry... Departing a sinking ship, you might say. And don't tell me how sudden this is, because as you well know, we have been en route to this point for the last 20 years. I can't bear to be at sea any longer. I am totally and absolutely astounded. Are you now? I am indeed. My own wife. And after 20 years. 20 years ago, I was not taken in marriage. I was piped aboard. And after 20 years, the piping has become shrill and unbearable. It has destroyed me, my nerves, and my sanity. So, at this point, Roswell, I'm leaving, in a manner of speaking, the ship's company. So, you're deserting me? In a manner of speaking, Roswell, you said it. Lydia! Lydia, don't you lock me out of our own bedroom! 
It wasn't locked, Roswell. It may interest you to know, madam. Don't shake your finger at me. That when I was a young chap, a mere cabin boy, you might say, I had a mother who insisted that she was perpetually ill. A whiny, petulant, complaining woman similar to yourself. Oh, this is too much. And when I would come home from school, she made me walk tiptoe and whisper in her presence. Whisper, whisper, whisper. Whisper. Do you know that in our house we never had any cookies? Just soft fudge brownies. Because they made less noise when you chewed them. Eat your brownie and then run upstairs. Change your clothes. But keep it quiet. And I tell you, madam, I took quite enough of it. That is why I went to sea. And that is why I've spent my life in the very wholesome, healthy, quite understandable pursuit of the free and the unfettered. Strip off the cotton and the insulation and let the sounds of the earth come in. And so now I am owner, manager, chairman of the board and president of the Roswell G. Flemington Model Ship Company. Second to none in the field. Whose motto is, damn the torpedoes, full steam ahead for fun and profits. I know the company. I know the president. I know the motto. And I respond, Mr. Roswell G. Flemington, with the following nautical phrase, which I have now taken to heart and will proceed to implement. The phrase is, lay aft and dump the garbage. So, in a manner of speaking, consider yourself dumped. Sounds of a three-masted schooner in the South Pacific. Perfect. Good riddance, madam. If the truth be known, I have never liked you. I have simply suffered your presence. If there is one thing that sticks in my craw, that thing is a landlubber. So, madam, in a manner of speaking, get ashore. Do you hear me? Get ashore now! I have never, marked you, I have never in my entire life felt so free, so unencumbered, so absolutely fulfilled. <laughs> in the parlance of naval language in a manner of speaking, the situation is 4.0. My decks have finally been cleared. I intend to enjoy myself topside for the rest of the evening. And at precisely ten bells, I shall retire to my sleeping quarters. But until then, this is my watch. At long last, at long last, I can see to the far horizon. And a life of wonderful, delightful noise. Now, where's my karaoke machine? Anchors away, my lad! Anchors away! What? What? Uh, what? A, a, a leak in the cargo hold? All hands on deck! Oh, where's it coming from? The blasted bathroom sink. There. The shower. Off, I say, off! How do you turn off this wretched alarm clock? Oh, my, my decks seem to be, in a matter of speaking, listing a bit. Where are my Navy cut cigarettes? I, uh, I, uh, I must be dreaming. Go around, go around, pass you imbecile. 
That's right! Run the red light! No noise laws in the city at all anymore. Any rattle trap is permitted on the streets. At last, my turn to make my way through the flotsam and jetsam. License and registration. Certainly, officer. Happy to oblige. My duty is a civilian. Here you are. Mr. Flemington? Roswell G. Flemington, of the Flemington Model Ship Company. Perhaps you've heard of us. Purveyors of the finest in maritime collectibles. A Navy man, are you? Coast Guard? Merchant Marine? Something wrong with your car. Why, no. No, not at all, thank the good Lord Harry. Now, this boat has kept me afloat for many years now. Hydromatic V8 with overdrive. Though the engine seems to produce a most curious sound this morning. Like a motorboat every time I step on the gas. No, no, it's, it's more like a tug, I should say. Like a tug hauling an ocean liner to the dock. On your way to work, are you? I am indeed. And if you wish to cite me for speeding, you'll have difficulty proving it in court. A great deal of difficulty. At no time have I exceeded 15 knots. Point of fact, that's an impossibility. Considering the sounds of strain emitted by this end... I didn't stop you for speeding, sir. Oh, good, good. Well, I'll be on my way. I stopped you because you were going so slow. You did? Oh. Oh, I, I, I see. Well, then, then that's all very well, then. Why are you driving so far under the speed limit? Why? It's as I said. This craft obviously has a few bolts loose somewhere. I tell you, I've never heard such a racket from the engine room. Then I'd suggest you take her into port somewhere. There's a gas station on the next block. They do repairs. But frankly, sir, the car sounded just fine to me. A real classic. You got a cherry piece of Detroit iron here. Lots of horses under the hood, huh? Uh, anyway... Try to keep up with the flow of traffic, would you, Mr. Flemington? Good day to you. Oh, I've been here two years, and I don't know when I'll get used to that thing. I've been here four years, and I've never gotten used to it. What do you suppose happened to old Lardhead this morning? You should count your blessings. This is the first time he's ever been late. <laughs> Wouldn't it be awesome if his car had fallen off the ferry boat with him in it? The peak. The absolute peak. Thus endeth the dream. Good morning, Mr. Flemp. That's the first time he's walked in without telling me that the smoking lamp was not lit and we had to move full speed ahead toward the shores of prosperity. Maybe he's sick. Mmm, something incurable, like barnacles on the brain. That's very odd. That's very, very odd. I've been here ten years, and that's the first time he's ever looked frightened. Something restful, restful. Actual sounds of Hawaiian outrigger canoes. Yes, yes. Ye gods, this record is defective. Fresh air, that's what we need. The great outdoors, the smell of salt spray in our nostrils. Blow me down! Conklin! What are you doing, man? Me? Uh, just pouring a glass of water from the water cooler, that's all. Well, let's keep it quiet out here. Yes, sir. Now what are you doing? Swallowing, Mr. Flemington. I was thirsty. Quietly, I said. Quietly. Now stop gaping. Get back to work. All of you. Mr. 
Mr. Fenstmacher! Begging your pardon, sir. Uh, new shoes. What have you gotten, them, dead fish? Oh, people! This ship has to shape up! Repeat, shape up! Noise pollution hinders efficiency. Let's secure the hatches now and mine the torrent of bilge. Oh! What is going on? By the good lord, Harry! What on earth is going on? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well? Nothing abnormal that I can see, Mr. Flemington. No excess wax, no obstruction of any kind in the inner or outer ear. You mean no sign of infection? Nothing at all? Not even inflammation. Candor dictates that I tell you, Doctor, that as a ship surgeon, you're a wash. You wouldn't make cabin boy in a manner of speaking. I take it, Mr. Flemington, that you expected me to find something wrong with you. I told you the symptoms, haven't I? You have. An apparent auditory distortion. Apparent? Shoes that sound like pipe organs played underwater? A leaky faucet sounds like barrels over Niagara Falls. And oh, 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 I wish you could have seen me cross 48th and 6th today. The traffic noise has nearly keel-hauled me. It was considerably more than a distortion. I don't know what to say without any outward signs. Well, I know what to say. Now hear this, doctor. There is obviously something askew in my... my crow's nest, in a manner of speaking. Now... Will you prescribe the appropriate medication for my affliction, or do you force me to seek safe harbor elsewhere? Frankly, Mr. Flemington, I think consulting another physician might be a practical idea. Extremely practical. Very well, then. But if you had a modicum of professional ethics, you would have given me this advice before going through the motions of a perfunctory examination. As it is... I'll now be done for your bill as well as another ear specialist's. Mr. Flemington, I wasn't going to recommend another ear specialist. I had in mind, uh, well, perhaps some psychiatric help. A psychiatrist, huh? I will make a presumption that you are being humorous. It is that charitable outlook that saves your being called to account, sir. The soundest recommendation I can make under the circumstances. I can assure you, Doctor, and I use the term loosely, that there are few people today on land or sea who are as sane as I am. I bid you good day. Good day to you, and good luck. Oh, what is that hideous sound? Hmm? Uh, oh, I'm merely making a few notes on your chart. See? Nothing to be afraid of. An ordinary number two pencil, that's all. Oh! Oh! Do you have to be so piercing with that rose? Sorry, Mama. Well, you've done a beautiful job setting the table. You can sit down now, Mama. Oh, you're a good girl, Rosie. You know I'd cook Thanksgiving dinner if I could, but with my allergies and my arthritis and my bursitis and my ear infection, not to mention my spastic colon, well, it's all I can do to make it downstairs. I know, Mama. You may call your brother now. Roswell! <gasps> not so loud, dear. I'm sorry. Roswell, would you please not ride your pogo stick in the house? All right. No running. You know what Mama said. Okay. Roswell? Yes, ma'am? Are you wearing shoes? Uh-huh. Roswell? Okay. Carefully. All right. Now take your seat, Roswell. You too, Rose. Who'd like to say grace? I will. Go ahead. Heavenly Father. We thank you for the food that my sister has set before us, and especially the pie, which I hope she even murmured to make for dessert. A silent prayer, Roswell. Oh, yeah. Amen. 
Pass the mashed potatoes, please. Yes, Mama. And the cranberry sauce, and the yams, and the cream corn, and the creamed spinach, and the tofu. Can I carve the turkey? Oh, there's no need. This year we boiled it till it's so tender it slides right off the bone. So much nicer without all that hacking and sawing. Doesn't it look scrumptious? Yeah. Here, have a roll, Roswell. Thanks. Hey, how come it's so soft? Rosie only put them in the oven for a minute so they wouldn't be too crunchy. Easier on the nerves. Did you make the pie? Tapioca, but there's lots of whipped cream. Grab hold. What's that? A wishbone. Grab hold and pull. I don't know. Go on. What are you children doing? And what's that in your hand? <gasps> oh my heart! You gave me such a fright. I'd better lie down. <laughs> But we got her good with the wishbone. Oh, didn't we? She thought she'd been shot with a harpoon. Don't you enjoy that? <laughs> It was the best Thanksgiving ever. Oh, the rules she had! Did I mention that we only used paper plates and plastic forks after that? See,、si. out with the pogo stick. I padded around in socks from the moment I got home from school. The radio was permitted only with headphones. The telephone had no ring, just a little red light. My toothbrush, soft bristles. No toast, only soft-boiled eggs. No ice cubes in the refrigerator. Not even chunky peanut butter. And all my school books had to be paperback, in case I accidentally dropped one on the floor. Go on. As soon as I was old enough, I ran away and joined the navy. What happened to your sister? Oh, she became a sign language interpreter for the National Theatre of the Deaf.、Mm. Well, I should say that about covers it. It does. Now do you understand, Mr. Flemington? Understand what, Doctor? Unless I'm very much mistaken, it's a phenomenon we in the psychiatric profession call auto-suggestion. Nothing to do with motor cars, I presume. A person talks himself into believing that certain occurrences take place when, in reality, they are pure figments of the imagination. Beyond that, there are some suggestions that you were very resentful of your mother. And her preoccupation with her imaginary aches and pains. You don't say. My guess would be that this feeling now extends to your wife, who very similarly provides you with a mother image. Ah, ah、uh、ha! -huh. But I can tell you this, Mr. Flemington, and forgive me if I repeat myself: these occurrences are only figments of your imagination. Yeah, but if that's so, then snap your fingers. Do I dare? Go ahead, snap your fingers. Any abnormal sound? None. Now, stamp your feet on the floor. Normal. Happily, delightfully normal. Now let's really put it to the test. Ha <laughs> ha! You've cured me, doctor. By the good Lord Harry, if Admiral Nelson had had you at Trafalgar, he'd have kept both his eye and his arm. In Navy parlance, Doctor, you, sir, are 4.0, 4.0, sir, in a manner of speaking. Ha ha ha! I'm free to go. Free as a bird, and slams the door at will on your way out. Be my guest. I shall. You, sir. You have the soul of a seaman. Bless you. Any more patients today? No, doctor. That was the last one. Praise Freud. Why do I get all the nutcases? Incredible! Absolutely incredible! My own wife, the culprit. Her miserable preoccupation with noise. She planted that seed in my head. Incredible, incredible what one crew member can do to a ship's company. Absolutely incredible, and the whole thing, mind over matter. Land ho! You are not welcome on this particular quarter deck, madam. Nor shall I stay here, Admiral. I forgot some of my things. 
I came to retrieve same, and now, whether you pipe me ashore or not, that's precisely where I'm headed. I might add, madam, that despite all your efforts to capsize this worthy vessel, in a manner of speaking, against the rocks and shoals of petulance and pettiness, this ship remains tight. Your efforts have been both worthless and wasteful. Horatio, old pal, let the following be my final comments. You are an overgrown sailor boy with an undermanned head. You are full of such neuroses that I wonder how you haven't cracked before this. Belay that! Belay that, woman! It just so happens that I have had a psychiatric evaluation. And if there is anything wrong with me, it is you. Furthermore, madam, the whole business is simply mind over matter. Absolutely and totally. Do you know what I can do? I can shut you off. I am a man of such incredible will that I can shut you off. Go ahead. Yell at me. Yell. Because even at this moment, I am in the process of exercising mind over matter. I am shutting you completely out. Flemington, I wonder about you. I wonder why no one has committed you. I really do. Ha <laughs> ha! See? See? I have shut you off. Go ahead. Talk all you like. Really, Roswell, you need help. You really do. Mind over matter. <laughs> I want to shut her out. I simply shut her out. Now, let's see. What'll I listen to tonight? Anchors Away. The Midshipman's March. Actual sounds of a Japanese destroyer exploding in the Pacific. Complete with boiler hissings, fantail cracking, and smokestack blowing apart. Ha-ha! Only great, huh? Better prepare yourselves, neighbors. This one will galvanize you in the proper manner. Something wrong with the record player? Better turn the volume up. All the way. Ah, must be the speakers. Why is everything so quiet? What's wrong out there? I, I, I can't hear the city. Hey, out there. Hey. Hey, what's going on? Why can't I hear anything? Louder. I want it louder. More noise. More noise out there. Let's hear it. Come on. Louder. Louder! Help me, someone! Help me! When last heard from, Mr. Roswell G. Flemington was in a sanitarium, pleading with the medical staff to make some noise, any kind of noise. They, of course, believed the case to be a rather tragic aberration, a man's mind coming inexplicably unhinged. And for this, they'll give him pills, therapy, rest, and lots of peace and quiet. Little do they realize that all Mr. Flemington is suffering from is a case of poetic justice. Tonight's tale of sounds and silences from the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites 
before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Sounds and Silences, starring Richard Kind, with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Maggie Carney, David Darlow, Richard Shavsden, Peggy Roeder, Sarah Marks, Carl Amari, Doug James, C.J. Amari, James Schneider, and Amanda Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors, and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. Spur of the Moment, starring Sarah Wayne Callies, with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Richard Matheson. Heard in the cast were Kurt Nabig, Christian Stolte, David Darlow, Meg Falcon, Doug James, and Frenette Lebo. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Your coffee, Mrs. Henderson. Thank you, Gladys. Will there be anything else? Not just now. Is Mr. Henderson in the study? Yes, ma'am. With more in paper. Ask him to come in, would you please, when he has a moment? Yes, ma'am. And is that you? Yes, Mother. Are you going somewhere? I'm taking Kalua out. Not now, surely. She needs exercise. Oh, I know, but... Just for a while. I won't go far, I promise. Well, be careful, dear. How long have I been riding? Why, since you were old enough to walk, practically. Then I think I can take care of myself, don't you? I only meant with the engagement party and all. That's not till this evening. I'll see you in an hour. Don't worry. I'm not a child anymore. <sighs> no, you're certainly not. Where's she off to? Exercise, John, for her and the horse. Now? But her young man is driving out from the city. We're to have lunch. She'll be back in time. That girl, always keeping him waiting. Oh, she's doing better lately, you must admit. Yes, but she's still so restless. All that energy. Then the horse may be exactly what she needs, at least until she and Robert set the date.
Good girl. What a beautiful day, huh, Kalua? Easy, you got nothing to worry about up here. What is it? You hear something? Where? I see, up on the ridge. How strange, dressed all in black? Who is that? Hello there? What's she doing? Hello, can I help you? Slow down, please, you're spooking my horse. Come on, Kalua, she's not gonna stop. She's crazy, we've gotta get away, we've got to. This is the sound of terror. Anne Marie Henderson, 18 years of age, her young existence suddenly marred by a savage and wholly unanticipated pursuit. Miss Henderson has no idea whatever as to the motive for this pursuit, and worse, not the vaguest notion regarding the identity of her black clad pursuer. Eventually, she will be given the solution to this twofold mystery, but in a manner far beyond her present capacity to understand a manner enigmatically bizarre in terms of time and space, which is to say, an answer from the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Spur of the Moment, starring Sarah Wayne Callies, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. She's just taken her horse out. I don't blame her on a day like this. She must have lost track of time. That's easy to do. Here, Robert, sit down. Would you like something? Don't go to any trouble for me. No trouble at all, my boy. I'll have Gladys bring us a tray. No, really. I'd just as soon wait for Anne. Where is that girl? You're looking well, Mrs. Henderson. Oh, now. I mean it. Is that a new hairdo? Oh, don't let's talk about me. No? What should we talk about? How are things in the city? Same as always. Oh, the firm is expanding. Did Mr. Henderson tell you? I think he mentioned something. A promotion may be in the air. Of course, it's not definite yet, but... Oh, that's wonderful, Robert. Dear, did you hear? Robert says he's about to receive a promotion. Well, it hasn't quite been decided. What in the name of... Will you look at that? What is it? Anne just came riding back as though the devil himself were chasing her. Really? I wonder what's wrong. Anne? Bob. Anne, what happened? Darling, you look positively terrified. I, uh, I... Hey, hey, what's the matter? Anne, did something... Oh, Bob! Please, tell us what happened, baby. Now you're all right. There was, there was a woman out there. Woman? What woman? I don't know. I never saw her before. She was dressed entirely in black with a cape. It was horrible. Calm down. You're not making sense. What did she do? She chased me. Chased? She was on horseback too, a black horse, and she chased me as hard as she could. I think if she'd caught me, she would have killed me. What? The way she looked at me, her eyes, they were insane. I'm sure of it. See here. Where was this? I, I, I don't know. Try to remember. Yes, Anne, if someone meant to kill you... John, don't you think we better... Was it where you usually ride, out beyond the meadow? I, I, I think, uh, yes, the trail below the hills. All right, baby, I... I'll take care of it. Um... <laughs> Shh, it's all over now, honey. Everything's going to be all right. Poor darling, what a fright you must have had. Use my handkerchief. There we go. All over now. Come sit with me. Yes, on the sofa. This is Mr. Henderson in the main house. We have a problem with an intruder. Yes. It was so frightening, I can't tell you. She just rode at me, whipping her horse with such a look of, of hatred. I don't understand. If you'd been there. At once. I take the gardener with you. It's possible that the woman is insane. 
And she's not one of the locals? You've never seen her before? No. Here, lean back. When you find her, bring her to the house immediately. Yes, immediately. An outside line, please. Get me the police. Better now. I'm all right. Will someone see the Kalua for me? The groom's already taken her to the stables. It was just so unexpected. One second I'm alone, and the next there she was at the top of the hill, glaring at me with her, her long hair blowing and those eyes. And then she started down the hill. There was no trail, but that didn't stop her, whipping her horse all the way. It was so terrifying. Quiet now, darling. You don't have to tell us anymore. Just try to forget it. I can't forget it. I don't understand. Who is she? Why did she chase me like that? I've never done anything to her. We'll find out. Your father's talking to the police right now. If she doesn't live around here, I can't imagine where she came from. It was like she was waiting for me, but why? Why me? Hey, I know. Maybe she had a message to deliver. Message? A warning. Mm-hmm. Sure you're telling us everything? What? You're sure she wasn't carrying a sign in her hand that read, Cancel that engagement party. Don't marry that investment banker from New York. Signed, yours truly, Fate. Please don't joke about it, Bob. It wasn't funny. Sorry, I, I was only trying to cheer you up. Oh, this is John Henderson up at the Spires. My daughter Anne was just attacked by a woman on horseback. Yes, on our property. She was out riding when she came across this woman. No, on the meadow. It runs roughly parallel to the old granite road. There's a gate just past the crossroad that you can... Yes, that's right. No, my daughter was able to outride her, which is, of course, beside the point. I've sent two of my staff out to find the intruder, but I will naturally want her arrested when and if she's... Thank you. As soon as possible, if you will. Feeling better? Yes, Daddy. Good. Wouldn't do to have a red-eyed fiancé at the party, would it? Certainly wouldn't. Where's my pipe? Why, in your jacket pocket, I imagine, dear. Hmm. Tell us about this woman now. I've told you everything. And you have no idea at all who she might be? No, Daddy. She must have ridden onto our property by mistake. Mistake? That's a point, Mr. Henderson. If she were on the property by mistake, why should she attack Anne? Yes. Did she shout at you? Yes, but she was too far away. I didn't hear what she was saying. I think she wanted to kill me, though. You're just assuming that, honey. No, you didn't see her eyes. I'm sure of it. Who's here? Oh, I doubt if she followed you all the way home, baby. What if she did? Let's hope she did. Save us the trouble of looking for her. Now, where exactly did this happen? And Aren't you gonna look? Whoever it is, Gladys will let them in. Now... I know, but... Come on, baby. Where along the trail? In the hills, you say? Well, it was... Yes? Um, beyond the meadow, out near that, that fallen oak, you know, where the, the stream... Go on. Yes? I want to see Miss Henderson. No mysterious woman, I'm afraid, unless she's a baritone. That sounds like... I'm sorry, Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Henderson has given strict orders that I'm not... I said I want to see Miss Henderson. David. I'm afraid that's not possible. Oh, dear, I thought everything was ended. It is, Mother. I, I didn't know he was... Didn't you? I'll take care of it. Would you like a hand? No, no. Stay here. What's going on? Nothing, sir. I only want to see Anne. See here. I thought I told you... Now, Anne, you stay away from him. I will, Mother. Perhaps I can be of help. I'm sure that won't be necessary. Don't you understand English, Mitchell? Get out of my way. <sighs> I'm sorry, Mr. Mitchell, but I'm not at liberty to admit you. Ask Anne. See what she says. David, don't... Why don't you back off, fella? Can't you see you're not wanted? Anne! Not now. That's all right, Gladys. I'll handle this. You're not welcome in this house, Mr. Mitchell. I don't care what you think. I came to see Anne. She doesn't care to see you. Please, David. Would you rather I call the police? 
As a matter of fact, they're on their way right now. Call who you will. I want to talk to Anne. What does it take to convince you? Prosecution? <sighs> Just a few words from your daughter. That's all I ask. Hear them, then. If that's the only way we can be rid of you, though I can predict what they'll be. David, I don't know what you expect from me. Anne. Anne. It is over between the two of you, isn't it? I told you it is. David, what is it you want? Just to tell you... Keep your distance. Don't put your hands on me. Robert, please. What? To tell you it's not too late. Oh, David, you're making it so difficult. It's not too late, Anne. Only a blind man could convince himself of that. I wasn't talking to you. No, but I was talking to you. Stop it, both of you. We belong together. You know that. Not anymore. Don't let your father force you into this. Break the engagement. I can't. You broke ours. Mitchell. Give him ten more seconds. Then that's it. Please, Anne. You belong with me. Don't, David. Time, Mr. Mitchell. You've said your piece. Get out. I'm not through yet. I think you are. Anne. Let go of me. Did you hear the lady? She said, let go. And I said, take your hands off me. <coughs> Is that your best punch? More where that came from. Stop it, both of you. I wish she had caught me back on that trail. Anything would be better than this. Surely you can do better than that, old boy. Let's find out. Steady, Robert. I will have no more violence in this house. Maybe this will persuade you. Daddy, what are you doing? I only keep this pistol to defend my family. And unfortunately, it looks like that may be necessary. Put the gun away, John. Gladly. As soon as some order is restored. I thought you knew me, Mr. Henderson. I thought I did, too. But now... I mean you no harm. Judging by your attitude, I can't be sure of that. I think the time has come for you to leave. I only want to... Don't think for a moment, Mr. Mitchell, that I won't use this. To the contrary. Don't hurt him, Father. Is this what you want, Anne? I don't know. To let your father break us up at the point of a gun. <sighs> Anne! Answer me! Don't even think of following her. Don't worry. I won't. And if you will have the common courtesy and sense to leave this house? Goodbye, Mr. Henderson. Mrs. Henderson. I won't bother you again. That's that, then. You know, I almost feel sorry for him. But not quite, eh? Not quite. Come, my boy. Yes, go back to the living room. I'll see to Anne. Didn't hurt you with that punch, did he? Hardly. I think a good stiff drink is in order, don't you? Amen. I wonder what's keeping the police. About that woman? They should be here. I wouldn't worry. She's probably gone home by now to wherever she lives. I didn't realize you had such crazy neighbors. <laughs> Neither did I, my boy. Until today. She's probably not from around here. Hard to be sure these days. People aren't always what they seem. Ah, well. Cheers. Cheers. Anne, honey? Yes, Robert. There you are. 
What are you doing out here? I just needed a breath of fresh air. Aren't you feeling well? I'm fine. Your folks were wondering what happened to you. <laughs> Tell them I'll be right in. Can I get you anything? Some punch? No, thanks. Sure. I'm sure. Just a little tired, that's all. Well, don't be long. You're the belle of the ball. <laughs> Am I? It isn't every night a girl announces her engagement. I know. Are you sure you're all right? Yes, Robert. Just give me a moment. And I wanted to tell you something. What? Only that you've made me very happy. I consider myself the luckiest man in the world. You do? These past few months, I knew the first time I saw you that you were the one, the woman I want to share my life with. You're very sweet, Robert. I love you very much, you know, and I'll do everything in my power to give you a good life. I swear it. I know. I know you will. Tell Father I'll be right there. I think he's ready to make the announcement. <laughs> of course he is. Now go on. Don't be long. I won't. here in the stall they'll be looking for me well oh, Anne, sit with me will you do that much i'm here aren't i thank you for coming i don't know where to begin you don't have to but Anne, it's already been decided i can't let you make a mistake like this i'm not making a mistake forget about me it's you i'm worried about i'm not worried and i can't forget about you how could i Ever since we were children, even then we knew. That's what I thought. But that man in there, that pretentious, self-righteous snob, anyone but him. I'd tell you the same if you were my sister instead of the one I've always... Shh. You're not listening to me. I've made up my mind. When I was a child, I wanted to be with you. Only you. I felt the same, you know that, but... I haven't changed. I thought I had, but I was wrong. Today, when you two fought, I knew. I want to get married, David, but not to him. Oh, Anne. Are you sure? I've never been more sure of anything in my life. But how? Let's go away. Now, with just the clothes on our backs. We don't need anything but each other. Where will we go? Doesn't matter, does it? As long as we're together. I, I can get a job. I'll work hard. I'll... You won't have to. As soon as Daddy gets used to the idea, we can come back. He'll find something for you. I don't want a thing from him. We have to make it on our own. Otherwise... Shh. I'm his only daughter. Someday, this place will be ours. We'll run it together, raise horses, just as we always wanted, doing what we love. I only love you. Oh, David. I love you, too. So very, very much. What's happened to you? I'm not sure. The truth finally got through to me. I was so frightened today. I I guess it brought me to my senses. It was like waking up. And I'm so sorry. You don't have anything to be sorry for. Did you bring your car? Down the road. And let's run away now before it's too late. In a minute, Anne. In a minute.
Yes? Mrs. Henderson. Who's calling, please? Mrs. Henderson, this is Don Monikian. Who? From the law firm. Oh, yes. Have you taken care of that matter for me? I'm afraid... Well, I have some bad news. Don't tell me they've agreed to a smaller amount. Well, I suppose we'll just have to accept. My daughter will be disappointed. They won't agree to any amount. Your estate is mortgaged to the gills. And those back taxes have put you in a very dangerous position. The bank says... What's that? My hearing aid's not working. It sounded like you said... There's no possibility of a loan. And unless you sell the property... Sell? Why, this is all we have. It's always been ours. My husband built it up from nothing. And when he passed away, your daughter and son-in-law took over the estate. Your net worth dropped precipitously. Sell some more stock. Mrs. Henderson... There aren't any more stocks to sell. Mr. Mitchell had everything in high-risk growth funds. I advised him to diversify, but he wouldn't listen. And now, but with the way things have been run, the only alternative is receivership. If we can arrange a time to sign the papers... I can't talk about this anymore. My heart. I'll have my daughter call you when she returns. But, Mrs. Henderson, I have to tell the bank something this afternoon. Good day to you, Mr. Manukian. Is that you? Of course it is, Mother. Who else would come to this dump? That lawyer phoned again. Which one? From the investment firm. So? He wants you or David to call him. Oh, who gives a... Did you hear what I said? I heard. Do you think that will help? Yes, it'll help if I drink enough of it. They're going to take the house away from us, Anne. Are they really? Yes. They can have it. Eh! Come off it, Mother. I've got more important things on my mind. Oh, like what? Something happened today. Did it? What could possibly... Do you know what I saw? Do you? And really... I saw a ghost, Mother. My own. What are you talking about? A ghost? That's right, Mother. A phantom. A visitation from the past. This is no time for such nonsense. You haven't heard a word I said. We're in danger of losing the house. Oh, come off it. That's all it means to you? That's all. The home you were raised in. Raised? You mean lowered? Spoiled? Squeezed to death with a velvet glove. Oh, don't let's start. It started the day I was born, thanks to Daddy Dearest. I won't hear you debase his memory. Debase his memory? How oh, cornball can you get? How can you talk like that about your own father, who gave you everything? Everything! That's right. Gave me. I never had to earn a bit of it. In fact, I never had to work for anything in my life. Never had to bother acquiring such useless traits as judgment, discrimination. Who needs them? Cheers, Mumsy. You blame your father? Yes. I blame my father. But how? Easy. Oh, he was so strong, wasn't he? So efficient, so meticulous. I was his baby. Oh, wasn't I? Sixteen, seventeen, eighteen years of age, I was still his baby. With all the keen insights of a baby, all the capacity to understand, 
The ability to judge people and make decisions. The right ones. So I made a mistake. One little mistake. Just enough to ruin my life. And I've suffered for it, haven't I? Haven't we all? I'd say that calls for another drink, don't you? Oh, and don't. Oh, how wonderful. I'm finally being disciplined at the age of 43. What about the house? I don't care about the house, Mother. Well, I care. That's your misfortune. And none of my own. At least we should talk about it. Time is running out. It ran out a long time ago, Mother. A long, long time. I have something more pressing on my mind. What I saw out there today. The ghost of engagements past, you might say. There you go with your ghosts again. Mine indeed. Intriguing, isn't it? To be haunted by one's own self. Positively fascinating. What exactly did you see? A reminder from the past and the future. I was riding where I always go out beyond the meadow. I was on a ridge when I saw this young girl pass on the trail below. There she was, with her new saddle, a wonderful white horse. Her daddy gave it to her when she graduated high school. You may remember it, Mother. How could I? Because it was my horse once. The girl was me. As I looked at 18. Oh, I think you've had too much to drink. No, you're wrong. I haven't had enough. You remember the day of my engagement party? I do. I even remember the date. It was June 13th, 25 years ago. Do you recall how I came in that day, terrified because a woman had attacked me, chased me on a horse, and father had them search for her in vain? I was that woman, mother. I am that woman. Look at me, black cape and all, to match my favorite horse. And you want to hear something funny, something marvelously funny. It's not the only time I've seen her. Don't carry on like this. Go upstairs and lie down. Isn't that bizarre? I keep seeing her again and again. Keep seeing myself just as I was on that day, on that one particular day. <laughs> you know that expression, go chase yourself? That's what I've been doing. Chasing myself, trying to... Trying to... Anne, you're frightening me. Come sit down. It's getting dark. We'll, we'll light the fireplace. Would you like that? You remember what Bob said to me on that day when I told him? Maybe it's a warning, he said. He thought he was joking. It was a warning. I was warning myself not to marry the wrong man. But I married him anyway, didn't I? Of course, I didn't think so at the time. I thought I was being so brave and independent following my heart. And now I've paid the price. I've become the, the grotesque wraith dressed in black who frightened that poor naive child after death 25 years ago. A phantom who lives in a bottle married to a man who's run our estate into ruin. If only I'd known I was being warned. But who could have told me? Who could have made me listen? Warned of what? Speak of the devil. I asked a question. At least I think I did. Not now, Not Dave. now what? I can talk to my wife anytime I want to. Anne's not herself. Oh? Then who am I, Mother? I'd say I'm more myself than ever. Perhaps for the first time. What are you talking about? Get out of here. David, it might be better. If you... I know, if I crawled back upstairs, so you can blame me for everything. That's not fair. I did the best I could. What did I know about it? Investments, running a business. If your old man hadn't up and died... David! Well, it's the truth. But look on the bright side. We had some good years. Did we? When? After we came back and your father set us up. Some bad luck, that's all. But we'll get on our feet, you'll see. All it takes is for... For... For what? A miracle? Another life? 
We only have one chance, and we blew it. Don't you see? I blew it. But maybe, just maybe, if I can find her again and get through one last time. <laughs> What's the matter with her? Oh. Oh, you poor man. Get out of my sight. I know what it is. Do you think she doesn't love me anymore? the spot. She'll come along the bridal trail down there. I know she will, and when she does... There. There she is. Look at her. What does she have to smile about? Anne! Come on, faster! This is the sound of terror. Anne Marie Mitchell, 43 years of age, her desolate existence once more afflicted by the hope of altering a past mistake, a hope which is, unfortunately, doomed to disappointment. For warnings from the future to the past must be taken in the past. Today may change tomorrow, but once today is gone, Tomorrow can only look back in satisfaction. Or, as in the case of Mrs. Mitchell, in regret and eternal sorrow if the warning was ignored. Said warning, as of now, stamped, not accepted, and stored away in the dead file at the records office of the Twilight Zone. The Twilight Zone continues in just a moment. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, You'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop twilightzoneradio.com. Visit twilightzoneradio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into 
the Twilight Zone. What? <coughs> Go away. Ed, you in there? Yeah, yeah. Where else would I be? Open up. It's me. Oh, all right. There he is. <sighs> what do you want, Professor? <laughs> What do I want, he says. I was hoping to catch a little nap before supper. Look what I got here. Don't tell me. Let me guess. New checkers and checkerboard. That's what. My niece brought them when she stopped by. How about a rematch? Uh, you took all my money yesterday. Maybe so, but that was the old set. <laughs> what difference does it make? Well, now, some people say there's a field around things, like magnetism. That's the latest research, a kind of memory. You tap into the field, the old pattern repeats, no escaping it. Ha! Huh. A cockamamie theory if I ever heard one. But this, now this is a brand new game, in more ways than one. That means you've got a chance. Wipe the slate clean, build new memories, start from scratch, so to speak. Best two out of three? Huh. We'll play for the fun of it. How's that sound? Uh, you gonna talk my ear off if I say yes? <laughs> my lips are sealed. Mm, where? Well, sitting room's available. Uh, the television's in there. Well, nobody's watching it. Too early yet. You sure? Last time I looked. Of course, the longer we stand here talking, <sighs> All right, Professor. You're on. Good man. Uh, just give me a minute here. You got rid of the old radio, I see. No, I didn't. Just put it down in the basement for safekeeping. Till you get it fixed, huh? It doesn't need to be fixed. Works fine. Oh, I thought... Well, I haven't heard you play it for years. <laughs> That's because there was never anything on. I beg to differ. You know how many stations there are in the U.S.? More licenses than ever. FM as well as AM. Yes, and none of them worth listening to. Talk shows. Rock and roll. Huh. Well, I don't know what stations you were listening to. <clears throat> All the same nowadays, it's a disgrace to a radio like that. The craftsmanship. You don't see fine cabinets anymore like that. Wood veneer. And the speakers inside. Twelve inches. Bass you could feel. Puts those dinky little jobs to shame. Too bad it's in storage. I might just get it out of storage so you can hear what a real radio sounds like, huh? Of course you'll need an antenna. Why? I never needed one before. Can't get anything upstairs. It's the angle to the transmitter. You see, the radio waves... Yeah, yeah, sure. You'll see, Professor. One of these days, if you're lucky, I might let you listen in. I look forward to it, Ed. I really do. But for now, how about some serious checkers? Unless you're chickening out. Not on your life. Let's go. Heck of a console, I'll give you that. Never saw one quite like it. Quite a console indeed. No one around here ever saw one like it. Because the radio in question is very special. In its day, circa 1935, it was one of the most elegant models on the market, and it sold for a premium price. Now, with its fabric-covered speakers, its peculiar yellow dial, its serrated knobs, it looks quaint and more than a little strange. Like a survivor from another era. Very soon, Mr. Ed Lindsay, resident of Mrs. Nielsen's boarding house, will find out just how strange when he tunes in to an unscheduled broadcast from the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, Static, starring Stan Freeberg with Stacy Keach as your narrator.
Good news. It was reported today that a cure for the common cold is very close. Reliable sources say... All right, lads. Move away from the bar. I've had all I can take from you. Everybody ready? Whatever you say, Father. Um, what did you say, Mrs. Nielsen? Dinner. It's almost you ready. You hated your not, brother. Not for a few you more minutes. The program isn't over yet. Well, how about if you, Vinny? Any time at all, Ruth. I'm not particular. Besides, I have my knitting to finish. You were Very well, then. But I it's pleasant just to sit here, don't you think? Of All of us together, like a family. You're gonna draw her, ain't you? Now you're a man, Lance. You Your move, Professor. Face up to the How's that? Your move. There's law oh, yes, of course. I got you. caught up in the television program. A little late for that. That's my piece. I'm red, remember? You're black. You don't say... In that case, I'll move it back and move my man, let me see, here. Good choice, Professor. Hmm? Now all I have to do is da, 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 like so. <laughs> gotcha. My, my. Game over. How'd you do that? Ah, this is no fun. No fun at all. Did you know green? Not if I'm the only one paying attention. That young lady in the evening gown. Where? On the commercial. Reminds me of my niece. For the first time in green. The new natural mint cigarette. The smoke that leaves you smelling like the great outdoors. Cool and green. Like the grass between your toes. It's a refreshing breath mint. It's a refreshing smoke. All in one. Mmm, I just love a man with green in his pocket. Yes, green is brought to you in the zipless airtight package for satisfaction, rain or shine. Just reach for the green and stick it in your mouth. You never had it so good. And neither did I. <laughs> Look at that, will you? Right in the kisser. <laughs> What's the matter with you, Professor? What's the matter with all you people? Speak for yourself. Are you hypnotized? Have you gone out of your blessed minds? Hey, I was watching that. Stupid, stupid commercial. If you don't care for the program, Mr. Lindsay, you can request another channel. What difference does it make what channel it's on? They're all the same. And it's a beautiful day at the Green 500. Another lap at number 54, Jeremiah Jones takes the lead. Jeremiah Jones, <laughs> my favorite <laughs> reckless <laughs> driver. Oh, can't you see? Little brown jug is driving me so crazy. Oh, 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 so crazy. Oh, Little brown jug. And again, it's hammered. America's leading vacation development. A spectacular golf course with challenging sand traps, a beach-like atmosphere, rainfall of less than <laughs> one inch. Fine, if you're a, a hermit lake, crab. Soon to be constructed. What are you doing there? Where's my program? Right here. Nowhere. And that's where you'll all be if you keep watching this app. See here, Mr. Lindsay, you've no call to say a thing like that. If you don't enjoy the programs, you can keep it to yourself. That's the least you can do. You're right, Mrs. Nielsen. That's exactly what I plan to do from now on. I'm going to find some real programs to listen to. And if I can't, well, I'll listen to nothing. Hm. Well, that does it. No second helpings for him tonight. Hey, Tommy! Hi, Mr. Lindsay. Tommy, come over here, will you? 
gotta get home. No, this will just take a minute. My mom's got dinner ready. How would you like to make 50 cents? Gee, two whole quarters? All right, I'll make it a dollar. I, I need your help with something. Like what? Uh, there's a box down in the basement. Yeah? Uh, I'm not so good at lifting anymore. Oh. L leave your skateboard by the porch there. Okay. Careful now. Yes, sir. The bulb burned out, but I think there's still enough light. Where is it? Over here, by, by these boxes. What's that thing, Mr. Lindsay? That's a radio, boy. A radio? How come it's so big? Radios are littler than that. Not this one. Just to hear music? Music, yes, and a whole lot more. Stories, scary ones, science fiction, all kinds, and comedies. Jack, Benny, Fred Allen, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, Red Skelton, and music. Oh, oh, such great music. What do you need a big old radio like this for? Just turn on the TV. TV? <laughs> this is much better. Yeah? What's it do? It does everything a TV does, and then some. No, it doesn't. Where's the picture? In your mind, Tommy. In your mind! Now let's just slide it across the floor there and then carry it up the stairs. Yes, sir. Damn, this is heavy. <clears throat> Don't worry, Mr. Lindsay, I got it. There we go. Good boy. Now, that wasn't so heavy, was it? Nah. Where are you gonna put it? In my room. All we have to do now is get it up to the second floor. Don't hurt yourself. Not a chance. Well, now, what have you got there? What does it look like? A radio. Is this the one? Why, I remember that set. Do you? I thought you'd thrown it away years ago. Huh. I never throw anything away that's worth keeping. Need some help? No, thanks. Listen to him, Ed. It's no trouble. Come on, boy. Let's go. What do you think I'm paying you for? Uh, yes, sir. <clears throat> All done. All uh, done. I can take it from here. Uh, think it still works? I know it does. <laughs> they built things to last in those days, boy. Now plug the cord into the wall, will you? Like that? Perfect. Now let's turn it on. And now for the weather, more of the same. The Tri City area. Uh -oh. Hey, that's cool. Here's your dollar. Now go buy yourself a switchblade. Thanks. Well, take it easy, Mr. Lindsay. Yeah, sure, boy. Now, let's see what we can bring in here. Ah, that's more like it.
shame I missed that. And now, here is Major Bose. Now you're talking. Good evening, friends. On this opening day of autumn, we spin up... This is station WPDA in Cedarsburg, New Jersey. Wait, not now. Come on, come on. Are you in there? Yeah, yeah. Perfect timing. Perfect, I tell you. Well, what do you want? I thought you'd like to know that dinner is ready. Mmm, I'm not hungry. You know how Mrs. Nielsen feels about... All right, all right. Ever since I can remember, women have been running my life. Do this, do that, come to dinner. Frankly, Mr. Lindsay, I don't care if you starve to death. I only want to be sure that it's on purpose, and not because you've forgotten that food is available. Oh, for goodness sake, I'm not that old yet. And I can't leave you alone for a minute. Not one little minute. Around the city, from Mansfield, Helen Dixon, a coloratura soprano, a heart of Ah, free. there we go. I mean, that's Good the old name Major Bowles. Your home is in Mansfield, Helen. I was born there, Major Bowles. I'm a stenographer for the... Um, Sheet and Tin Plate Company. Mm -hmm. Are you enjoying New York? I haven't seen much yet, but it looks very exciting. And oh, such handsome men. Uh, would you please look into the microphone if you... Uh... <laughs> that's it. <laughs> All right, a heart that's free. Let it go. Nice Swiss steak, Mrs. Nielsen. Very nice, Ruth. You're a good cook. You don't need to bring the dessert out. I'll get mine in the kitchen. Now hold your horses, Mr. Bragg. What's the hurry? There's something to be said for a leisurely meal. It aids the digestion. She's right, you know, Mr. Willoughby. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Mr. Lindsay! What? You're humming at the table. Was I? What was that, anyway? Hmm? That melody. It went, uh... Ta -da 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 oh, not you, too, <laughs> Professor. You remember it? It's called Getting Sentimental Over You. Oh, yes, yes. I heard it on the radio a while ago. That's an old tune, isn't it? Tommy Dorsey. <laughs> he was playing it direct from... Tommy Dorsey, you say? The one and only. Direct? That's impossible. Hmm, you don't say. Yeah, he died a few years ago. What about Major Bowes? Who? Major Bowes. I remember Major Bowes. Never heard of him. You wouldn't. Well, he's dead too. But I heard both Major Bowes and Tommy Dorsey this afternoon, live, on the radio. Couldn't be. Bragg, how is it that a man with such a tiny brain can have such a big mouth? Now, wait a minute. Please, Mr. Bragg, I think what Mr. Lindsay means, what he intended to say, is that a local radio station was broadcasting recordings of some of the old programs. Isn't that right? They didn't have tape back in those days. No, but they had wire, and before that, discs. And I'll tell you what else they had. Good music. Huh. Plays that meant something. Comedians that made you laugh. <laughs> magic. Real magic. I doubt it. Oh, you do, do you? You doubt it. Hear that, everybody? <laughs> Mr. Bragg doubts it. Mr. Bragg, who watches television until his mind turns to oatmeal, until his eyes roll down his face into his beer. Mr. Bragg, the modern man, doubts it. No, no. Well, I'll show him. I'll show you. Where's the portable radio? Really, Mr. Lindsay, I don't know what you're so... Where's the portable radio, Mrs. Nielsen? In the kitchen, but... He's nuts. Now, really? Nuts, that's all. 
Miss Brown, you may thank your lucky stars that you never married that man. Ruth! Here, this'll settle it. Listen, Mr. Bragg. Time, weather, and... Always. Well? Right around here on the dial. <laughs> Sorry. I gotta watch Gunsmoke. It's on in four minutes. So soon? That's our show. Well, come along, then. We'll get our regular seat on the sofa. Do you remember what station it was? Station? No. Wait a minute. Yes. The announcer said... Uh, what was it? Uh, oh, yeah. WPDA. WPDA. This little radio won't pick it up. See? What do you expect on such a dinky rig? Come on up to my room and listen to it on a real set. Ed, are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. Come on, the more the merrier. Might as well, eh, Vinny? I'd like to hear that station, if it's still on. Mm. Well, look at it there. Right where it used to be. I can't seem to get it, but I'm positive, I tell you. Maybe they're having some kind of transmitting trouble. Do you really think so, Professor? Why don't we call the station? Yeah, that's a good idea. Check the directory first. Uh, let's see, radio stations, radio stations. Hmm... It doesn't seem to be listed. You could try information. Here's a coin, Ed. Thanks, Professor. Hello? Information? <clears throat> Could you please give me the number of WPDA? That's a radio station. Yeah, yes, WPDA in New Jersey. Right, yes, I'll hold on. You say you heard Major Bose. Major Bose, that's right. Round and around she goes. And where, where she, she stops, stops nobody, nobody knows. knows. Yes, hello? Uh, are you sure? Could you check with your supervisor? You did. Well, thank you, operator. Well? According to the supervisor, WPDA's been out of business for 13 years. Can you beat that? Maybe you heard some other state or some other country. It has shortwave, doesn't it? No, no, the announcer said Cedarburg. I could check the paper to see if it's listed in the radio section. But if it's out of business... I heard it. I know I did. Professor, is it so impossible? Impossible? That's a dangerous sort of word these days, Vinny. We take things for granted now that we called impossible just a few years ago. Let's call it highly unlikely. Then what did I hear? I don't know, Ed. I don't know. I'll see you downstairs. Ed? I'm busy. Professor? Yes? Do you believe he heard those programs? I believe he thinks he did. As the policies of the United States... Tonight, the President of the United States delivers his fireside chat, which has long been awaited as a clarification of national policy. Vinny! Professor Ackerman! Professor! You really are a marshal. You want to go with him, Abby? Or you want to stay here and die? Professor Ackerman! Come back up! Quick! Quick! I've got it! Okay, Ed. We're coming. Why bother? You ain't gonna hear nothing but static. 
Come on, Vinny. Really, Professor, you shouldn't encourage the poor man. That's enough, Ruth. I'm right. You'll see. He's gone completely psychological. That's why you made your mistake. You say you've got the signal? Sorry. Now I've lost it. I was listening to it, and then I lost it as soon as you came up the stairs. Why should it stop every time somebody else comes around? Why? Well, you keep trying. We're bound to, to hear it eventually. Good evening to you, Ed. Yeah, we're bound to. I'll get it again. Well, what do you want, Vinny? Nothing, Ed. I, I just thought we might talk a little. Do you mind? <sighs> no, talk away, but don't come too close. I might lose control at any second, you know, climb the walls, bark like a dog. Oh, Ed. Well, that's what you think, isn't it? All of you. Poor old Ed. <laughs> He's gone ding-dong, lost his marbles. No, that isn't what I think at all. If you'll sit down and be quiet, I'll tell you what I think. Sure, why not? Right now, Ed Lindsay, you're... You're just about the meanest, sourest, most cantankerous old man on the face of the earth. Thanks. And I'm not much better. We've been living like two hermits under the same roof for 20 years. Staring at each other every morning, day in and day out for 20 long years. Wondering what went wrong. I... I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do. You know perfectly well what I'm talking about, only you won't admit it. We were going to be married, Ed Lindsay. You had to mention that, huh? Now, don't you get your back up. I'm not trying to change anything. It's too late for that. I'm just talking. We met right here in this boarding house, and it was here that you proposed. I wanted to set a date, but your mother was ill, you remember, so you decided to wait. And that's just what we did. We waited and waited, and by the time your mother died, it was too late. Vinny, I'm not going Don't to... Don't interrupt. I've got to get this thing said. Oh... I know you haven't got any use for me now. I'm, I'm just a silly woman who knits and watches television, dyes her hair and grows old. You don't even like me anymore. And I don't blame you. You're a bachelor set in your ways. You can't change what you are, and, and neither can I. We had our chance and missed it, Ed. But I'll tell you one thing that's true. And I know it's true. You did love me as, as much as a man ever loved a woman. Didn't you? Yes, Vinny. That's true. I did. And now you love what we were. What we might have become together. So just about this time every year, it would have been our anniversary. You start getting unhappy. You want to go back and start over again. That's not true. Isn't it? Why do you think you keep hearing getting sentimental over you? That was our song, Ed, and the programs. We used to listen to them together in the dark. Huh. I'd forgotten. When you hear those programs, you're like a young man again, with all of life ahead of you. But it isn't so, Ed. It's all over between us. We missed our chance. We can't go back. Then you think it's all been in my mind, don't you? You think I'm imagining I hear the radio. Well, you're wrong. Get out of here, Vinny. Get out and leave me alone. If that's what you want. Go on. I've got everything I need right here. And now, 
Goodman and his orchestra. Mr. Allen! Fred Allen! Ha <laughs> ha! boy. Here we go. Well, how about joining Portland and me? Uh, now, we're walking down Main Street. Which way? Well, we're going over to buy a DeMarco sister's record. You'll get a kick out of this tune. What number is it? Well, it's down by the station. And Earl, with Al Goodman and his orchestra and the five DeMarco sisters, down by the station comes out something like this. <laughs> If you're two or a hundred and two, you'll get a treat when you order a seat on the old. Hello, Professor. Oh, hello, Vinny. Just catching up with the newspaper. Anything new in the world? No, not really. More of the same. Prices are up, a storm in the wings, an election coming up. A debate in Washington. The more things change, eh? How are you today? Oh, I'm... I'm doing all right. Haven't seen much of Ed lately. I know. I hope I, I haven't... Haven't what? Made a terrible mistake. Why, Vinny? What do you mean? Perhaps we shouldn't have interfered. Oh... That. Oh, don't worry yourself. It's for the better. You'll see. Would someone answer that, please? I'm setting the table. I'll get it. Who's there? Delivery. Yes? Uh, groceries for Mrs. Nielsen. Thank you, young man. Take them on into the kitchen, would you please? Yes, ma'am. Here, I've got it, boy. I can do it. So can I, son. So can I. Here's a tip. Gee, thanks. Mm, make it a dollar. <laughs> now, give me those bags. Here we go. I'll carry one, Ed. You'll hurt yourself. Not a chance. I'm not under the ground yet. Why, Mr. Lindsay. Morning, Mrs. Nielsen. Here, I'll set them on the kitchen table. <clears throat> Why, thank you. What's got into you? Nothing, Vinny. Not a thing. I'm just feeling my old self is all. Ah, beautiful morning, huh? Took a walk into town. You should try it sometime. Lunch will be ready soon. That's nice. How about a game of checkers, Ed? Can't. Let's pretend is on in five minutes. Then there's Kay Kaiser, and then... Would, would you like some lemonade? You must be tired. Nope, not me. Hey, what's that funny-looking thing? Hmm? In the corner, with the rabbit ears on top. Oh, I remember. It's that unnecessary invention called the television. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you something. When I first started listening to the radio again, I kept wondering what happened to the picture tube. Then I remembered. The picture's right here, between your own ears. Radio. Radio. I'll tell you. Radio is a world that has to be believed to be seen. Hmm? Now, let's pretend. Let's see. What? Who's been in here? Do you know anything about it? About what? Uh, someone's been in my room. Where is it? Where is it? Calm down. Where? Ed. Listen to me for a moment. Where's my radio? You tell me you're so help me, so help me. Ed, 
Ed, I'll tell you. I should have known it was you. You took away the one thing that meant anything to me. Well, what have you done with it? The junk dealer. What? We were only trying to... You gave my radio to the junk dealer? Ed, wait. Please. Let me explain. Look at all this. Ye old junk shop. You help you? You'd better hope you can. What's that supposed to mean? It means you've got something of value here. If I can find it. It's all valuable. <laughs> oh, is that right? I see. Victrolas, washboards, Broken lamps, old National Geographics. <laughs> Must be worth a fortune, eh? Do a land office business, do you? People breaking down the doors to get in? Huh? Huh? All depends on what you're looking for. Uh, get many radios? Sure do. What's your pleasure? Philco, Crossley, RCA, Victor, take your pick. Great pieces of furniture. I'm looking for one in particular. Which brand? I'll know it when I see it. Had it for years and years. Big floor standing model. Fabric grill. A big yellow dial that lights up. Ever see one like that? Huh? Plenty. Take a look around. I shouldn't have to look far. You just got it in today. Say... What are you getting at, mister? My radio, that's what. Don't tell me you got more than one in this morning. Oh, I get it. Change your mind, did you? No, I didn't change my mind. I never made the decision in the first place. There, there it is. Move that dirty old box off the top. Careful, fella. It's not yours now. No, it's yours, is it? Don't even have a price tag on it yet. Oh, say 50 bucks. <clears throat> Let me get this straight. A couple of misguided friends think they're doing me a favor. You hold it for a couple hours, and you want to charge me 50 bucks for the privilege? Make it 40. 40 dollars for my own property. Not anymore. And you're determined to make a profit, huh? I might go down to 25. You might go down to zero, because that's what it costs you. Nothing. A man's got to make a living. Oh, he does, huh? Well, not this time. Consider it a public service. Returning property to its rightful owner, that's what. Hey, what do you think you're doing? Well, just what do you think? Taking what's mine. My man picked it up in the truck, signed a receipt. Yes, but I didn't get the receipt. And there's only one rightful owner, me. Now, if you don't want to get reported for trafficking in stolen goods, you'll put it right back on that truck and deliver it to the same address by the end of the day, no later. Carry it upstairs and install it exactly where you found it. Is that clear? Ten dollars for the delivery. Uh, where's the phone? I'll call the cops right now. Uh, hold on, old man. And it better still work. I'll tell you that. If it don't, it's gonna cost you. It's gonna cost a lot of people. Right in there, at the foot of the bed. This okay? And don't forget to plug it in. Uh, sure, pal. Uh, why don't I polish it up while I'm at it? That'll do. Now get out. No tip, I guess. I've got a tip for you. Keep your nose out of other people's business. Go on. Go! This better work. Right on the beam, it's the Tommy Dorsey Show. Oh, oh thank God. Vinny! Vinny! Vinny, come up here quick. I've got it. I've really got it now. 
Ed, what's the matter? What's wrong? Vinny, do you hear that? What? The radio. Come up here. December 7th, 1941. America is at war. Static, starring Stan Freebird with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont from a story by O.C. Rich. Heard in the cast were Anne Whitney, David Darlow, Ellie Weingart, Bernie Landis, Christian Stolte, Jeff Lupiton, Doug James, Carl Amari, Alyssa Fraden, and Elizabeth Lido. Original radio excerpts heard in this Twilight Zone episode provided by the First Generation Radio Archives, preserving radio's past for the future at www.radioarchives.org. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors, and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Audio editing, sound design, foley effects, and mix for the Twilight Zone radio dramas are by Cerny American creatives Craig Lee, Michael Slaybach, Bob Benson, and Jason Rizzo. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. This is Doug James, Transponding. The Tommy Dorsey Show was brought to you men and women in the armed forces of the United Nations by the Special Service Division of the War Department of the United States. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. 
You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Hurry. We can't miss the monorail. Make way! Coming through! Keep pushing. I'm doing my best. Ah, wait a minute. One of the wheels fell off again. Uh, get it while I hold him up. Okay, okay, I got it. Here, here. Uh, let me slip it back on. Hurry. Excuse me, conductor? Yeah? Is this the monorail to Kansas? Sure is. Better get on board, though. But you know, uh, you, you should have checked your cargo. Uh-huh. This ain't cargo. It's a B-2. A what? A B-2. Whoa! What is that? Is that a man? Is, is he alive? That, sir, is a B-2 boxing robot. Wow. He sure looks real. Yeah, he looks even better in the ring when we activate him. Westbound monorail will be departing on track 10 in one minute. Uh, conductor, we bought a ticket for him. Uh, here you go. He's fighting tonight. We have to keep an eye on him so he doesn't get damaged. Well, he's got a ticket, so, uh, so get him on board. We're pulling out. Sure thing. Okay, I got this end. Okay, ready? One, two, three, lift. Come on. <sighs> Oh, How much does this guy weigh? Oh. Oh. Ah, next time, let's get a lightweight instead of a light heavyweight. <laughs> All aboard! Here's our seats, C11 through 13. Let's sit him down in the window seat. He gets the window seat? Get him seated. Hey, you hear him squeaking? Not only is he saying he doesn't want the window seat, he's saying he doesn't want to sit down, period. He needs his silicone teflonic joint lubricant changed. We'll pick up some as soon as we get paid. Well, first we gotta find some. Uh, shouldn't be no problem. Man, I told you, they don't make it anymore. Well, that's crazy. Still plenty of B2s in the business. Name one. This one. We'll find some. <sighs> All right. Wow. Sure is hot. It'll be hotter where we're going. Wish I had a beer. Well, it wouldn't do you any good. I already had three, and I'm still thirsty. Not an Axel. He don't need a thing. Never complains. Then, uh, why does he squeak so much? You think he'll be all right? Yeah, if he doesn't get hit. Can it, Paul? Hey, come on, no use glaring at me, Steel. You know he's shot. That ain't true. A little overhaul is all he needs. Well, yeah, a little ten grand overhaul with parts they don't make anymore. <laughs> when you talk, you think he's ready for the scrap heap. Ain't he? No, he ain't. Just because he's a little old? Well, try ancient. Plenty of fight left in him. Well, you think he's okay or not? Steel. I don't know. And that's a fact. He needs work. Like what? Well, for starters, the trigger in his left arm. It's been rewired so many times it's just about had it. He's got no protection left on that side. Plus, his eye lens is cracked. 
Leg cables are worn out, no tension left in him. Even his gyro's off, not to mention he needs silicone teflonic joint lubricant. We'll get him some. Where? I'll find it. <sighs> yeah, after the fight. What about during? He'll be creaking around that ring like, like an antique steam shovel. This ain't 1940. It's 2040. It'd be a miracle if he goes two rounds. It ain't that bad, Bo. Actually, it's worse. Wait till the promoter gets a load of battling Maxo from Philadelphia. We'll be lucky to get monorail fare back home. The contract is signed. You can't back out. Well, the contract is for battling Maxo in fighting shape. Not this bucket of antique hardware. Just you wait. Maxo's gonna do all right. Against the B-7? It's just an experimental B-7. It ain't got the bugs worked out yet. That's why they took a bout with us. Well, after tonight, battling Maxo's new nickname will be One Round Maxo. That's enough. He's been doing okay for five years, and he'll keep doing okay. So what if he needs a little work? So what? If he wins some money, we can get him all the silicone teflonic lubricant he needs, and a new trigger for his left arm, and new leg cables, and everything. He's gonna do all right. You'll see. Maxo's gonna do just fine. Sports item from the not-too-distant future. Battling Maxo, B2, light heavyweight, accompanied by his manager and handler on his way to Maynard, Kansas for a scheduled 10-round bout. Battling Maxo is a robot, or to be exact, an android, resembling a human being. Only androids have been permitted in the ring since prize fighting was legally abolished. This is the story of that 10-round bout. More specifically, the story of two men shortly to face the remorseless truth that no law can be passed to abolish cruelty or desperate need, or, for that matter, blind animal courage. Location for the facing of said truth? A small, smoke-filled arena just this side of the Twilight Zone. And now The Twilight Zone and our story, Steel, starring Lou Gossett Jr. with Stacy Keach as your narrator. You were right. It is out of here. Told you. Hey, taxi. What are you doing? It's six o'clock already. We better get a move on. Well, we got no money for a taxi. We can't push him through the streets. We don't even know where the stadium is. What are we supposed to eat with then? We'll be loaded after the fight. I'll buy you a steak three inches thick. Hey, fellas, need a taxi? Uh, thanks, pal, but uh, no thanks. Oh, come on, where are you headed? Stadium. The stadium? That's six miles away. You can't push that thing that far. He's right. I told you, we ain't got the dough. Ooh-wee, what is that thing? A boxing robot. Oh, man. He is something. I've never seen one up close. Come on, I'll drive you to the stadium for free. It's on my way. You want a hand with it? Careful. He's got a bum wheel on the bottom. Ah. He's real heavy. Ah. Oh boy, this is a real honor taking a fighter to the stadium. Well, thanks. Hey, which robot is that? This? Is battling Maxo from Philly. Maybe you heard of him? Uh, no, but, you know, I'm no expert. He was almost light heavyweight champ once. No kid. Yes, sir. You ever heard of Dimsy the Rock? Uh, don't think Steve, so. Why don't you give it a rest? Dimsy was number three in the light heavy ranks, on his way to the top. Well, my boy took him out in the fourth round. Left cross, bang! Almost put Dimsy to the ropes. It was beautiful. No kid. Yeah. Used to be in the game myself. Night heavy. Before they passed the law. Called me Steel Kelly because I never got knocked down. Not once. I was number nine in the ranks before they outlawed the human boxers. Wow. That's something. Anyway, tonight, 
It's gonna be a good fight. Driver, uh, have you ever seen a fighter from here called The Flash? Oh, yeah, you bet. Man, that is one good fighter. One seven straight, he's riding a bullet to the top of the rankings. You just wait. Matter of fact, he's he's fighting tonight, too. They're bringing in some heat from uh, back east to fight. Flash is gonna slaughter him. Oh, where'd you guys say you were from? Philly. Oh, oh, man, you're not. We are. Oh, look, I didn't mean nothing. I didn't know. Skip it. Forget it, pal. Doesn't matter. You're right. Why don't you shut your trap for once? Look, fellas, I'm sorry. Well, you guys need anything else? Anything. Do you know where we can get some silicone teflonic joint lubricant? So, Oh. <laughs> Do they still make that stuff? No, they don't. Uh, just trying to be funny. They haven't made it in years. Hey, look. They got the fight card posted for tonight. You guys are the third fight out of seven. Woo! Your fighter must be pretty good. Oh, the Maynard Flash, B7, versus Battling Maxo, B2. You got a B2? Yeah. Well, uh, at least you're not at the bottom of the card. We do have that going for us. Drop it, Bo. You'll see. You'll all see. It's nothing personal, Kelly. It's just the way it is. Well, It'd be a miracle if he wins. Hey, hey, if he does, can I have his autograph? Sure thing. Thanks for the lift. Good luck, fellas. You're gonna need it. Steel, you know, Maxo's not programmed to sign autographs, right? I know. Let's roll him inside. The wheel fell off again. I, I, I got it. I got it. Keep pushing. Put it back on. Well, what's the point? Put it back on. The office is just down the hall. I want Maxwell to make a good first impression. Well, let's just hope his head don't fall off next. Keep quiet and let me do all the talking. What's wrong with you anyway? After seven months, we finally get about and all you can do is complain? What's <laughs> about? We're in Maynard, Kansas. What's this, the prize-fighting center of the nation? It's a start, ain't it? It's our first step on the combat trail. The purse will give us enough to get Maxwell back in shape. And if we win, it would mean we get fights all over the place. Oh, spare me. We don't have a chance. I don't get you. He's our fighter, and we stick behind him no matter what. Why are you writing him off before he even gets in the ring? Don't you want him to win? I'm a Class A mechanic, Steel. I'm not some daydreaming kid. I know machinery. We got a piece of dead iron here. Technology always moves forward. We got a B2, not a B7. No way he's gonna win this fight. Shh, keep your voice down. It's simple engineering, that's all. Maxo will be lucky to get out of the ring with his head on. Bull! It's an experimental B-7. It's probably full of bugs, full of them. They always are. That's why they take a first fight in the middle of nowhere. We've got a chance. Yeah, yeah, sure we do. Remember, keep your mouth shut. Yeah. Mr. Nolan? Nah, I'm Oscar. Mr. Nolan will be back in a couple of minutes. I'm still Kelly. Battling Maxwell's owner. Oh, yeah, I heard of you. You were one of the last human fighters. Hmm. This is Paul, Maxwell's mechanic. Hi. It was getting late. We were wondering if you'd make it. Never missed a fight. Yeah, pull up a chair. I got some paperwork to do. Thanks. What was that? Uh, it was this folding chair. Uh, okay. Sign on all the X's. You heard of my fighter, Mr. Oscar? What's his name? Battling Maxo. You must have heard about him. Can't say as I have. He knocked out Dimsy the Rock, a ranked fighter in his prime. Uh-huh. There's a sign here, too. It was all in the East Coast papers. New York, Boston, Philly. Got quite a spread. Biggest upset of the year. Good. Initial here. And here. And a couple more here. Right here. 
And over there. He's a B2, you know. That's the second model Mauling put out. The B2 is one of the best fighters they ever built. The best, in my opinion. Maxim was still going strong. I don't go for these new ones, you know. The ones made out of steel, aluminum with all the doodads. Too flimsy. Nothing solid. Now, nah, Marlin don't make them like Maxo anymore. Oscar, who are these guys? Mr. Nolan. I'm Steel Kelly. And this is... Is that your fighter? Yes, sir. Battling Maxo. Fighter in shape? You bet. Prime condition. Paul, my mechanic here, is a Class A mechanic, and he took Maxo apart and put him back together just before we left Philly. Oscar, cigar me. Yes, sir. Ain't you forgetting something? Huh? Like me. Oh, yes, sir. You know, Steel, you were lucky to get this bout. We ain't staged a bout with nothing less than a B4 in... Must be two years now. The fighter we had scheduled got run over by a truck in a loading dock at a stadium in Detroit. I needed somebody on short notice. So that's the only reason you're here. You got nothing to worry about, Mr. Nolan. My fight is in shape. He's the one that knocked out Dimsy the Rock in Madison Square Garden a few years ago. Maybe you... I just want a good fight. And you'll get it. Maxwell's in top shape. No first round knockout. No, no, nothing like that. People pay to see action. Do you have a prep room we could use? We want to check him over and make sure he's perfect. Down the hall, third door on the right, next to the janitor's closet. Thanks. Your bout is at nine. Got it. You won't be sorry, Mr. Nolan. I don't like guys that are late. Understood. Paul, let's get Maxo to his prep room. Uh, Mr. Nolan... I was wondering... I know what you're wondering. You get your money after you deliver a good fight, not before. Uh, no problem. We'll get him ready. And steal. Yeah? Don't slam the door. I hate loud noises. Come on. I'm coming. Oh, my stomach hurts. Don't be scared. It'll be okay. Oh, I ain't scared. I'm hungry. I haven't eaten all day. How could you think of food at a time like this? This one counts. It's our chance for a comeback. We've got to get him in that room. We've got to check him out real good. What time is it? I'm busy pushing. Come on, check your own watch. I don't have a watch anymore. I had to pawn it. The one your wife gave you? Ex-wife. Hey, look, uh, we got two hours before the bout begins. Have we got time for a sandwich? I want you to check him out real good. His arm... His gyro, everything. What for? Did you hear me? Yeah, but I work better on a full stomach. You get to work. I'll get you a sandwich. Max is going to take that B7, but good. Excuse me, sir. Do you know where I can get a Philly cheese steak? Uh, try Philadelphia. <laughs> Just kidding you. Oh, there's a nice little place around the corner, but I doubt they'll have something like that there. You new in town? Yeah. Where you from? Philly. Well, that figures. What brings you to town? I got a fighter in a third fight tonight. Really? Well, you must have one good fighter if you brought him halfway around the country for a fight. He's a great fighter. He's fighting an experimental B-7. A B-7 fighting a B-6 could be interesting. He's not a B-6. A uh, five might stand a chance. He's better than a five. He's a classic B-2. A B-2? Oh, well, I've never seen one of those, but I hear they're great bleeders. <laughs> Good luck. Oh, by the way, at the diner, I'll recommend the roast beef on rye. Bloody rare. <laughs> We got a big crowd out there tonight. Well, what took you so long, Steel? I'm starving. 
Here's your sandwich. How's Maxo? What kind of sandwich did you get? Roast beef on rye. Well done with silicone teflonic joint lubricant on the side. What? It's mayo. <laughs> How's Maxo? Uh, did you get me a pickle? How's Maxo? I love dill pickles. Oh, oh, here it is. Okay, well, the answer to your question is, Maxo is still big as life and twice as ugly. I cleaned him up a little, though. The B2s always looked real. Look at him. You'd swear he was real, wouldn't you? He's got that natural-looking flesh, great muscle tone. He could have been a male model if he wasn't a fighter. Come on, get to it. Well, outwardly, he hasn't aged a bit. His hair's still curly. <laughs> Just like mine. Yeah, but he's got a little bit more than you do. Hey. When I had a maid, they gave him my good looks. Mm. <laughs> That's a matter of opinion. Quit stalling. And what's the good news? Well, that was the good news. And, uh, well, I also turned his power source on, and that's still good. So I ran a diagnostic check. And? And everything that was bad when we left Philly is still bad. There's got to be something we can do. Open him up again. <sighs> you got a thing for bad news, don't you? Come on, Paul. Earn your keep. That's what you're here for. <sighs> I'm not a miracle worker. I'm just a mechanic. Well, what do you want to do, retire? Oh, fat chance of that. Then quit stalling and open the control box. <sighs> all right, all right. Uh, let me let me power him up first, so so we can walk over to the table. He's too heavy. Okay, come on. Head up, boy. There you go. All right. Okay. Here, help me get him up on the table. <sighs> <sighs> That's my boy. The doctor will see you now. Lift his arm. What's all that corrosion around the excess panel? Dried sweat. All the B2s sweat like bulls. It's nothing to worry about, though. You hear that, Maxo? Nothing to worry about. We'll get you cleaned up. Hand me that probe. Well? Well, all electronic systems are functional. Huh. Well, I hope the circuit board doesn't blow. Why should it? Well, uh, if you recall, he got knocked out of the ring in the last fight eight months ago. It jarred all his electronic systems. The connections are all still operational, but, boy, I wish I had more time to manually double-check the connections. Well, you don't have time. Sometimes you just have to suck it up and have some faith in your fighter. All right, then. Okay. Well, I activated all his systems. Keep your fingers crossed. And just hope nothing blows. See, his breathing sounds good. His arms are creaky, but uh, they'll quiet down when he warms up. Look, beads of sweat are forming on his forehead. I told you these were good sweaters. Can you hear me, Max? Relax, boy. Let him warm up good, Paul. I'll tell you, the, the mechanical part is what worries me. I need to check his reflexes. Uh, look, Steel, go put on the gloves, will ya? Let's see if, uh, if he can zero in on you, okay? Maxo, get your legs loosened up. Move around a little. Loosen up your jab, big boy. Don't rush him. If it don't work now, it won't work in the ring. All right. But just enough to check the jab. Set his controls so he doesn't count a punch. Good idea. Okay, hold still, Maxo. This won't hurt a bit. Okay. That's as low as it'll go. I, I don't think your systems like it, though. You know, if that cracked eye quits, he'll be very vulnerable. Look, Steel, start circling him and see if he can follow you. Come on, Nexo. Look at me. I'm moving in. I want to get you. Block my punch. Oh, 
Man, they're gonna hear that in the back row. That's good enough for now. We know it works. Oh, Steel. He's gonna get more than one punch thrown at his head. He'll outdance him to keep clear. Give him more power to his legs. Those cables are bandy. I, I don't like doing this. There's not much tension left in him. He seems to be moving all right. Yeah, but, boy, a heavy wind might knock him over. Put him on automatic. Oh, no, 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 come on. Let's not push our luck. Do it. All right. Here goes nothing. Maxo, gloves up. That's it. Beautiful. Now, let's see if he can move in for the kill. Kelly, steal. No. Leave his systems on defense. He might have a couple of rounds if we leave him on defense. It, it takes less energy. No. He's gonna get beat to pieces if we let him move in. No. Do it. Will you use your head? He's a B2. He's gonna get slaughtered anyway. Look, if we let him go on defense, we might be able to salvage him for pieces. Nolan paid to see him on offense. It's in the contract. Activate his jab. Come on, it doesn't have any lubricant in it. Do as I say. All right. Activating the jab. Shut him down. Shut him down. What did you do? What did I do? I told you to take it easy. It was on the lowest setting. I told you to check the arm. What's the matter with you? So help me if you broke that arm. If I broke it? Yeah, you. Look. Steel, I kept this heap running on borrowed time for three years now. Before we left Philly, I told you we needed to fix things and replace parts. We couldn't let this chance go. Please, open them up and see what you can do. Steel, you know, try finding another mechanic that could have kept this antique working as long as I have. I dare you to. Please, see what you can do. Hold the arm up. Oh, man. Oh, no. Come here. Take a look. You see that? The trigger spring came right off. Can you reattach it? I can try, but... You know, it's just gonna pop off again. That's what happens when a joint doesn't get enough lubricant. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to stretch it. Oh, oh, nuts. Oh. Oh. Well, that's that. Oh, no. One jab too many. We, we gotta do something. What? F fix it. I can't. You, you, you just can't fix a spring. Once it can't spring, it ain't a spring no more. I told you it was getting ready to break. And to get a new one last year. He's got to be fixed if he's going out there, and he has to go out there. They fronted me the monorail fare. Steel. He needs a new spring. Nothing else will work. Well, can't you get another spring? Where? They don't make them anymore. It's a special spring. I can't just take one off a washing machine or something. Quiet. Yeah? Ten minutes! Something wrong? Oscar. Can you make up about the one after the next one? Mr. Nolan does not make changes. We just need a little bit more time to make some last-minute adjustments. Sorry, pal. No can do. We want him tip-top, don't you? Nolan's got you on next. Well, what's the difference? Third? Second? It's all the same, right? Second's the semi-main. That ain't for a B-2. Maybe some B-2s, but this one... They want to see a fight, not an execution. But I'm telling you... Ten minutes or you're out of here. Be a shame after coming all this way. Right, boys? Uh, right. Well then, I I guess that means... That we'll have to hurry. You heard the man? I heard him. But it's over. We're finished. No, we're not. There must be a way. What? Sell them for scrap and get a couple of monorail tickets? We hung in there as long as we could, but this is it. I have to hand it to you, Steel. You wouldn't give up. Quiet. I'm thinking. 
There is one way it just might work. What might work? If they don't watch the fights. Who? Nolan and Oscar. Maybe they don't even come out of their office. What are you talking about? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. You can't do this. Get the trunks and robe off Maxo. I'll change my clothes. Steel, you are out of your mind. You can't go into a ring against a B7. I, I used to be pretty good. I can get through a couple of rounds. Just bob and weave through a punch every once in a while. You'll get killed! You heard that, Tub. We deliver a fight or we don't get paid. Steel, come on. You're never gonna get away with this. They won't let you. Who's gonna stop me? You, you can't make them think you're... Steel, for God's sake! I can if you help me. Nobody here knows what Maxo looks like. If Nolan and the other guys don't watch the bout, we'll be all right. Steel. The crowd won't have a clue. Be too sweat, bleed, and bruise just like the new ones. Give me the boots. Look, I got an idea. You know what I can do? I can wire my sister. She'll send us to Dota, get us back east. Tape up my hands. Steel? Steel. Steel. I got another idea. Wait, wait. Look, hold still. I got... I know a guy in Philly wants to sell a B5 cheap. We could hustle up the cash and, uh, you Concentrate know... Concentrate on wrapping my hands. If you don't take them right, I could break them on the first punch. Steel, this is suicide. It's a B7 out there. Don't you get it? It's a B7. You're gonna get mangled. Quit talking. I gotta do this. Hurry up. There's no more time, Paul. Put the gloves on me. Oh. I don't want to do this. Please, please don't do this. Look, let me go into the office and let me talk to them. Maybe, 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 maybe they'll understand. No, they won't understand. So you're not going anywhere. You're going to stay right here and lace up my gloves. Ow! You'll help me or I'll beat your brains out on this wall. But you're going to get killed, Steel. Then I'll get killed. Better me than you, right? I got us in this mess. I'll get us out of it. Get there, heap out of there. You heard the boss. Lace my gloves up tight. We gotta fight. That's it, Paul. Tie him off tight. Oh, you really wanna go through with this? Yes. Let's go. How do I look? Like a broken down old fighter. So I'll pass for a B2? That's what I said. You look like a broken down old fighter. Here. Well, let me uh, let me put a towel around your neck. Pull up the hood on my robe, too. I'll keep my head down so they can't see my face. You better do that in the ring, too. Let's go. Late. Uh, just, uh, just gamesmanship, Mr. Nolan. Making a late entrance, trying to get Maxo the edge. Just like the old days, huh? Maybe I underestimated you guys. Nice robe. <laughs> it's old school, you know? Genuine set. No more stalling. I got a full house out there. Right. Come on, Maxo. Let's show him what you can do. Hey! What? Where's that? What's what's his name? The, the owner. Uh, oh, you mean Steel? Uh, he's already out there. We're one step ahead of you. <laughs> I didn't see him pass my door. Well, he went a few minutes ago. He likes to check out the crowd. You boys better put on a good show. Yes, sir. Let me know when we get to the stairs. I got sweat in my eyes. I, I, I should have told him. If you had, I'd killed you. First step. Careful, Steel. Grab my waist. Wipe my eyes. Can't see my feet. Gee, Steel. You're already sweating like a pig. You'll have to towel me off between rounds, just like a real B2. Between what rounds? You won't last long. Whose side are you on? Steel, you're not up against some punch-drunk fighter. You're up against a machine. I said shut up. You're not going to get away. They ain't seen a B2 in years. Nolan said so. Steel, you're never gonna pull this off. 
This is your last chance. Just get me to the rain. Okay, Steel, here's the ring. Two steps to the apron. I can see them. Okay, I'm gonna pull the ropes apart. Hey, send them back to the junkyard! Ladies and gentlemen, the next contest of the evening, a 10-round light heavyweight bout featuring out of Philadelphia, the B2 Battle in Maxo! I'm gonna take your rope off now. Keep looking at your shoes. Try not to blink. Stay in the corner. Of course I will. Breathe through your mouth. Come on. Little breaths. Come on. Breathe. Not too fast. I need a drink. Sorry. The water bottle is filled with B7 hydraulic fluid. And now, entering the ring, his opponent, our own B7, the prize. Of Kansas, the winner! Flag! You're the first middle! What's he doing? He's jumping up and down on his toes. I never saw a robot do that before. Must be a new gimmick. Big deal. Well, this ain't kickboxing, so he's not scaring me. You should be scared, Steel. Come on. Get out of the ring now while you still can. You get out, pal. See you at the end of the round. Steel, stay away from him. And there's the bell. The fighters come out of their corners quickly. They size each other up. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh. the flash landed a vicious right. Ooh, and another! Uh, and another! Come on, get away from him! Get away from him! Maxo backs away! Come on, I got money on this fight! Come on, I can take it! Uh, the Flash is the aggressor! Uh, he backs Maxo into the ropes! Hey! No holding! Get your V2 off the ropes! See how you like this! Bring it, Jabo! I can take it! Oh. Uh, there's thunder in those punches! Maxo backpedals. Ah. The flash swings wildly. If he lands one of those, he'll take Maxo's head off. The flash is coming in for the kill. Whoa. That one was lethal. Stop the fight. Come on, somebody stop it. Stop oh. it. Maxo is down. It's over. It's over. It's over. Come on, stay down. It's over. Just get me up. I've never been knocked down. I'm Steel Kelly. In the time of one minute and 22 seconds of the first round, your winner, the Maynard Flash! Ah, that's it. Haul him out of here. Move it. Is he broken or what? No, no, no. He's okay. Just a second, okay? Steel, can you stand? Come on. Talk to me. Are you bleeding? Put the towel over my face. Yeah, sure. Get the robe. What? The robe. I want to walk out of here like a man. Come on, before they start throwing things. Let me help you up on the table. Come on. Here we go. Sit. Come on. Steel, I'm gonna try and get you some ice. Forget it. Put your eye. It'll be all right. I think right now you need a good stick man instead of a mechanic. That eye looks terrible. Actually, I, I, I think you need a doctor. Oh, man. You are really a mess. I, 
I don't have nothing with me. I no needle, no thread, no iodine. That's not what I need. All I got is a couple of Maxo shop rags. Well, maybe we can stop the bleeding with them. Go. What? Where? Go get the money. But I can't leave you. Now. You... All right, all right, all right. Look, uh, but just, just lie down. I, I don't even try to move. Okay, I'll, I'll be, I'll be right back. Mr. Nolan? Over that quick, huh? Yeah, I guess. Uh, Maxo did the best he could, though, Mr. Nolan. Your strategy didn't work. Did you really think arriving in the ring late would upset a robot? <laughs> well, you never know. Uh, but that B7, it must have been tweaked or something. I, I never saw anything like that. Me neither, and I hope I never do again. Get your boy and clear out. Yeah, we will. Only first... I... You heard the boss. Well, you see, my boss Hiding said... Hiding out, huh? Don't even want to show his face. <sighs> Something like that. Come here. What? Mr. Nolan says you should come over to the desk. Okay. I want you to deliver something to your boss. Yeah? Piece of advice. Can you handle that? Yes. Now listen real close. You get it? Steel. Well? Here. Is this all he gave you? Where's the rest? Well, that's what he gave me. This is just enough for monorail fare back to Philly. Well, he said he wouldn't pay for a one-rounder. What do you mean? Come on, take it easy. No, 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 no. Here, let me, let me, let me see your hand. Oh, man. Did you break your wrist? He can't do that. Steel, that's it. He's got a bunch of thugs in that room now. I'll go in there. You can't. If he sees you, he'll know what you've done. But the contract says... I'm supposed to deliver a message to you, too. He said to tell you. You're lucky he doesn't run us out of town on a monorail. And if you ever show your face in town again, he said you won't be so lucky the next time. Help me up. Right, just just stay seated. I'll, I'll get you a drink of water. I don't need water. That's all there is. Look, we got to get that wrist set. I, I can make you a sling. For now, just try not to move it. We'll go back by bus. By bus? Come on, you're not listening to me. Look, just, just hold still. If we go by bus, we'll save money. We'd have enough to get Maxo a, a new trigger spring and a... And a lens for his eye and some silicone teflonic joint lubricant. He'll be good as new again. <laughs> all right, Steele. Anything you say. Then we'll be all set. Maxo will be in shape again and, and we can get us some, some decent bouts. That's all he needs. A little work, huh? That'll shape him up. We'll show him what a top B2 can do. Old Max will show him. He'll show everybody. Right? Right? <laughs> sure, Steel. Sure. Now let's, uh, let's get out of here. Take it slow. I can walk. I know you can. You're a tough guy. But put your hand on my shoulder. That's it. Don't worry about Max. I can pull.
Portrait of the Losing Side. Proof positive that you can't outpunch machinery. Proof also of something else. That no matter what the future brings, man's capacity to rise to the occasion will remain unaltered. His potential for tenacity and optimism continues, as always, to outfight, outpoint, and outlive any and all changes made by his society. For which three cheers and a unanimous decision rendered in the twilight zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Steel, starring Lou Gossett Jr. with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and Joby Cerny, and written for The Twilight Zone by Richard Matheson. Heard in the cast were Joby Cerny, Danny Goldring, Rich Kominich, Sam Darrance, Pat Fraley, Tim Dadavo, and Jennifer Joy. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Joby Cerny for Falcon Picture Group. Custom Foley effects, sound design, and mixing are done in the Cerny American Sound of Picture Theater by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Matt Sorrow, Tim Cerny, and Todd Beyer. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Have them water the horses first. Some of them need chewing. Well, there's a blacksmith shop. But no blacksmith. Or anybody else, for that matter. Looks like they all just cut and run. Uh, It's Johnny Reb for you. Leave nothing behind. I got a feeling, though. Don't you, Major? What feeling? Like eyes. Eyes where? That's just it, sir. I don't know. But I sure got the feeling. On the back of my neck. Like we're being watched. Maybe, Maybe this town ain't so empty after all. No place to hide. A few stores, church. If there's a sniper up there, he'd be a fool to take on this many. Well, it's like you say, sir. Johnny Reb's got more guts than brains. Take two men and look around. Miller! Sir? Check out the general store. Davis, you take the livery stable. Ain't nothing there, Captain. I can see it from here. You make certain, son. That's an order. (sighs) Yes, sir. The rest of you, see to your mounts. Well, I'll be. Well, you look at that. What is it? Captain, I think you better see this. Hold your fire. What do you see? Miller. Miller? Davis? What happened to them? I don't know, Major. They went around that storefront at the end. (laughs) What the... The time is 1863. 
The place is a valley in the state of Virginia. The event is a mass bloodletting known as the Civil War, a tragic time when the country split into two fragments, each fragment deeming itself a separate nation. It's been a long and brutal slaughter with no end in sight, and those who survive have learned to expect the unexpected. But in just a moment, the captain and the major and their entire company will make contact with an enemy they cannot defeat in an outpost not found on any military map. An outpost found only in the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, Still Valley, starring Adam West with Stacy Keach as your narrator. You want more coffee, Private? That what it is. Chicory, maybe a little sawdust, but it's hot. Obliged. I've tasted worse. I just don't remember where. What is it? Quiet. You hear something down there? Thought I did. Yanks? Maybe. Whatever it was, I don't hear it anymore. I didn't hear nothing. You never hear nothing, Dogger. Just sit in your duff and wait it out. Where's your carbine, soldier? Huh? Oh, it's, uh, it's over there. A lot of good it'll do you laying on the ground. What do you mean? What if the Yanks showed up? What do you do? If the Yanks was here? You reckon you know how to work this thing? Yeah, I know how, all right. And if you pull the trigger, you reckon it'll fire? I reckon. Then show me. Hey, what's the idea? The idea is you aren't a right arm to me or a left arm. You're just some extra baggage that breathes through his mouth and splits half my rations. You mad about something? Fed up is more like a dogger. When do you figure to shape up by the end of the war? I do my part. Yeah, like an army mule. Why don't you just go down there and give up? The Yanks will treat you real good while General Bobby Lee's off fighting the war for you. I didn't used to be like this. Yeah? When did you up and change? I was at the second Manassas. I think that's where... where... come to me sudden like. What did? It's like this, Paradine. I had my two brothers there. One of them was 15 years old, that's all. 15! I was right alongside him, going up a hill. A mini ball came out of nowhere, hit him dead center. Took him three hours to die. He was just a kid. Just a little, screaming kid. That was my brother, Phil. My older brother, Kearney. He was dead the next morning. Wanted to be a preacher. Always talking about the gospel. Words of Luke. Words of John. Words of the prophets. He ran out of words. And God run out on him. But you... You don't have a nerve in your body, I guess. Oh, I got him. Just as many as you from head to boots. But I don't concern myself as much as you. You're worrying about dead men and lost battles. That's just too much area to fret in. Then what do you worry about? I'm worrying about two scouts on a mission. Us. And a piece of dirty brown paper with orders written on it. It says right here. It says the Yanks are going to take up a position in Chanow Valley. We're supposed to scout them out. See if we run into their videttes. And then check back the minute they get into that town down there. You hear him again? Sure do. Yanks? Yanks, probably. Horses, positive. How many? Just a patrol, I figure. Maybe 20, 30 men in all. That's funny. What is? Listen. I don't hear nothing. I know you don't, but I heard horses, and they come from down there in the valley. They're Yanks. There isn't any question about it. How come you think that? Because everybody else in these parts is packed up and moved out before the fighting gets here. Come away from the edge, Joe. This ain't no place to stand out in the open. If they are Yanks, they'd be in that town already. It'd be as noisy as a county fair. But now, there ain't a sound anymore. Maybe they've gone away. 
I reckon I better get down there and take a closer look. I wouldn't do that. I know you wouldn't. Joe! Joe! You don't need to go! We got orders. Let's pull out. And just right away. Both of us. You wait here with your horse if I don't come back. Listen, Joe. We know they're down there, right? You heard him. Well, we found out what we had to find out. Where they are. The Yanks are in the valley. So now we go back and report it. What's the point of... The point is, we gotta count their heads and their horses and their guns. We gotta look at their regimental numbers so our boys will know what's coming. That's enough point for you, Private? I don't care no more. I don't care. I got only one big mission left, and that's to stay alive. I say we go down there and wave an undershirt and throw down our rifles and... <laughs> Why'd you hit me? Mr. Dogger. I extend my sympathy so long as you keep your yellow inside. But the minute it crawls over to me and tries to climb up on my horse, too, then I withdraw my sympathy. You understand? Yeah. I understand. I pledge everything I got to this war, and all I get is the back of your hand. So far, you and me have pledged nothing to the Confederacy except maybe... Empty bellies and lack of sleep. But a couple of hundred thousand others, including your own brothers, pledged a whole lot more. And now you're making it appear they did it for nothing. Now you pick up your rifle and stand at the ready. I got it. Good. If you hear a shot, that means they're down there in force. And you get back to camp at a fast gallop. Tell the lieutenant what happened. If you don't hear from me in 15 minutes, get back there anyway. You really going alone? Just me and this brave horse. For want of anything else. Easy, horse, easy. That's only church bells. Must be the wind. Has to be the wind. Who's there? Come on out with your hands up. If you're in there, why don't you show yourself? You a yellow yank, that it? I got you, drop you. Where'd you go? If there's a yellow Yankee hiding in one of these stores, you better come out right now. I'm taking you prisoner. <laughs> Put your hands in the air, or I'm coming in. I'll blow you to kingdom come, I swear. Ain't no Yankees, just me. You come close to dying, old man. Did I now? You better start talking fast. What would you like to hear? Some answers. Tell me who you are and what you're doing here. I was about to ask you the same question, son. When I first seen you come up the street, I thought you was a Yank. You don't know how close you come to dying. What were you gonna use, Grandpa? You're not carrying a gun. Don't need a gun. Been doing just fine without one. What you got a hold of there? What's it look like? You have seen a book before, haven't you? That Bible's pretty heavy to throw, all right. I reckon you could knock out the whole Union Army with it. No, oh, this ain't no Bible. <laughs> and I wasn't aiming to throw it. Just use it, like I used it on them. On who? The Yanks. I took them all out, every last one. Leastways, every one that rode in here. Sure you did, Grandpa? Oh, I done it all right. What'd you do, read to them? Not to them. Adam. And they turned tail, just like that. Nope. It was the town folk packed up and left. Then what happened to the Yankees? They're still here. I suppose you got them all hogtied, hmm? Come on, I'll show you. Over behind the blacksmiths. I don't need to play your games. Just tell me where to water my horse. What about grub? Ain't you hungry? Of course I am, but this town's been picked clean by bluecoats. <laughs> You're wrong about that, too, son. There's plenty of food. 
Sure there is. You think I'm lying? Feast your eyes on this. Well, that's a Union Army supply wagon. What'd I tell you? Still full of crates. Most of them not even opened yet. Guns, ammo, clothes, rations. Take your pick, Johnny Reb. I don't believe it. This here is real salt pork. First meat I've had in two weeks. Eat your fill. Wait a minute. You saying the Yanks rode out and left all this behind? That doesn't make sense. Like I told you, Johnny, they didn't ride out. They're still here. Where are they, old man? Talk or by God up. Turn around. What? Meet the Major. What is that? A statue? Well, now, you ever see a statue sitting on a real horse? But they're not moving. No, sir, they're sure not. And neither is the rest of them. The rest? Of the company. Are they dead? <laughs> sure, sure. Standing up, big as life, all 19 or 20 of them. Then they're sleeping. Sleeping on their feet. That one over there, he was cleaning his rifle. And that one, well, he took his boot off, and he's still standing on one foot. And this one, he was just drinking out his canteen, and he done fell asleep with his eyes wide open. Plague, then. Something in the water. The water's fine. Nice and sweet. Some kind of sickness, but that could take hours. And it wouldn't get them all at the same time. I told you. I put him to sleep. There must be some natural explanation. Natural? Now, don't that take all. What happened to them Yanks ain't natural. This is what done it. This here book and what's in it. <laughs> Give me that book. No, you don't, Johnny. This here is still my book. For now. Hey, hey, Yank, wake up. I'm the only one can do that. This is crazy. They must be asleep. No wounds, not a sign of blood. Go on, wake up. None of you are dead. Wake up, Yanks. I'm taking you all prisoner. I told you, it has to come out in this book. But you don't believe me. You think I'm lying. I didn't call you no liar. This here is what done it. Give me that. Now you're gone and done it. What kind of book is this? Can't you read, Johnny? The front of it says witchcraft. You better be real careful. Dropping it in the dirt? That wasn't bright of you. That wasn't very bright of you at all. Anything happens to this, you'll be in a real fix. Listen, old man. I expect you're harmless, but I got no time to fiddle with black magic or any other old men's games. Games? <laughs> games, you call it. And here in front of your eyes stands the enemy. Not a twitching, not even a moving an eyeball. Now look, old-timer, I flat out don't understand this. I don't understand it at all, but there's a war on. I got no time to just stand here jawing. I'll take my book back, if you don't mind. Here. Good riddance. All ye horsemen and ye footmen conjured here at this time, I command you to be still. Oh, Johnny, you didn't believe me. What about it now? I reckon you'll have to believe me, being as you can't move a muscle, being as you can't speak a word. Didn't want to do that to you, because you're one of us. But you wouldn't listen. Well, now you will. Look at this one right here, for instance. Standing up straight as a ramrod. He's a major by his stripes. And he's carrying his marching orders. Says this here's just an advance party. Soon as the rest come by, I'll do the same to them, too. You listening, Johnny? I know you can still hear me, because I only used half the power. Now, let me introduce myself and tell you my story. Name's Teague. I'm a witch man, and my pappy was a witch man afore me. He was the seventh son of a seventh son, and I was his seventh son. I know conjure stuff forward and backward. 
up and down. It's my living. Folks in China will make fun of me, like they did my pappy, but they'd buy my charms. Things to bring love or hate if they hanker for them, cures for sick hogs and calves, sayings to drive away fever. All them things I done for Chanow folks all my life. You understand? If you finally got it, blink your left eye. Good. That's good. Now you can move again. I'll say the words. Ye lone horsemen conjured here in this spot, ye and ye alone may pass on. Mesmerism, that's what it is. Parlor tricks? <laughs> sure, that's what you'd call it. You'd call a rooster a hen and a gelding a bay just to deny what's right and true. Oh, Johnny, I thought you understood. What did you do? Just what I knows how to do. I've been laughed at and told to mind my business. Young'uns hooted and throwed stones. I could have cursed them, but I didn't. No, sir. They was my friends and neighbors in Chanow, and I kept back evil from them. But I couldn't move. I couldn't blink an eye. Just like the Yanks. When they come, everybody run afore them but me. Invaders, tyrants, thieving skunks in blue. But I fixed them. I didn't do no running. I carried this book out into the street, and I read the words, and you can see what happened. Now you listen and you listen good, Johnny Reb. You fight the Yanks with everything you got. That's what I intend to do. Let me see those orders. From General T.F. Kotler, commanding 4th Division, Union Army, you will move immediately with your entire force, taking up a strong defensive position in the Chanow Valley. Hear that? His entire force. There's more coming. You and me got things to talk over, Johnny Reb. What things? I heard all I need. You got to understand. This book here don't have nothing to do with mesmerism. This is conjure stuff. And what I done to these Yanks, I can do to the rest of them. I can freeze them in their tracks. I can open up a path to Washington, D.C. so that Bobby Lee could ride in there with no more than three Confederate troopers and take over the whole country. That's what I can do with this book here. That's what I can do. You hear me? Magic? You claim it's magic. I don't claim. I say. It's what I read in this book. And now you've seen it. You've felt it. And you could... You could do this to the whole Union Army? Could and would. Why don't you? Why don't you, old man? For one good reason. And one good reason only. It better be a good one. If you have the power to turn the war to our side. I'm going to die. I'm going to die before the sun goes down. How do you know that? How? I can feel it in my bones. I can smell death. I seen the raven on the wing. I heard it coming. It's on a white horse, galloping this way. It's a pounding in my heart. A galloping and a galloping straight at me. Old Mr. Death ready to pluck me out of the living. So I ain't going to be around long enough to do what's got to be done. Then if you won't do it, who will? I'm leaving it to you. Me? That's right. But why me? A book ain't the only thing I can read. I can tell the look of a man. Eyes, head, hold on his weapon. I can tell all about that man. So I'm choosing you. Everything you need, you can find in this book. Spells, magic, curses, charms, everything. Here, take it. Uh, it don't seem right. It don't seem right at all. There's something about all this. Something. Something like what? Something unclean. Look at these pictures, animals, symbols, things I've never seen before. It's like being in league with... Say it, Johnny Reb. You got it right. Now say it like it needs to be said. With... with the devil. That's it. That's who you're in league with now, Johnny. That's who we'll have fighting on the side of the South. The devil himself. <laughs> the devil! The devil! Oh! 
Halt! Easy. Who goes there? Dogger. Troop scout. Advance and be recognized. I'm advancing. Now put that rifle down. I got a message for the lieutenant. That you, Dogger? Yes, sir. You've been gone a long time. We almost gave you up. Dead or prisoner by this time, that's what we figured. Neither, Lieutenant. Where's the other scout? I don't rightly know, sir. What do you mean by that? Well, if I did know, I'd sure tell you. Talk sense, man. Well, sir, it's like this. Paradine, he rode off to the valley a while ago. Said if he didn't come back, to tell you as fast as I can. And he didn't come back? No, sir. He sure didn't. I've been riding like the wind. So the Yanks are here. Can't say that, sir. Not for sure. Why not? It was mighty strange back there. Not a sound that I could hear. Paradine, he said he heard horses riding into town. Think if it was, they never come out. Well, why should they? They're bivouacked while they prepare for tomorrow's battle. One thing, sir. If they did ride in, they plumb disappeared once they got there. What are you talking about, soldier? It's like they rode into a hole and got covered over. Them and the horses. Not a hoot or a holler out of them after that. Like they rode off the edge of the world. Or into a hole like... Like a great big grave. What happened to Trooper Paradine? Well, sir, I... I reckon by now he's buried somewhere down there in that lonesome valley. With the rest of them. Buried. And never coming back. <laughs> Good girl. Drink your fill while I do the same. Johnny, where'd you go? Filling up my canteen, old man. Sorry, Johnny. Must have dozed off. That's okay. Stay lying down. You don't look so good. Almost sundown. <laughs> Not much time. Oh, now there's plenty daylight left. Drink the water? Thank you kindly. <coughs> I told you, I only got till sundown. After that, it's all up to you. That ain't gonna happen. You're feeling stronger, I can tell. Oh, no. <coughs> Just a few more minutes. That's all you gotta wait. Just a few more minutes. What are you telling me? Read it. Read it. You hear me? I said stay down. Johnny Reb. You hear me? You got to read from it out loud. Here. <coughs> right here. It takes your blood on the first page. Oh, come on. That settles the pact. That makes the contract. Your blood mixed with mine on the front page. You need food is what you need. That's the only thing wrong with you. How about some salt pork? <coughs> hey, Johnny Reb. Stars and bars. Here, I'll cut you off some. Hoist them high. Would you open your mouth and eat? <coughs> Stars and bars. <coughs> Stars and... and bars. <coughs> oh. oh, man. Don't you do me like that. Oh, dang saber. Now I've gone and cut myself. The blood, it dripped right there in the book, just like you said, old man. Hey, old fella, talk to me. Wh what do I do now? Who goes there? Paradin. Let him through. That's the other scout. Lieutenant, he's here. That's you, Paradine? Yes, sir. You see, Dogger, he didn't ride off the edge of the world after all. Joe, is that you? It's me, all right. I'm sure glad to see you, Joe. I rode back here just like you said. You did good. So the prodigal returns. Some people around here figured you must be dead by now, or a prisoner. Neither one, Lieutenant. No time for either, it appears. Sir? That book in your hand. Man's got to do his reading, doesn't he? It wasn't like that. Well, let's hear it, man. What did you see? More than you'd believe. I'll be the judge of that. Go ahead. I'll try. Where are their advance people? In the town. And the rest of their forces? The main body was spread out behind 2,000 men at least. 
60 guns, one troop of cavalry, maybe 50 supply wagons. You drunk or something, Paradine? Not a drop, sir. There hasn't been a sound from that valley all day. Not one sound. Lieutenant, you got every reason to call me crazy. But the reason you didn't hear them is because they're asleep. Why, of all the... Put to sleep by magic, black magic. It's all in this book here. There was an old man, Teague by name, he done it. Then he gave me the book so I can carry on. Paradine, this is an order. You're to take yourself to bed on the double. You're to sleep the night, make your report to me in the morning. This is my report, Lieutenant. There's practically a division of Yankees down there, and they're dead on their feet, not moving a muscle, just standing right out in the open, big as you please, or sitting straight up, the same as they were when the spell hit them. Spell? What spell? It's in the book here, I swear to you. I won't call you mad, Paradine, or drunk. I'll wait till morning, but if you haven't changed your story by then, I'll be ready to charge you with one or the other. You want proof? Of what? A daydream? Here's what you do. In the morning, you send a patrol down there and take a look at the main street of that town. And what will they see? Just what I said. But in the meantime, I think I've done something that'll prove it to you quicker. Where's Mallory's troop? Mallory's not back yet. They went up to the North Ridge late this morning. There was Yanks camped up there. Company's strength at least, wasn't there? That's about what we figured, but what's that got to do with... It's got everything to do with what I said. This book. On the way back here, on the way back, I read from one of the pages out loud like the old man told me. I wanted to kind of test it, so I conjured up a spell, and I pointed it. I pointed it up there toward the ridge. That's enough. I've heard all I care to hear. Who's that? Sounds like the troops are back. Who's there? Mallory, where's the lieutenant? Now you'll know I've been telling the truth. Sir, reporting in. Glad to see you, Mallory. Warm yourself by the fire, then maybe you can clear something up for us. Paradine here says... I just saw something I can't explain. No more than any of my men can explain it. And they saw it too. We walked up to that ridge in a skirmish line, scared out of our boots because it was so unearthly quiet. We figured the Yanks were waiting for us just beyond the parapet. They were waiting all right, but not for us. Standing straight and tall, guns to port, and frozen like statues. You mean they were dead? Not dead. Not dead dead and not alive, just frozen stock still like rocks. You could see them in the moonlight, not moving. They could have been markers in a graveyard made out of, of, of granite. I swear I don't know what could do a thing like that, and I hope to God I'll never find out. Lieutenant, this is what done it. What's that? A book, but not just any book. Paradine, are you trying to tell me... You heard what he said. If that's true, if it's all true, then this is the devil's work. What's this all about? Is somebody gonna tell me? An old man give me this book. A witch man. You're right, Lieutenant. It is the devil's work. I know that too. But maybe it's time we called muster on the devil. Maybe that's all that's left to us. We ain't got enough guns. We ain't got enough food. We ain't got enough anything. We're losing, Lieutenant. The Confederacy is cracking up into pieces in front of our eyes. It's bleeding to death every day. There isn't enough blood left in our veins to change things. And the ground won't hold anymore when that runs out. I don't know much about church things. And I don't know anything about Satan. All I know is that we had a cause. And it's dying right in front of us. Then, Paradine, please open the book and read what's got to be read. Say it loud and make it good for every Yank army in the field. Freeze them or put them in the ground, but make it good. 
I'll give it a try. Satan, Satan, I call upon ye in all your power and glory. I call ye in the darkest hour of my need. And in so doing, I do heartily revoke the name of, of... Go ahead, Joe. Finish it. I don't know if I can. You can do it. It calls upon us to revoke God. Give it to me, then. Wait. I'll finish it right now if you can. Dogger. Now look what you've done. Leave it be. Joe, you, you said yourself, it's all we got left. He's right, Paradine. God help us, but this is all we got left. I don't like the feeling inside me. What do we call them, Lieutenant? Damn Yanks? That's the phrase, isn't it? Damn Yanks? But if I read aloud from this book, it'll be the Confederacy that's damned. It's that book, or it's the end. Then let it be the end. Let it come if it must come. But if it's a cause that has to be buried, let it be buried in hallowed ground. Let it be buried in hallowed ground. And let this be consumed by fire. Let it burn, boys. Maybe he's right. Let it burn. Joe, you awake? Yeah. I was thinking. You probably did right, Joe. If we got God on our side, we don't need no witch book. I hope you're right. It'll be all over soon, and then we can go home to what's left and forget all about it. Start over, because it'll be over and done. Likely so. The question is, how long? They say there's a battle going to start tomorrow. Yeah? Yeah, a big one. That's what the talk's been. Where? Some place in Pennsylvania. Could be I burned the book too soon. Whereabouts in Pennsylvania? No, oh, I don't know. I don't recall. Where, Dogger? Where's this battle in Pennsylvania? I don't know, a little town. Never heard of it before. A place called Gettysburg. Gettysburg. Well, I guess this is one we'll have to fight without the devil's help, no matter what happens. May God help us. God help us all. In a time to come, during what will be Joseph Paradine's old and garrulous years, he'll tell anyone willing to listen that the Civil War wasn't lost at Antium or Gettysburg or Shiloh. Rather, he'll insist, the Confederacy's fate was sealed in a little valley hamlet called Shanau. And people will laugh or pity him when he insists that the South lost the war because they refused a certain strategic alliance. But the truth is that such unholy alliances are often the norm rather than the exception in the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Still Valley, starring Adam West, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling from a story by Manley Wade Wellman and adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson. Heard in the cast were Mike Novak, Richard Hensel, Turk Muller, Doug James, Jeff Lupiton, Christian Stolte, Sarah Marks, 
Carl Amari, Vince Amari, Paul Patch, and Roger Wolski. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Slow down. Yes, sir. Anything you say, sir. Just get us home in one piece. Your wish is my command. <laughs> Some party, huh? It was your idea. Oh, I wouldn't say that. They're as much your friends as mine. A regular barrel of laughs. You have to admit. <laughs> Every time Walter does his Barbara Streisand impersonation... Pull over. Uh, it's not that much farther. I mean it, Millie, or I'll throw up all over the dashboard. Put your head between your knees. Take a deep breath. Now! Okay, okay, Bob. I'm pulling over. Stop. Hey, where are we? Oh, let me out. Bob, I thought you were my navigator. I must have missed the turnoff, you know, after Riverdale. That's right. Blame me. I'm not blaming you. You had the map. Don't talk. You should have told me you weren't paying attention. Now look where we are, in the middle of nowhere. Oh, my head hurts. Want me to put the top down? Some, some fresh air? I just want to go to sleep. All right, get in. Hurry up. Will you look at that? All those stars. I never knew there were so many. We, we don't see stars like that in Manhattan. Night. Wait a minute. Well, let me sleep. What happened to all the stars? Sleep tight. Don't let the bad bugs bite. Did you see that? Mm, where's the blanket? One minute there were a million of them and then... Something blacked them out. Mm. Oh, they're back again. Oh, must be my eyes. Hurry up, Mel. Come to bed. Sure. Sure, Bob. Bob and Millie Frazier. Two average New Yorkers who attended a party in the country and stayed too long. They also drank too much and on the way home took an unexpected detour. But they aren't worried. In a few hours, it will be morning and they'll be home in their bed safe and sound. Or so they'd like to think. Most of us wake up knowing exactly where we are. The rooster or the alarm clock brings back the familiar sights and sounds of home and the comfort of another day's routine. But our young friends are in for a surprise. Tomorrow is going to be a day like none other, as they spend it in the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, Stop Over in a Quiet Town, starring Stephanie Weir with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Bob? Oh, mm, mm. Reveille, tiger. What? The year's at spring, the spring's at morn, the morn's at seven. Speak softly, woman. I got a hangover that was meant for a much bigger man. Want an ice bag? No, just call an undertaker. What was in those martinis, anyway? Gin held down wind from the vermouth. I don't suppose. What? 
I wasn't by any chance the life of the party. You were perfectly fine. Yeah, great, in fact. You told that joke about the ball bearings. Oh, not that one. And you broke a lamp making a forward pass with the throw pillow. Was it expensive? The pillow? Not very. You spent the rest of the evening oogling that girl. Which girl? The one in the low-cut sequin dress. Oh, that girl. Yeah, pretty enough, I suppose, if you like that sort of thing. How would you know you never looked at her face? You sure it was me? Oh, it was you, all right. Hold down the fort. I'll make the coffee. That would be thoughtful. Wait a minute. I didn't even take my shoes off? Don't tell me. Oh, Bob. I knew you were toasted, but really, you slept in your clothes. You should have helped me out of them. I couldn't even help myself. Look at this dress. It's disgusting. <sighs> Now I have to get it cleaned. I didn't think I had that much to drink. Did I? Bob, this may sound like a foolish question, but where are we? What? Open your eyes the rest of the way, very carefully. Now, take a look around. I hope we are in an apartment on West 12th Street in New York City. Open them the rest of the way. Oh, no. Tell me I'm still asleep. I wish I could. Millie, answer me honestly. Have you ever seen this bedroom before in your life? Not even in my dreams. We went to sleep at home, didn't we? Sure we did. Remember? Not exactly. We left the party up at Bedford Village. And I was driving. No, I was... I was. I had to because you were... Sleepy. That's a nice way of putting it. Let's just say unable to keep the car on the road. I put the top down. I thought I did that. It was supposed to revive you, then somewhere about Riverdale. Somewhere? You missed the turn? Wait a minute. Something came down on the car from overhead, uh, a shadow. And then... Then? That's all I remember. You probably plowed into another car. I most certainly did not. Well, another car plowed into us. We probably got knocked out. You were already out. Please. I am trying to contact my brain. Somebody brought us here, put us to bed, leaving us fully clothed. That was respectful, don't you think? And now there's probably bacon sizzling and a plate of scrambled eggs waiting in the kitchen. I could use some of that. Yeah, me too. But I doubt there's room service. I don't smell any coffee. Hello? Anybody home? Good morning. No scrambled eggs. And the cupboard was bare. They must have gone out so we could sleep it off. The future of casual living. Pretty trusting types. First things first. The phone. At least I can find out where we are. Is information 411? I don't know. Just dial zero for operator. Why can't I get a dial tone? Go easy. You're, you'll break it. Bob! I hardly touched it, I swear. Now we'll have to replace it. No, we won't. The phone company does that. Look at this. It wasn't even wired to the wall. How do you figure? Maybe they didn't pay their bill. There aren't even any screws. It was glued on or something. We'd better leave them a note. Got a pencil? Nope. I don't even see a pad. Must be one around here somewhere. I'll look in the drawer. You do that while I try to stick this thing back to the wall. She's not a very good housekeeper. The drawer stick. Bob, would you give me a hand? Just pull. This drawer, it, it isn't real. Let me see that. Careful. Some kind of veneer. Just... A facade glued on. They all are. The cupboards, too. What is this? A movie set? Could be a model home, the kind they build to show people. Who builds them? Real estate companies. People come in, they walk through, decide to buy, then they build them to order. Check the refrigerator. Just empty cartons. No milk, no eggs, and this bread isn't real. Nothing but cardboard inside. Well, that's what I call low-carb. It's like a prop. Everything is. 
Let's get out of here. <laughs> Do you believe in ghosts? No, but let's go anyway. The other houses look normal enough. Nice neighborhood. Neat as a pin. Hey, kid! Where'd you go? You heard her, too. I guess she went somewhere else to play. What do we do now? Go to the car and drive ourselves home. Sounds like a plan, except for one thing. What's that? Where's our car? You're right. It's not parked in front. And unless my eyes deceive me, it, it's not anywhere on this block. Great. We got helped by a good Samaritan who helped himself to our car. Maybe they needed it to go somewhere? Sure. They went to pick up a couple breakfasts to go. If we're lucky, they'll fill up the tank while they're at it. But meanwhile, whoever put us up for the night isn't here. Hey, we'll try the neighbors. Which one? Take your pick. One of those across the street with the trees in front. They look lived in. Lead on. I wish I could remember how we got here. Yeah, you and me both. It's all blank. This isn't like me. I'm not given to blackouts myself, and I never heard of a case where two people blacked out simultaneously. Does this remind you at all of the Coney Island spook house? Too quiet. It is. No traffic, no people. Not even any birds singing. Now that is strange, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it is. No sign of life. Maybe they're all at work. Or they're being considerate of your hangover. Lay off. If you'd been sober enough to drive, we'd be home now, instead of wherever this is. Hicksville. It's bigger than that little town you were born in. I at least had the sense to move to New York. How these yokels stand all this peace and quiet, I'll never know. Do you mean all the yokels who are gawking at us right now? Where? My point exactly. Not a soul. Well, what do you expect? That's the way it is in small towns. They peep from behind curtains, over the backyard fence, through the keyhole if they have a chance. I'll take the big city any day. At least you know when you're being stared at. There's one citizen who's not afraid to stare. What? There in the tree. Is it a squirrel or a chipmunk? Squirrel. You can tell by the bushy tail. Isn't he cute? Well, hi there, little fella. Honey, come on. I think he's tame. Big deal. Come look. Isn't he sweet? Yeah, a real doll. Careful, he might have a disease or something. Oh, such big eyes. He doesn't even blink. Oh, nice baby. Come here. You don't have to pet it. Bob! Now what have you done? Nothing. I, I touched it and, and it fell over dead. Well, you didn't kill it if that's what you're thinking. This thing's been dead for years. How, how can you tell? It's stuffed. Why would anyone want a stuffed squirrel in their front yard? Might have been a pet once upon a time. Well, that's no way to treat a pet, even a stuffed one. Leaving it out in the weather this way. Mill, don't ask me why anybody does anything in this hick town. Keep your voice down. You'll hurt their feelings. Tough. Where are you going now? To the front porch. For what? What do you think? First, I'd like to find out where we are. Second, I'd like to use a real phone. And third, I'd like to beg, borrow, or steal an aspirin. We must look a fright. Don't worry about it. I wish I had my hairbrush. What did you do with it? It was in my purse. And where's that? I guess I left it at the party. So you were under the influence yourself. At least I was able to drive. Come on. You don't have to break it down. Will you quit criticizing me? I'm not criticizing. I just want to go home. And how do you suggest we get there? I don't know. But I don't like this place. And I don't remember how we got here. And no one will answer the door. And I'm, I'm frightened, Bob. Don't get all female and fluttery on me. Will somebody help us, please? I give up. There's no one home. And I'll bet there's no one in the next house or the next or the next. Help! Somebody? We're lost! Oh, can anyone hear us? Please help us! <laughs> <laughs>
What was that? Someone laughing. The child we heard before. Where did she go? Ah, uh, maybe she's shy. At least we know the town's not completely deserted. No, they're only hiding. They don't trust strangers. A good policy, neither do I. Could be they all went to one place. Oh, really, Bob? Town meeting or something. On Sunday morning. Especially on Sunday morning. That's where everybody is. They've gone to church. Now all we have to do is find it. Ah, this is the place, all right. I've seen a hundred churches just like it. Painted white with one big steeple, a couple trees, flower beds along the sides. Do you think they're inside? One way to find out. We can't just walk in. Watch me. What do you tell them? I'll tell them I'm tired of their creepy little town. And I'll pay anybody anything he asks to get us to a train or a bus station that'll take us back to civilization. I don't see anybody. This is just the vestibule. They're all on the other side of those doors. Awful quiet. I thought they'd be singing hymns. Maybe they're praying. We'd better wait. Time waits for no man. Here's the church, and here is the steeple. Open the door and see all the... Well... Nobody. What now? I know. This'll bring them. Wait, what are you gonna do? Ring the church bell. It's the oldest distress signal in the books. Need some help? I've got it. Look outside, see if anybody's coming. Oh no. Where'd everybody go? See for yourself. I see it, but I don't believe it. There isn't anybody. Not a soul. Just us. This is too much of a stretch. There isn't a person or a thing alive in this town, and yet... What? We're being watched. Millie. I know when I'm alone. And I know when I'm being watched, don't you? Now you're getting paranoid. I'm serious. The hair on the back of my neck stands up, and right now I feel like a porcupine. Not to mention delusional. <laughs> is that a delusion? <laughs> <laughs> I've got to find that kid. Good luck. Where are you? Hey, kid. There's no reason to hide. We're not going to hurt you. Whoever you are, come on out and talk to us. It's no use. All right. We're both delusional. I feel it, too. We are being watched. The hair on the back of your neck? No, my spidey sense is tingling. The whole town must have a whopping case of xenophobia. Sounds dreadful. I hope it's not catching. Fear or distrust of strangers. I should have realized. It's common in these little one-horse towns. I ought to know. I grew up in one. There are probably half a dozen people watching us from their living room windows right this minute. I'm getting goose pimples. No reason. There isn't even a breeze. Not a cloud in the sky. Or anything else. Like a car, a truck, a single solitary pedestrian. Give me your handkerchief. Why? Look at the flowers. Those are Shasta daisies. So? My allergy. Don't you remember when I took all those tests? I'm sure they're Shastas. I used to buy bunches of them and sneeze all the way home. You're not sneezing now. Bob, look at this. Uh, better not touch them. Just to be safe. That's not what they are. Told you. These flowers aren't real. They're plastic, all of them. Lots of people do that. Dress up their yards with artificial flowers. Less maintenance. I know, but this is different. Nothing in this town is real. The house we slept in, the child we can't find, a squirrel stuffed with sawdust. Show me one thing in this place that's real. That tree is real. Is it? See for yourself. It is real. 
What did you expect? I don't know, but I, I think I would have lost my grip if one more thing, just one more, turned out to be artificial. Tree, I love you. Let me give you a big hug. Get me out of here! It's a prop, too. Somebody stood it up on the grass with a couple of boards nailed to the bottom. I'm leaving now! Honey, there's bound to be some explanation. I'd like to know what that could be. Just calm down. Here, have a cigarette. I thought you quit. I did. I, I could carry a couple in case of emergencies. Well, this fits the definition. <coughs> oh, how old... <coughs> How old are these? <laughs> I'll bet there's gonna be a wedding here today. They've just dressed up the lawn so it'll look pretty. You remember how when we got married? Bob! I was just saying how- The grass is on fire! Stand back! Oh! Be careful! There. The flames are out. How did that happen? How could it? It was the match. I must have dropped it after I lit the cigarettes. But grass doesn't burn. Bob. Look at this. It isn't grass. It's some kind of paper or plastic colored green, like AstroTurf. And what does that mean? I don't know. If you don't, who does? Bob, where are we? Where are we? I wish I could give you a good answer. But I can swear one thing. I'm gonna find out. This has to be the center of town. You think so? Main Street, USA. Barbershop, a five and dime, a bank. Just like your childhood. Are you, are you sure you're not dreaming this? Is anybody here? Can anybody hear me? My name's Bob Frazier. This is my wife. Will someone show us the way out of here? Don't try anymore. Just keep walking till we get away from this nightmare. Wait. We'll come to the edge of town sooner or later. Just keep moving in a straight line. Wait, I said. You hear that? I hear something. Sounds like a music box. Where? Over here. It's coming from the antique shop. Don't. Why not? You don't know what's inside. Whatever it is, it's more than what's outside. Please, Bob. Something had to start that music box. I don't care. I just want to get away from here. I have to know. The store isn't real either. There's nothing behind the door. It doesn't have a roof or four walls. Hello? Anybody? There's only a display for the window, and that's it. That music box didn't start all by itself. Uh, it could have. Our footsteps could have caused it to start. Oh, I don't believe that. It's possible. The spring was tightly wound. We came along outside, and the vibration jarred it, and, and now it's running down again. But somebody had to wind it. There's nothing, nothing but these stage props. I'm not staying. Say that again? What? Stage props. That's where we are. On a stage? No, an old movie lot. There are two or three of them up in the Bronx. It's the only explanation. We're probably 10 minutes from the heart of New York City. We're on the set of The Sopranos. Then I'll race you home. You're on. Funny that we can't hear traffic yet. We will. Keep walking. Or we could get a ride. That would sure be great. But for the time being... I'm serious. Look, what do you see? Is that a car? It wasn't here before, was it? No, it was not. Hey, buddy! I think he hears you. Oh, boy, am I glad to see you. We've been wandering around here all morning, and you're the first person... Bob, wait. Look at me. I'm talking to you. Bob. Can't you see us? Turn your head. What is the... He isn't real. He's some sort of... 
He's only a mannequin. Let go of it. Another trick. Some kind of joke. We have to keep going. Is somebody watching us? This has gone on long enough. We've had it. It's no use. Are you testing us? Are you watching us behind those windows? <laughs> Are you taking notes to see how much of this we can stand before we turn into blabbering idiots? Well, that's it. Game over. I've had it. Come out and face me, whoever you are, so I can finish it right here in the middle of the street. We're human beings, do you hear? Human beings! Bob, look. I've reached my limit. I don't know what to do anymore. I honestly don't. In the car. L look at the dashboard. What do you see? I don't care. Millie, I'm out of ideas. There's nothing more to... Look! The keys are in the ignition. Let me see that. Yes! Oh, honey, climb in. We are going to get out of here after all. Right now. Oh, do you think it runs? How else did it get here? Hurry up. So long, Spookville. Come on. Turn over. You're going to flood it. You want to drive? You're the one who got us into this nut house in the first place. All right. All right. You handle it. Oh, that's rich. That's really, really rich. <laughs> no motor. There's nothing under the hood. No wires. Nothing. Did you hear what I said? There's no motor. Isn't that hilarious? I'm not the one who drove us here. I'm sorry I said that. It doesn't matter. It's my fault. I shouldn't have drunk so much. I know you shouldn't have. But I didn't drive us here. Then who did? I told you I don't remember. Not anything about what happened last night? How we got to this place? Only what I told you. I was driving along just above Riverdale. You were almost asleep, but you wanted to stop. Then we started up again. There was a, a shadow. It seemed to envelop the car for a moment. That, that, that's all I remember. I guess I could have fainted or blacked out. Or crashed. All right. Maybe I did crash. If you want to think that, it would explain everything, wouldn't it? Not to me. I crashed the car, ran off a bridge or into a ditch, if you like, and... We're dead. That's not the law of parsimony. What's that? The simplest explanation to account for the facts. Well, then come up with another one. We must be dead. This place is hell. Millie. Like some amusement park with the all-American town, except it's not very amusing. It's only a display. Nothing works and nothing is real. Calm down. What's that? A train. Did you ever hear of a train in hell? It probably doesn't stop here. Then we'll catch the next one. Oh, it's getting close. The station's got to be nearby. Here she comes. Is it real? Sure is. It's slowing down. Honey, we're going home. I can't believe it. Hello! Where have you been, you great big beautiful train? Oh, isn't it a beautiful train? The most beautiful train I ever saw. tickets. Don't worry about it. We'll pay the conductor. Where should we sit? Anywhere. Looks like we got the whole car to ourselves. Here, you can have the window seat. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Don't mind if I do. Must be a commuter train. So that proves this place is real. There's a sign outside on the platform. Uh, the name of this town is Centerville. Never heard of it. I hope we never do again. 
Good riddance, Centerville. Oh, it's been fun, but I can't say I'll miss it. A side trip, that's all. Centerville, you are history. Ancient history. What a nutty little town. All form, no function. Maybe it was a housing development. The ideal community. I must say, I wouldn't want to live there. Some places are too quiet, too perfect. A nice place to visit if you're passing through. I still don't know how we got there. I, I guess it'll be one of those unsolved mysteries. We've got a story to tell our friends, at least. Oh, they'll never believe us. It just uh, it doesn't make any sense. Why don't you admit it? You did have a few drinks at the party, didn't you? Uh, one or two. And somewhere along the way, they caught up with you, and you got lost and ended up in Centerville. If you say so. It does sound like the kind of screwball thing I'd do. How do you put up with me? Well, I guess I got a soft spot for screwballs. Well, you sure got one. It wasn't all that frightening back there. Easy for you to say now. It's just that whenever somebody goes boo, I jump a foot. Boo. Stop it. I'm fine now. Wait till we get to the office on Monday. I can see old Mr. Peabody now. Fraser, we're a team here. If one member of the team lets us down, then the whole organization suffers. He should be glad you made it back at all. He'll never know the half of it. Another stop already? Wouldn't want him to think I had a lost weekend. Bob? Flights of fancy aren't his thing. He's strictly facts and figures. What did you say ab about paying the conductor? Sure, no problem. They'll take cash. Then, where is he? He'll be along. No, Bob, he won't, because there isn't any conductor. Huh? Oh, Bob. What are you looking at? The sign outside. It says... Setterville. Oh, no. Maybe it's not the same Centerville. It's the same one. You can see from here, there's not a soul on the street. Nothing moves, nothing real. How could we have left the station and ended up where we started? We went in a circle. Come on. Oh, no. I'm not going back. Not back. We're going to walk straight down Main Street, and this time we're going to keep on walking. Until what? Until we're out of hell. I never realized till now. Go ahead, say it. You're hungry. And thirsty. But that's not what I was thinking. It's the little things. You don't miss them till they're gone. There's nothing here that's really frightening. It's what's not here. Like people, cars. Besides that, no dogs, no birds, not even an airplane in the sky, not a single cloud. At least the sun's still there. Yes, but for how much longer? Nothing we can do about that. We can run. Could you? I'll take off these shoes. I'll sprint if that'll help. Anything to get us out of here faster. Oh, we better save our strength. Might be a long road ahead. We still have a few hours of daylight. Can't be that far from civilization. But what if the sun goes down first? Then we slog on in the dark like a couple of marching morons. And when we can't keep going, we hack out a campsite, break up trees and make a fire, find berries to eat, pine cones, grass, nettles, whatever it takes. They are not gonna scare us or starve us out. Bob, who are they? Something tells me we're about to find out. <laughs> Come on, I've had enough of this. Want to play? Let's play. Bring it on. <laughs> no, the sky's getting dark. Bob, we have to hide. Don't make a sound. Don't move. They'll see us. She'll see us. She? Yes. Her hand, Bob. It's huge. Oh, oh, my... What are you... Hey, no. put us down! Oh. Oh. My head, honey. What are you doing, dear? <laughs> Playing. The model town again. You never get tired of that, do you? No. 
and your little pets. Be careful with them now. Daddy brought them all the way from Earth. Can I play with them, Mommy? Oh, please? After lunch, dear. Put them away, then wash your hands. <sighs> all right. <laughs> Put us down! Bob! What's she doing? Now! Now! Leave my wife alone! Get in your cage now. Don't worry. I'll come back in a little while, and we'll play some more. What are you doing? Don't leave us here! Don't! Don't! <laughs> Wait for me. I'll be back. The moral of what you've just heard is clear. If you drink, don't drive. And if your wife has had a couple, she shouldn't drive either. The night is dark, and the road home can be a long one. If you're not careful, you might just wake up with a whale of a headache and a king-size hangover at a deserted train stop in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, TwilightZoneRadio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. Stopover in a Quiet Town, starring Stephanie Weir, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Earl Hamner Jr. Heard in the cast were Kurt Nabig, Frenette Lebo, and Haley Nabig. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, Exim Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Audio editing, sound design, foley effects, and mix for the Twilight Zone radio dramas are by Cerny American creatives Craig Lee, Michael Slaybach, Bob Benson, and Jason Rizzo. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Here's to Michael Franklin, in honor of the most stunning, ruthless stewardship of a corporate takeover I've ever seen. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you, everyone. And may I just say, I absolutely deserve it. <laughs> 
I know you've had your eye on that corner office for some time. Well, it's yours. Mm. Actually, Alan, uh, I have my eye on the corporate suite. <laughs> That's my office. Exactly. Careful, Michael. Your ambition is showing. <laughs> mm. Well, my ambition is what made this deal happen. My ambition is what allows our billable hours to skyrocket every quarter. And my ambition is what will eventually lead me to not only your office, Alan, but to your company-paid condo, your company-paid Mercedes, and your company-paid weekly $200 haircuts and manicures. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have to admit you had me going there, Michael. I have no doubt that someday you will occupy my seat in the company. Uh, well, we'll have to wait and see what the future holds. Tut, tut, no harm in celebrating. Uh, speaking of the future, check out that wild-looking old woman sitting behind the table. Ah, wearing that colorful headscarf with all the jewelry? She looks like a contestant for best Halloween costume. No, I think she's telling fortunes. See how she's looking at that guy's hand? Let's go see what she has to say. Alan. You don't believe in this stuff, do you? Of course not. It's just for fun. On the other hand, maybe she can give us a hot tip for our next takeover target. Uh, that would be the warnings of the tea leaves, for they are never wrong. Ah, I see there are two more supplicants who wish to learn about their futures. Make that one, supplicant. <laughs> I'm not playing. Oh, go ahead, Michael. What can it hurt? I put my faith in real things, Alan. <laughs> like profits, and a well-written prospectus, and a robust return on an investment dollar. And people? <laughs> people are the least reliable things on the planet. Well, anyway, I'll spring for your reading. How much is it, please? For this most rare and deep connection to the mystic masters of the cosmos, the charge is five dollars. Five dollars? It's highway robbery. <laughs> All in good fun and worth five bucks to find out what's next for the amazing Michael Franklin. There you are, my good woman. The mystic masters thank you. Yeah, I bet they do. Please be seated and give me your right hand. What's wrong with my left hand? The right hand crosses the body's meridian, connecting directly to the humors of the heart through the intercession of the soul. Oh, I'll say this for you. <laughs> You've got the sales pitch down pat. Please close your eyes and focus your thoughts thoughts on your inner golden light. I would have guessed that green is your color. Michael, quiet. All right, I'm quiet. I'm focused. Watch as the golden light moves toward you. Slowly, it surrounds your consciousness. Surrender to its mystery. I never surrender. The mystic masters perceive you as a man who values work above all else. <laughs> She's got that right. She could have said the same thing about anybody in this bar. There are people in your past who have suffered a disconnection with you. Spirits are left unsatisfied. Well, it can't be old girlfriends. He doesn't take time to go on dates. Mm. Your soul is troubled. Uh, my soul is just fine. Thank you very much. There's something strange. I am attempting to discern your future. But I cannot. I could have told you that. No offense. Oh. What's the matter? The reading is over. What? Hey, we paid you to tell us fortune. Here is your money back. I cannot complete the reading. 
Now look, lady, <laughs> I don't believe in all this hocus pocus, but a deal's a deal. Just tell me I'm going to be the richest man in the world and you can keep the five bucks. I do not take lightly the readings of the soul. I'm going to go complain to the manager. Alan, hold on, Alan. Look, we don't want to cause you any trouble, lady, all right? Just say what's on your mind, and we'll leave. Very well. I will tell you what the mystic masters have divined. May the Lord have mercy on your soul. What is it? Alan's going to fire me? <laughs> I'm going to lose my hair? Your future is very clear, and it is this. In ten days, you will be dead. What? Mm. <laughs> I don't think that's very funny. <laughs> the signs are serious, and the reading is true. What? What kind of scam is this? Come on, Michael. Don't let her ruin your night. You know, lady, we were humoring you by coming over here. The least you could do is play along and not be such a downer. I did not wish to reveal your fate. You insisted that I do. When the clock strikes midnight on the tenth day to come, you will be dead. Uh, and now what? Oh, wait, wait, wait. And no. <laughs> Don't tell me. Uh, let me guess. Uh, oh, yeah. I pay you another five bucks, and you tell me how I can avoid this terrible fate. That is impossible. Your fate is sealed. Let's go get a beer. Come on, Michael. Fine. <laughs> See, it's been a real pleasure spending time with you, ma'am. Alan, I'm heading home. I got some paperwork to finish anyway. Are you sure? Oh, yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Suddenly, I don't know, I just ah, lost my desire for celebration. <laughs> okay, buddy. See you tomorrow. Yeah, see you tomorrow. I'll be dead in ten days. Ha! Ah, jeez. Yeah. Con artist. Come on. Oh, where's a taxi when you need one? Oh. Hey, taxi! Taxi over here! Hey, where to, buddy? Take me to... Take... Hey, pal, you okay? I feel... Dizzy. Uh, hmm. Dizzy? You don't look so good. I... I need... Hey. Uh... Hey, buddy. Oh, my gosh, he passed out. Gotta get him to the hospital. Mr. Franklin, can you hear me? Where am, where, where am I? Ah, you. Uh, you're in the emergency room at Samaritan Hospital. What? What, what happened? What's, what's going on? Easy, easy, please. Don't try to sit up right away. You're still recovering from the anesthesia. Anesthesia? Yes. For, for what? You were brought here because you passed out in a taxi cab. Do you remember that? Um, vaguely. We performed some tests on you. Blood pressure, heart. Everything was normal. Hmm. Well, then, I don't get it. Then why am I... I... In, an, in an abundance of caution. We gave you an MRI. I'm, uh, I'm afraid we found something unusual. Oh. Huh. Well, what does that mean? There's a dark spot on the X-ray of your brain. We... We don't know what it is until we perform more tests, of course, but I must impress on you. This is a very serious situation. Well, what happens next? Well, I'd like to check you into the hospital for further procedures. 
We can consider options for chemotherapy and radiation right away. But... but I feel fine. I, I'm in great shape. Cancer has no respect for those issues, I'm afraid. How long do I have? A, a few years? Uh, given the size of your anomaly, I suspect that your prognosis is dire. And how long? Is that six months? It could be a matter of days. I'm very sorry, Mr. Franklin. <clears throat> I will send the nurse in to take your information, all right? Days, wait. The old woman in the park, she was right. I'll be dead in ten days. Portrait of a man frozen in the amber of fear. Michael Franklin, workaholic captain of industry, ruthless to his enemies and dismissive of routine human interaction. Given a prognosis that would send a chill of terror down the spine of the most stalwart of men, he is faced with the rising specter of his own mortality. But even worse, he stares into the rearview mirror of a life only half-lived. Devoid of true friendship, with only a string of consummated business deals to mark his measure, Michael Franklin is about to embark on a frightful journey of self-examination that can only be experienced in the land between regret and insistent memory, a land we like to call the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, 10 Days, starring Ned Bellamy with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Uh, nurse, what happened to the patient who is in this bed, Mr. Franklin? I just saw him a moment ago, doctor. I have no information about his condition. Oh, I certainly hope he isn't about to do something foolish. Is Alan in yet? Oh, yes, Mr. Franklin. He's... Are you all right, Mr. Franklin? I'm fine. I don't believe I've ever seen you in the office without shaving or changing your clothes from yesterday. I was in a hurry this morning. Is he in a meeting? He just finished a call. Uh, fine. I'll only need a minute. Oh, but he's got another appointment at... I'll only be a minute. Michael, you look like you haven't been to sleep all night. Isn't that the suit you wore yesterday? Don't tell me you went out to celebrate without me. Alan, I quit. <laughs> yeah, me too. Alan, listen to me. I'm quitting. This is some kind of joke, right? I would appreciate it if you would expedite the disposition of my account. I want to close out my portfolio. I'm cashing in my stocks. I need my retirement funds and my annual bonus. Every bit of it. Michael, you're talking crazy. What are you doing? What's this all about? What part didn't you understand? I mean, you can't just quit. But <laughs> I just did. What on earth for? Personal reasons. Personal reasons? After all these years of working together, you offer me that? Correct. Michael, if this has something to do with that crazy old woman who told your fortune last night... It's not that. I just... I just decided to take my career in a different direction. I've, I've just been thinking about making this move for a long time. I don't believe you. Alan, no offense, but I don't care if you believe me or not. I've made my decision, and I'd like you to honor it. You realize that if you disassemble your corporate portfolio early, there will be substantial penalties, not to mention the perks you'll be losing, the company car, the country club membership, the center court basketball tickets. Can you have the accounting department wrap everything up right away? Oh, and I'd appreciate all of the various income streams to be folded into one check. <laughs> That check will be worth several million dollars. Yes. Well, I can't say I approve of what you're doing, and I can only hope you have a good reason, even if you won't tell me. 
Could you make the call, please? I'm in a bit of a hurry. After 12 years, I don't see why there's such a... Uh, y yes, this is uh, Alan Fisher in corporate. I have a... Well, it's an unusual request. Michael Franklin has decided to leave the firm, and he wants all of his outstanding monies gathered into one check for immediate pickup. Yes, I understand the amount is substantial. Very good. He'll be right there. All right, Michael. The check is being... Michael? Michael? Where did he go? You, sir? I'd like to buy a ticket to Rome, please. Leaving today. Very good, sir. And on what date would you like to return? Uh, just a one-way ticket, please. I just love Rome. The sights, the food, the museums. It's a banquet of... Uh, yeah, I'm in a hurry. Please. If you'll just sign here. Will you prefer a window or an aisle seat? Surprise me. Mr. Franklin, welcome to the Grand Hotel Rome's premier destination. Our presidential suite has been prepared, all three fireplaces are ablaze, the champagne is on ice, and your veranda opens onto the courtyard where Rome's finest string quartet is waiting to play for you. And of course, an entire staff of valets are at your disposal. And the concert tickets for this evening? The limousine will gather you at 6 o'clock. You will be driven directly to the private entrance where a personal elevator will whisk you to the ambassador's box. Only the finest for you, Mr. Franklin. <laughs> Bravo! Wonderful! Excuse me, Mr. Franklin. The young lady in the next box I sent this fine wine to you. Uh, well, well, please ask the lady if she would care to join me. Right away, Mr. Franklin. I haven't seen you at the theater before. Do you come to Roma very often? <laughs> Well, you might say this is a, a once-in-a-lifetime vacation. <laughs> I want to see him d do everything. All the finest foods, all the finest wines. I, I want to hear the best music and experience all the riches the, the world has to offer. <laughs> all at once? <laughs> Why settle for the ordinary when we can fill our lives with the amazing? Oh, you are a man of action. Speaking of action, would you care to dance? <laughs> I would love to dance, but not here. There's a fabulous nightclub in the center of the city, very exclusive. The limousine awaits. <laughs> what a wild dancer! <laughs> <laughs> it's not me. It's a, it's a champagne. You're so funny. <laughs> I believe I'm slightly tipsy, too. Oh, uh, tipsy? What does it mean? It means I've had too much to drink, which means I'll probably have a ferocious hangover tomorrow. Oh, oh that is too bad. Oh, but no worries. The, the way to prevent a hangover is to keep drinking. More champagne! More champagne! <laughs> More champagne! And more dancing! And more dancing! <laughs> Michael, are you sure you can afford to buy drinks for the whole restaurant? That's only money. 
And, and look how much fun they're having. Look how much fun I'm having. <laughs> waiter, waiter, another round for my friends. A three cheers for a friend Matthew. It's Michael. Okay. Cheers, cheers for, for Michael. 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 Michael, are you able to walk? It's not me. It's the streets that keep moving. You dance the night away. And we'll do it again tonight. The sun rises over the ocean. If I see a million mornings, I never grow tired to seeing that sight. Imagine if you only had a few more to see. I'm sorry, what did you say? I, I said, would you care for some breakfast? I'm starving. Then let's go to the best restaurant in the city and order everything on the menu. I've never met a man like you, Michael. If you want something, you just take it. <laughs> of course. What's that old saying? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Michael, what's wrong? You look sad. Did I say something wrong? Maria, I wanted to ask you something. What is it, Michael? Would you care to join me on a small trip? Where to? Oh, I know a charming village near here. We could have a picnic. Actually, what I had in mind was, was Paris. Paris, France. And, and then London. And then Monte Carlo, or, or, or Moscow, or, or Hong Kong. I mean, we could go anywhere in the world. But what will we do when we get there? Whatever we want. I'll, I'll buy you diamonds or a new car. Would you like a new car? Michael, you're making my head swim. I don't need a new car or diamonds. What then? A, a yacht? My life is here in Roma. I can't just pick up and leave to go hopping from one country to the next. Why not? You just said you admired me for that very thing. I admire your freedom, but... I have responsibilities. My parents are here, my friends. Well, that'll be one phone call away. I can't just leave. You can do anything you want to, just like me. Don't you have anyone you feel responsible to? <laughs> we were discussing breakfast. Breakfast, that's what we need. Michael, I asked you a question. Come. We'll order the most expensive breakfast in town and the most expensive restaurant. We'll have them serve us eggs on, on plates made of gold. I'm not really hungry. Where are you going? Where are you going? I have things to do. But, but what about Paris, London? You're willing to give all that up? If I left with you, then I would be giving up something. Like what? My life here. It's who I am, the people I love, the friends I have. So, window dressing, none of that is important. And what do you think is important? I am, and what I want. I see. Goodbye, Michael. Fine! I've got parents by myself. <laughs> There's lots of beautiful women there, too! Bonsoir, Monsieur Franklin. Welcome to Perry. Your suite is prepared for you with a view of the Seine and a bottle uh, of... A bottle of champagne on ice. Right? Merry? <laughs> what did you say your name was? My name is Angelique. Uh, uh, I'll call you Angel. My uh, beautiful French angel. What about you, my dear? I am called Giselle. Ah, Giselle. 
Giselle, I knew her well. <laughs> oh, you are so silly. <laughs> I'm Michael. <laughs> but why don't you call me Mike? <laughs> Nobody ever calls me Mike anymore. Not since I was a little boy. Were you as naughty then as you are now? <laughs> I was a good boy. Very smart. In fact, I was smarter than everybody. Did you know that? I was better than all of them. <laughs> oh, you are a good person, Mike. Nobody ever bought me a pearl necklace on the same day I met them. Mm. I'll buy you another one tomorrow. <laughs> hey, we need more caviar here, Garçon. More caviar, s'il vous plaît. But Mike, we have two bowls full on the table already. They're ten minutes old. We need fresh caviar. Freaking caviar. Ooh. Let's Whoa. dance. Whoa. Mike. Welcome to London, Mr. Franklin. Your suite has been prepared for you. And bottle of champagne and ice. Got it. Got it. Got it. Let's say. On, on second thought, cancel my room. Book me on a flight to Monaco. I got an itch to gamble. Uh, uh, right away, sir. And the number is 29. A red... Don't worry about it. It's only money, and there's plenty where that came from. Hey, another 10,000 in chips, please. Is the gentleman sure he has already lost several hundred thousand dollars? If the gentleman wanted to hire a babysitter, the gentleman would have done so. You understand? As the gentleman wishes. Mr. Franklin. Good morning, Mr. Franklin. Mr. Franklin? Hello? Uh, Mr. Franklin, hmm? your branch is here, sir. Shall I place the champagne bottle next to the bed? Shall you... shall you... who are you? Yeah. Where am I? I am Captain Philippe Duchette. This is the Fandango Dancer. The luxury yacht you rented last evening. I, re I rented? Was I alone? The gentleman was escorted by several very attractive ladies, and uh, there was a request for the boat to take you to Australia. But, as you may know, that trip is beyond the range of this vessel. I wanted you to take me to Australia. <laughs> After we receive the Alaskan crab, Russian caviar, and of course, the champagne. Uh, I hope I never see another glass of champagne. What shall I do with the cases that are on the deck? <laughs> How many cases did I order? Ten. <laughs> They're yours. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Do you wish to proceed with the cruise? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Very good, sir. All right. For a week, I've eaten the finest foods, drunk the most expensive champagne. I've slept in the most exquisitely comfortable beds with the most luxurious silk sheets. I've, I've held beautiful women in my arms. I should be the happiest man on earth. I should have a permanent grin tattooed on my face. Why am I so miserable? Uh, I'll have a few days left to live. A few days. I need to be... I need to be somewhere where someone knows me, where I... where I don't have to pay for the company of people. I need to go home. I need to go home.
Taxi! Taxi over here! Hey, where to, mister? 1020 Clark Street. Hop in. Look like that wind was gonna take you away, mister. We flew in through the storm. It's quite a bumpy landing. Well, it'll probably blow over soon. Say, I don't think I've seen you around here before. Well, I haven't lived here for quite some time. That must be it then. Oak Grove being such a small town and all, I know just about everybody around. Yeah, yeah, well, as I, as I said, it's been a few years. Just visiting? Uh, that's right. Family? Mm, not, not really. What'd you say your name was? I, I did, but it's, it's Michael Franklin. Your dad was the high school teacher. That's right. Oh, I don't think I remember seeing you at the funeral. What was it, uh, four years ago? Uh, I wasn't here for the funeral. You didn't come to your own father's funeral? <laughs> Not that it's any business of yours, but <laughs> I had meetings in Japan and I uh, couldn't fly all the way back here. Is that all right with you? Is it okay with you? Look, if you don't mind... You'd prefer if I'd stop flapping my gums, right? <laughs> well, I wasn't going to put it like that. Not to worry. The wife says I'm 99% hot air. It's just that I've been flying for the better part of 24 hours. Jet lag and all that, you know. Well, say no more. My lips are sealed. Anyway, here we are. 1020 Clark. Let me help you with your bag. It's all right. I can manage. Here you go. Keep the change. Uh, mister, do you know you just paid me with a $50 bill? Huh? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Well, you have yourself a really fine day, because I sure will. And you be careful in that wind, you hear? Uh, well, something tells me it's not the wind I'll have to worry about. Uh, here it goes. Hi, Carrie. Surprise. Michael? What are you doing here? It's, it's a long story. Um, may I come in? Well, I... It's pretty windy out here. I suppose so. Thank you. Michael, what's going on? You just show up on my doorstep after four years? Well, you know me. Spur of the moment. You are not a spur of the moment person. You plan everything in your life. I wouldn't be surprised to find that you plan how many times you blink every day. Well, the truth is, I, I don't have any place else to go. That sounds dramatic. It's true. What about the penthouse? It's gone. The beach house? Gone. They're all gone. I, I sold everything. I thought you went through your midlife crisis when you left me. Apparently, it's still going on. Please, Carrie. I don't want to fight. Then what do you want? I, I, just, I just wanted to see you again. You just wanted to see me. Okay, you see me. Now what? Do, do you mind if we, if we sit down? Michael, I have to be at work in an hour, and I'm in the middle of a term paper. You went back to school. I'm getting my master's. That's wonderful. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. I mean, you planned it for years. It's, it's, it's great that you finally decided to do it. Yeah, well, if there's nothing else on your mind... So, uh, how have you been? Busy. I don't have a lot of downtime, but that's how I like it. You, 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 you redecorated things here. You redecorated the house. I needed a fresh start after you left. Oh, oh, Carrie, about that, I, I'm so... If you're about to apologize, please don't. I've already more than paid you back by thinking the most horrible thoughts any person could think about another person. I guess I deserve that. Oh, you have no idea. How could you just walk away from a marriage, Michael? 
What was so terrible that you couldn't stand up like a man and fight for me? For us? It wasn't about you, Carrie. Oh, that's good to know. Because when I was picking up the pieces, when you left, it sure felt like it was about me. Uh, what, what I mean is that uh, I, I wasn't a good husband. True. You were always working. And I knew that I wouldn't be a good father. True. You never even walked the dog. So, I didn't give up on you. Or us. I gave up on myself. Well, that makes everything all better. You can go now. Okay. Carrie, please. Oh, I could just clobber you for coming back here. It isn't fair for me to have to dredge up these old feelings again. Well, maybe a civilized conversation without any bickering would do both of us some good. I don't think so. Please, Carrie, it's more important than you know. For what purpose, Michael? So you can go back to your high-powered, big-shot job in the city and feel good about yourself? I just don't want to leave loose ends, please. For, for better or for worse, can we, can we just talk? I'm not looking for forgiveness, just closure. Well... One cup of coffee? I'll, I'll even make it. All right. One cup, and I'll make the coffee. Yours always tasted like motor oil. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So you quit your job, sold your homes, and now you're here. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, about that. I, I guess I just realized that being a workaholic isn't very much fun, after all. But that's all you know. When we were married, you barely slept at night. You were up early to track the Asian stock market. You stayed up late to finish paperwork. I can count on one hand the number of times we actually went out on anything resembling a date. And even when we did go out, you acted like it pained you to be away from your business calls. That is all over now, Carrie. Money doesn't mean a thing to me. I find that hard to believe. <laughs> believe it. It's true. So, what? You're gonna take up oil painting? Or become the stand-up comedian you always wanted to be? Nothing like that. Actually... Actually, it's quite serious. Last week, I... What was that? It came from the living room. Oh, the tree! The wind knocked the tree into my house! Carrie, wait a sec, wait a sec, Carrie, don't go over there. It might be dangerous. That's a tornado warning! Oh my god, the house across the street, the roof just caved in! All right, look, let's get into the basement. The power just went out! I have flashlights downstairs. Wait, outside, look. What? Michael, come on, there's no time. Well, look in the street, there's a kid in a bike. <gasps> oh no, that's Jimmy from next door. He doesn't know which way to go. Oh, Michael, he's going to be hurt. Uh, I'll get him. Michael, what are you doing? Michael! Ah! Jimmy, Jimmy, keep your head down. That's it. Jimmy, I'm coming for you. <laughs> Help me. I'm right here, buddy. I'm right here. I'm going to carry you into the house, okay? What about my bike? I'll get you a new one. Let's get out of the storm, okay? Okay. Put your arms around my neck and hold on. I'm trying. Squeeze real tight, Jimmy. I'm scared. And I'll be brave for the both of us, Jimmy, okay? Mm -hmm. Got to get this door open. Michael, I can't budge it. Carry, push. Push as hard as you can! I'm... Harry, push! Pushing! Harder! As hard as you can! There, you got it! We made it! We made it! Into the basement! Come on! Come on, Jimmy. That's it. Let's go get safe. Okay. The storm's cleared. It's over. Is the wind gonna get me? 
No, honey. You're safe. Look. <laughs> that car. It's been overturned. At least there's no more damage to the house. Mom! Jimmy! Jimmy! Oh, Jimmy, we didn't know where you were. We had him in the basement, with us. I was so scared. And then the wind came, and then this man came and saved me. You saved my Jimmy? Well, not really. Yes, you did, Michael. You ran right into the path of the tornado and brought him inside. Oh, come here and let me give you a hug. You don't have to. <laughs> okay. Oh. How can I ever thank you? You don't have to. It was my pleasure. Is our house okay, Mom? Yes, sweetie. We were very lucky. Jimmy, you're a very lucky little boy. Yes, and thank you again for my son's life. Yeah, thanks. Oh, you're welcome. Michael, you saved Jimmy's life. You're a hero. I, I didn't even have time to think. I, I just saw him and ran. It was still amazing. When the chips were down, you really came through. I'm proud of you. Oh, look. Look at the damage in your living room. No, it's okay. All of that can be fixed. The main thing is that we're all safe and healthy. Right. Listen, Carrie. Those repairs? They're gonna be expensive. I have insurance. Oh, yeah, but that will only cover the basics. Let me take care of the costs. Michael, you don't have to do that. No, but I want to. And I can afford it. But you can't just drop that kind of money on a problem that isn't yours. And listen, all I know is that when I helped Jimmy just now, it felt good. It, it felt better than anything I've done for a long time. And, and the idea of helping you out with bills feels good, too. So please, just let me do this. Well, I'm not in a position to turn down a gift like that. But what about you? Before the storm hit, you were about to tell me something. You said it was serious. It, it doesn't matter now. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Here, here, let me write you a check before I leave. Are you going so soon? You just got here. Yes, yes, I, I, <laughs> I think I got what I was looking for. Here, here you go. Now listen, don't you look at it until I leave, okay? I promise. Where are you going? I have some business to finish. Goodbye, Carrie. Goodbye, Michael. <gasps> A million dollars? Michael! Michael! Yes? What is it? Forget the late hour, Reverend. Uh, I, I realize it's nearly midnight, but I wanted to visit the chapel and the, and the door's locked. Unfortunately, in these times, we must protect ourselves against theft. The doors remain locked overnight. Is there any way I could just go inside for a few moments? No, I'm sorry. If you can come back in the morning, yeah. But you see, tomorrow morning will be too late. I, I only have tonight. Mm-hmm. It always seems that way, my son. But have a little faith. Please. Go home. Get some sleep. I don't have a home anymore. I, I've just come in from the airport. I, I, I came straight here. Please, it's, it's, it's more important than you know. All right. You seem to be in great need. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Uh, 
Yeah, it, it, it's one of these. Ah, here we go. I'll come back in ten minutes. I won't need more than five. And now that I'm here, I don't know what to say. It's been a long time since I've set foot in a place like this. In fact, I can't remember the last time. I, I suppose it's true, people come back when they're in trouble, but I'm not exactly in trouble. In fact, all well, my troubles will be over in just a few minutes. Then why am I here? Maybe I just wanted to see if I could find a moment of peace before everything ends. Just a single solitary moment when I don't have to feel so alone. The, the truth is, I'm alone because of my own actions, by the selfishness of the man I've become. I was given love, but I turned away from it in favor of my career. I gave up friendship in favor of business colleagues who couldn't care less if I lived or died. So what did it all mean? What is the sum total of my life? I have no job, no home. I'm gonna die without a single friendly voice in my ears. I did have some good times with Carrie. Thank goodness for Carrie. I don't blame her for being angry. And despite her anger, she took me into her home. She forgave me. And Jimmy, I saved his life. He'll have a chance to grow up, to have a family and a little boy of his own. I gave that to him. I did make a difference after all. Maybe I had to go through it all so that I could be there to save his life. If that's true, then it's worth it. I'm glad things turned out the way they did. I did something worthwhile. My life mattered after all. Nearly midnight on the tenth day, just like the old lady said. When the clock strikes midnight on the tenth day to come, you will be dead. I'm not afraid. <laughs> I thought this moment would be terrifying, but I actually feel ready. No regrets. I'm prepared to say goodbye to everything. Excuse me, sir. I'll have to ask you to leave now. Yes, I'll, I'll go. And, and thank you. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. No, oh, may, may I ask one favor? What is it? If anyone asks, can you tell them I was ready and that I was grateful? Grateful? For what? Oh, for everything. It was all a gift. It's time. I don't know what to do. What I... I mean, if I should... How do I... How? Church bells. They stopped. They stopped. Okay. It's midnight on the tenth day. And I'm still alive. Nothing happened. Okay. Nothing's happening. The old woman said I had ten days to live, that I would die at the stroke of midnight. <laughs> she lied. <laughs> she lied. Hey, excuse me. Hey, excuse me. The old lady, the, the one who reads fortunes, is she here? She just left a few minutes ago. She walks to the bus stop down in the corner. Oh, which corner? Which way? Up that way. Go left. Where is she? I don't want to be. Don't let her be. Ah, there. There she's ever. Hey, don't get on that bus. Wait. What is it? Who's calling? You... you lied to me! Who is it? Who, who are you? What do you want? Look, I'll stand in the light so you can see my face. 
Now, you remember me? Ah, yes. The angry man. And I'm still angry. You, you told me. In ten days, at the stroke of midnight, I'd be dead. Ten days are now over. I sold my home. I shut my life down because I, I believed in you. Yes. I told you that in ten days you would be dead. So? And I was correct. The man I spoke to ten days ago is dead. What? What? What, what, what do you mean? That man was selfish and cruel. That man was friendless and meaningless. Can you say the same things about yourself today? I guess not. He's gone. Bury him. Give yourself the rarest of all gifts in life. A second chance. A second chance? Huh. Sounds too good to be true. And yet... Here it is, yours for the taking. You're right, things are different now. I don't know how to thank you. Live for someone other than yourself. That's the best thing any of us can do. Actually, there might be someone willing to let me try. And her name is Carrie. Thank you. Thanks for the second chance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Michael Franklin. A man on a mission to burn every bridge even before he made his way across. Stung by the terrible knowledge of his impending demise, his journey toward redemption faced a detour of intoxication and self-indulgence. As he now knows, such things are not the stuff of satisfaction, only empty calories and heartache. Ironic, then, that a man who plays such a premium on personal wealth could only feel full upon losing everything. A stark, lonely truth, but an eternal one. Upon such truths are built second chances here in the Twilight Zone. Ten Days, starring Ned Bellamy with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was written for The Twilight Zone by Mark Valente. Heard in the cast were Linda Reiter, David Darlow, Ernest Perry Jr., Roger Mueller, Tony Makis, Saskia Bellori, Joby Cerny, Elizabeth Lido, Martin Astro, C.J. Amari, Molly Glynn, and David Pasquese. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced by Carl Amari and directed by Joe B. Cerny for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design, custom Foley effects, recording, and editing are produced in the Cerny American Sound to Picture Theater by sound designers Craig Lee and Todd Beyer. Music for The Twilight Zone is provided by CBS and American Music Incorporated New York. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to download episodes, including six free episodes on our homepage, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, A dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. 
You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. There she is, VP. Right where the general said it'd be. Oh, we're too late. Well, I can see that. Campfire's smoking. We better check it out. Still warm. How long do you figure? Three, four hours at the most. Any idea how many? A lot of footprints all around. My guess is that if your general's looking for Sue, he's gonna have his breeches full of them before the sun goes down. That all you can tell us? Thought you were a scout. Well, they don't leave much behind. That's the Sioux way. Nothing their enemies can use. And a little ways down river, that'd be the junction? Not a ways. Right here. Big horn, little big horn. This is where they converge. Right here? Well, that'd put the Minnekanju fort about four miles up. That's where he's thinking about crossing. Wonder where they are now. Them Sioux? Wouldn't be impatient, Mr. Two Stripes. We can go back and tell General Custer that his Indian trail's just as fresh as ever. A little too fresh for my pay. Give me some of that water. Go fill your own canteen, Corporal. I don't mind. Have a drink if you want. <laughs> Take cover! Dang engines! I knew they was around! Hold your fire! I said hold it! How's the drive chain, Langsford? Just a smidge more. There, I got her, Sarge. Good man, Corporal. Are we going back to camp now? That we are. The captain would be glad to hear that. Get him on the horn, will you, McCluskey? Tell him the tank's up and running and we're on our way. Sure thing, sir. What in the... Those were shots, weren't they? Put it down. But I heard... So did I. Easy, Tiger. These are just training maneuvers. If we start to get trigger happy, it could turn into a real war. Hunting season, maybe. They still got buffalo around here? Hey, I bought it, McCluskey. Wanna go shoot some buffalo? Tastes just like chicken. Let's have a look. Nice and calm. If it's the red team, I'm giving up. They can tag me POW, and I'll just sit out the rest of these war games. Getting hot as an oven inside this tank. Why, I am surprised at you, McCluskey. The sergeant and me have had our eyes on you. You have? Sure, we are thinking of recommending you for OCS. Outside of the fact that you read a map upside down and you couldn't navigate a plow across a dance floor. Sounded like those shots came from the other side of the draw. Now what was that? I know what it was. Somebody's playing games. That's right, they're funning us. Can't you take a joke, McCluskey? It was a signal. Just the way... The way the Indians used to do it. It's a hot June day in the present century. Or, if you prefer, another century altogether. Take your pick. The cast of characters in order of their appearance? A patrol of General Custer's cavalry and a patrol of modern-day National Guardsmen on training maneuvers. What neither group knows is that the past and present are about to collide head-on, as they are wont to do in a very special bivouac area known as the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Seventh is Made Up of Phantoms, starring Richard Grieco, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Well, if you ask me, it could have been a bird or something. What about the rifle shots? Listen up. I've been on a lot of these training missions, and sometimes, well, sometimes the men get bored, so they play pranks on the other team. But we do our job, that's all. Now let's take a quick look over the rise, make sure everything's A-OK, -okay, and get back to base. Got it? Got it, Sarge. Loud and clear. I'll check it out. Go ahead. Well, how about that? What do you see, McCluskey? It's a wigwam! An honest to Pete wigwam! One million men in the National Guard, and it's just my luck to go riding around in a tank with the last of the Red Hot Eagle Scouts. So it's a wigwam, McCluskey. What are you so happy about? Well, it's real interesting, don't you think? Authentic and everything. Well, why don't you take a look inside? Maybe there's a pretty little squaw in there waiting to be your fiancé. Nope. Whatever was here cleaned it out. Don't you think that's kind of strange? 
leaving a wigwam made out of real hides, sitting in the middle of nowhere? Must have been some kind of youth camp or something. Either that or somebody's making a movie. Out here, Sergeant? On army training grounds? That's a point. They never get a permit. Too dangerous. Besides, we'd have been informed. Sure is interesting, though. Right there's a junction of the Bighorn and the Little Bighorn Rivers. Just a little ways from here is where Custer fought. Custer who? General Custer. Didn't you learn about it in school? This is where the 7th Cavalry fought the Sioux Indians. What do you got there? Looks like a canteen. Let me see that. Not one of ours. Yeah, maybe there's booze inside. Hey, where'd you get this? Right here on the ground. It says 7th Cavalry. Printed right on it. How? How do you figure, Sarge? Well, I figure it's in pretty good shape, considering it's been lying around here for a hundred and some odd years. Must be a lot of ghosts running around a place like this. Ghosts? Either that or somebody planted it here. McCluskey's got one thing right, though. Somewhere along this river, they fought quite a battle. George Custer and 200 odd men against a couple thousand Sioux. Custer's last stand. Didn't you ever hear of it, Langsford? I heard of it, I heard of it. Maybe next year a museum will send you guys out on an expedition and you can spend all your time picking up antiques. But right now, I thought we are supposed to be a motorized patrol on war games. Me, I'd like to be reconnoitering in some small dark bar right about now. Or maybe the YWCA. Or in a pinch, I'd settle for a... What? What was that? The wind. That's what it was. The wind. But the canteen and all... Don't you reckon we ought to go back and tell the command post? Don't you want to wait for the Union Cavalry, McCluskey? Now, what were you saying, Sarge? This is uh, where they fought, huh? Around here? Someplace around here. When I was a kid, I read everything that was ever written about it. Custer and the 7th were the advance guard for a general named Terry. The last thing anybody ever heard from him was that he was dividing his regiment into three parties. He was going to surround what he figured was a small group of Indians. There was a captain named Benteen with three troops. Went off to the south. Major Reno went to the other side of the creek to follow an Indian trail. Custer was the center column. He rode right into them and got slaughtered. 1876. That was the year. Right. 1876. Somebody planted this canteen for a gag then. It's not old. It's practically new. See for yourself. The water's still fresh. This whole thing's a gag. Either that or... Come on, let's get out of here. I'm serious, you guys. Let's go back to the tank. Yeah, let's go. All right, Sergeant. I'm asking you, what was that? The wind again? I, uh, I don't know. Yeah, sh sure, that, sure, that's what it was, the, the wind. There they are. Finally! What'd they do? Go fishing? They're working on their suntans. Well, boys, never thought I'd be glad to see you again. Hey, the captain's PO'd. You better get in a tent on the double. How come? I called in a position report. Yeah, but that was a while ago. Lieutenant, if you had seen what we saw... Can it, McCluskey. I'll give my report directly to the captain. Say, uh, any of you good old boys got a cold one stashed around here? Sergeant Connors reporting, sir. You may enter, Sergeant. Sir? Nice of you to come back, Connors. Did you bring your tank with you? Begging your pardon, sir? You were gone so long, I figured you drove it to a used car lot and traded it for a convertible. We, uh, we got a little hung up by the riverbed. Hung up? The blue team was north of us. You went south. We had trouble with one of the drive tread chains. Corporal Langsford proceeded to repair it with the toolkit, at least temporarily. Connors, for a guy with as much regular army time as you've got, you played this one boneheaded from start to finish. Sir, I can't explain. Explain? If there was an umpire around, you'd have had your tank crossed off and your men. Missing in action, all three of you. I'm sorry, sir. We heard some... some rifle fire. We went to check it out. Rifle fire. According to the lieutenant, you were down by the Little Bighorn. That's 40 miles from tactical maneuvers where you were supposed to be. How could you hear arms fire? We never found out where it came from, sir. Or who it came from. Oh, that's rich. What was it, the Russians? Or the Chinese? 
I'll tell you what I think. I think you guys must have had a bottle in that tank. Sir, I'm telling you. See this map? Tomorrow, you'll take your tank, or rather, the United States government's tank, if you can find it, and you'll head up here to Rosebud Creek. But, sir... Follow the creek about 15 miles. We figure that by now the blue team has moved across to... What's the matter, Connors? You hung over? Nothing like that, sir. It's just that Rosebud Creek, that's Custer's route. What? When he left Yellowstone River, he went with Major Reno. Reno found an Indian trail along Rosebud Creek. Sergeant, let's synchronize, shall we? My watch says 2320 hours. My calendar says this century. If you have a thing about Indians, you got here a little late in the day. We heard them, sir. You heard what, exactly? Indians, war cries. Where? When? This afternoon, sir, at the junction of the Bighorn and the Little Bighorn. I know it sounds... I know it sounds crazy. We found a canteen with 7th Cavalry stenciled on it. And a wigwam close to the river. A wigwam? TP, whatever you want to call it, but it was there. Are you bucking for a Section 8, Sergeant? It was the same TP that Reno Scouts found the night before the battle. Mm-hmm. Reno's Scouts, I see. Reno being... Major Reno. When Custer split the force into three columns, he sent Reno's to the north. All right, Connors, that'll do. Line up your patrol and move out at 0600 tomorrow morning. And if you meet any Indians, any Indians at all, take a deep breath and count to ten. They're probably all college graduates out running tests on the soil. Sergeant? Hmm? What? You awake, sir? Yeah, I'm, I'm awake. What's the matter? Nothing, sir. I was just lying here thinking. Thinking about what, McCluskey? Well, sir, wouldn't you say it's strange? The only thing that's strange around here is you. Now, will you knock it off so a fella can get himself a little shut-eye? Langsford's right. We've got an early detail in the morning. I know, Sergeant, but the teepee and that canteen and all... Listen, kid, I'm asking you politely. Sorry, guys. I don't mean to be a drag or nothing, but that sound we heard today, it could have been a signal, don't you think? Indians do that. I mean, they used to. They can imitate anything. Birds, animals. You can never even hear them creeping up on you. They can even shape change, according to some folks. And then there's the little bighorn, General Custer. I read one time that there's no such thing as a coincidence. That's it. I'm moving my bedroll. Some place where a man can get a night's sleep. Will you guys pipe down over there? Simmer down, Colonel. And you, Private, do me a favor. Put a cork in it. All right, Sergeant Connors. I'll try. I just want to be responsible is all. It's like they said in training. If you see anything and don't report it... Shh! Hear that? Yes, sir. Night, sir. Good night. What in the blue hell was that? Where to now, sir? We follow this trail. How far? Till we get to frontier land? About two, three more miles. In other words, Reno's route. Exactly. We're making good time. We should get there at roughly the same hours. For Pete's sake, you still on that? Reno this and Benteen that and Custer something else. Haven't you guys had it? You talked about it all night long. Now me, I was dreaming about a cute little private in a miniskirt. See, I, I was the drill instructor and she had to give me 50 jumping jacks. Only she couldn't get it right. So I, I put my arms around her from behind, real official-like, just to show her how. Up, down, up, down, and I'm whispering in her ear the whole time, and she says to me, she says, Why, Sergeant, uh, I was a sergeant in the dream. Uh, why, I think I got it. So I say, I mean, I start to say, you've got what? But before I can get it out, McCluskey here wakes me up because he thinks he hears another hootie owl. I swear, if this kid wrecks my train and sleep one more time... Sergeant, look! Where? Over there! The top of the hill! I don't... The tall one, see? Smoke rising up in the sky, one puff at a time. Oh, no. I don't like the looks of that. I don't like it one bit. Hold up now. But, Corporal... Use your head, boy. That smoke's coming from an incinerator. Or it's somebody cooking a cheeseburger. I don't think so. Or maybe it's a bunch of Girl Scouts who don't dig Smokey the Bear. But if you don't straighten up, I will... It figures. What does? It has to figure. Reno Scouts found the teepee the night before the battle. The following morning, the column saw smoke signals in the sky. 
That's right. You know your history. Look, you two history fans are really starting to bug me. And late that same morning, they got their first Indian. Oh, man. When the war party went by, one of the troopers shot the last rider. Come on. Look, I like a good laugh, same as the next guy, but this is too much. This is really and truly too much. It was for the 7th Cavalry, too. Sure. Next thing you'll be telling me is that up over the hill, we're going to run into a war party of Sioux. And if that happens, Mrs. Langsford's little boy is going to report to sick bay and ask for a rubber room all for himself. Just remember, I can always make it a reservation for three. If that's what you... We have to arm ourselves. Get back in the tank. What are you doing? There's nothing out there but a dust cloud. Yes, but what's behind the dust? You hear it? We're wasting time. You stupid moron kid. Put that rifle down. What do you think you're shooting at? Thanks for McCluskey. Watch out. Oh, my dear God. You saw it. We all saw it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I sure did. A horse without a saddle, an Indian pinto, and no rider. That means I killed him. I killed him with my M1. Sergeant, I just fired blind toward that cloud of dust, but I didn't mean to... That's enough. What were you saying, Langsford? You want to make a speech now? You got something to say to you? I got something to ask. Are we all out of our tree or what? I don't know for sure, but I've got an idea. We're listening. See that ravine down there? What about it? It's all part of it. Somehow, some way, we're riding the same trail that Custer did. Figure it out. There was a teepee. When did we find it? Yesterday afternoon. Just like the scouts did. There was the smoke signals. Just like Reno's column saw the next morning. Then McCluskey got himself an Indian. Just like... Just like the day of the battle. All right, let's say you're right. Let's say it's just like you say it is. We follow this trail just like they did. Yes, Corporal. We follow it. Well... What's the next thing that's supposed to happen? We... We wind up at a massacre. Hadn't we ought to go back to camp and warn them? Warn who? It's not our men who'll be under attack. It's Old Yellow Hairs. Old Yellow... General George Armstrong Custer. And you mean to stop it? I don't see that we have much choice. Stop it, or join it. <laughs> Sure is hot. Hotter out there. What do you think happened to him? Probably kicking back with a fishing pole. I hear there's trout up here. <laughs> they gonna bring some back for us. Miller. Yes, Captain. Does Connors report it in? Uh, not yet, sir. Get him. Uh, I've already tried. Try again. Yes, sir. Bluebird 9, Bluebird 9. This is CP. Come in. Bluebird 9. No dice, sir. Keep trying. Uh, what if they're out of range? Then they've disobeyed a direct order, and this time they won't get away with it. Bluebird 9, Bluebird 9. Come on, guys. This is Bluebird 9. Go ahead, CP. They're acknowledging, sir. Give me the microphone. Connors, this is the captain. This is McCluskey, sir. McCluskey, where... Sorry, you're breaking up. Private, do you think you might extend yourself enough to give me your position? We're four miles down Rosebud Creek, about to cross over. You're about to come back here double time. You're about to report to me personally, and you're about to do it inside of a half hour, or you'll be spending the next three national holidays in a guardhouse. Do you read me? Yes, sir. Uh, just a minute, sir. Here's Sergeant Connors. Captain. Connors, do I have to send a couple of MPs down there? Captain, we're just a mile away. Away from what? From where Major Reno met the Sioux. Listen to me, Connors. I'll give this to you just once. When these maneuvers are over, you can come out here on a vacation, dig up arrowheads, or anything you like. But right now, I want a government-issued tank back here at the command post and three National Guardsmen named Connors, McCluskey, and Langsford right alongside it. You've got 30 minutes to bring her back. Now acknowledge. Connors. Acknowledge. Connors! He's broken off, sir. Lieutenant. Yes, sir? Take a jeep and three men. See this line on the map? Follow the creek down here. I think this is the crossing he talked about. Just follow his tread marks and bring them back here. Uh, what, what if he resists? Resists? They don't seem to want to come back. Well, I'll tell you what to do in that case, Lieutenant. You do whatever it takes. Sir? First you apologize to them, and then you shoot each one of them in the leg, throw them in the jeep, and get them back here. Now, do you read me? Yes, sir.
hold it. So this is what we've been busting our humps for, huh? A big fat nothing. Nothing, all right. Nothing and no one. But right down there is the spot. Don't tell me. Where Reno had his fight. Well, all I can tell you guys is you'd better get a couple of cigar store Indians out here and you better do it in a hurry. That is, if you want to make a good impression. Because I know a National Guard captain who's probably on his way over here right now with a great big net. Where are they, Sergeant? How come we missed out? Missed out? You want to know why we missed out? Let me explain it to you. We missed out because we're looking for dead cavalry, buried Indians, and a battle that was over and done with before my great-grandpa was born. Now that's where we missed out. I got it all pegged, you know. I really do. The whole thing is strictly a, an illusion. One of them heat mirages. That's the straight goods. Out here with the sun beating down, we went and talked ourselves into it. That's not it. That's not it at all, McCluskey. What are you thinking, sir? Do you remember what it was that Reno found before the battle? I'm not sure. He even sent a message back to Custer about it. Sure, the village. Village? What village? What do I have to do to level you guys off? Tie you to a tank or something? Reno scouts found an Indian village. An hour after that, the whole troop went into action. Oh, my aching back. I give up. I swear, I give up. This is where the men separate from the nutcases. Where are you going? Back to the CP, if I can find it. You guys keep playing your games, and I'll see if I can send back a padded ambulance. Arrivederci, y'all. Should I stop him, Sarge? We can't. He's the only one who's following orders. From now on, we're, we're on our own. What is it? You tell me! That's it! That's what? Would you mind telling me- The village! That's the village! Six more of your funny little teepees. That's a mirage, isn't it, Langsford? Not really there? Man, don't ask me anything. Now you got me seeing it. Don't ask me nothing. Looks abandoned. I'll go down to scout it. An hour ago, if you'd said that, I'd have died laughing. And now? You got your rifle? Sure thing. Then be careful. Of course I will. Well, what happens now? You read all the books. What's the next thing? Beyond the village. That's where Benteen engages. What about Custer? He loses his right arm. As of the moment, Reno got cut off here. Custer's column was doomed. This is... this is wild. I swear, this is off the scale. Now, how in the... well, how in... I mean, it's, it's like... like chasing somebody that ain't even there, and trying to catch up. Well? Connors. Langsford. What'd you find? I'm not sure. But if it's a mirage, this one goes... All the way. What's the matter with you? You all right? I just saw the granddaddy of all mirages. I mean the mother of... of... of all... Hey, fellas? You're white as a sheet. That's cause... This one's... Sticking in my back. McCluskey! Get the medical kit. I'll try to cut the arrow out. Bluebird 9, Bluebird 9, this is CP. Come in. No oh, good, Captain. Then they're refusing to answer. Either that or they've vanished off the face of the earth. Captain? You'd better have something to tell me. Yes, sir. For starters, that they're just a few hundred yards behind you, right? I wish I could say that. Then you better tell me something, Lieutenant, and fast, like the whereabouts of an M4 tank. We found the tank, sir. Is it operational? It appears to be. Where are the men? No sign of them. What? Only this note. Let me see that. Crossing Rosebud Creek, trying to reach the cavalry. Pray we're not too late. What's the meaning of this? I don't know, sir. We drove up and down the creek bank. Is that true? This is all you found? No sign of them? That's right, sir. What about you? There were tracks leading to the tank, but after that it, it's hard to say. All I know is they weren't in it. And you, Private, I want you to consider your words very carefully. Yes, sir. The tank was empty, except for some of their gear. Well, what are the rest of you grunts standing around for? Anybody need a work detail this morning? How about a recon march with full packs? Just finishing up, sir. Come on, guys. What about their gear? Most of it was still there, except for the rifles and the sidearms. Great. That's just great. Now I've got three trigger-happy soldiers on the loose with live ammo. Captain, I know Connors. 
He is strictly by the book. Yes, but what book? Langsford's regular army, and McCluskey, well, he's a good kid, just wants to put in his time and get back home. If they've gone off on their own, there must be a reason. I don't get it. I swear I don't get it. What are they drinking out there? Or have they seen too many Western movies? Sir, uh, about the note, what does he mean when he says cavalry? The Seventh Cavalry. But what's the Seventh Cavalry? A very hot outfit, headed up by a tiger named George Custer. Custer? <laughs> Wasn't he? Don't ask me any more questions. I don't have the answers. But I'll tell you this. Those three guardsmen are going to go on active duty so fast it'll make their heads spin. If they ever get out of the stockade. Not much farther now. Come on. We're going to make it. We're going to make it, man. We got you, okay? Just hang on to my shoulder. Where are we? A few hundred feet away. The right over the ridge. Sarge! You hear it? The wind, that's all. Not that. Sure. Sure we hear it. This time we all do. Wait a minute. Listen. That's them, Sarge. Seventh. You think he's right? We made it. We made it after all. Almost. Don't count your chickens. Let's go. Somebody give me my sword. We don't have swords, McCluskey. We got U.S. government-issued 45s. Put in a clip, work the slide, and she's ready to go. Here. We've also got our M1s and the machine gun set it up. With pleasure. Can't stand up. Just lay low. Keep pulling the trigger. Look at Custer. He's surrounded. <laughs> Gotta get down there. Must be a thousand Indians. More than that, Colonel. More than that. Well, shoot, I heard of worse odds than that. Haven't you, boys? Plus, we got our equalizers right here. We've come all this way. What do you say, Sergeant? I say we do it. <laughs> Why not? Let's go. This is it, Captain. The last known location. What's that plaque for? Read it, Lieutenant. Custer Battlefield National Cemetery. Honoring the memory of 261 men of the 7th Cavalry who lost their lives in battle. So this is the cavalry they were talking about. It was. It's a national shrine now. They made it. What's that, Captain? Nothing. No sign of them on either side of the creek, Captain. What about the tank? Up near the ridge where they left it. But no sign of the men, no sign at all. Keep looking. Yes, sir. Put them on report, Captain? <sighs> Put them on report. Captain! What is it? A list of the men who died here, all the names engraved on the plaque. It looks like it's been here a long time, so... So then, how... How what? I think you better take a look at this. Right here, in the middle of the list. William Connors, Michael McCluskey, Richard Langsford. Kind of... Kind of a coincidence, don't you think? Quite a coincidence. But how? Pity they couldn't have brought up the tank. That would have helped the odds. Wonder if the drive chain failed again. Beg your pardon, sir? Nothing, Lieutenant. I didn't say a thing. Not a blessed thing. Sergeant William Connors, Trooper Michael McCluskey, and Trooper Richard Langsford, who, on a hot afternoon in June, made a brave but hopeless charge down a hill and never returned. Look for this one under P for Phantom in the pages of a historical ledger filed in a reading room known as the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. 
where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Thank you for listening. Please like and The subscribe. seventh is made up of phantoms, starring Richard Grieco, with Stacey Keach as your narrator was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcheson and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Craig Brawley, Jeff Lupiton, Christian Stolte, Kurt Nabig, Doug James, Roderick Peoples, Lynn Foley, Richard Shavsden, Carl Amari, Roger Wolski, and Vince Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Paul Patch, Terry Jennings, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. <laughs>